Where better for the opening round of the 2014 Blancpain Endurance Series than Monza? The famous Italian circuit that opened in September 1922 is steeped in motor racing history and it's the perfect setting for a grid full of GT cars. But before 2014 gets underway, let's have a look back at last year. It's 60 car, it's a great field. Better cars, better teams. The biggest and best GT championship in the world. What more could I want as a racing guy? from the world of the Formula 1 racing. This race is the biggest GT3 race in the world. Winning this race would mean a lot to me and, uh, and to the team. It will be difficult for sure, but I think we have a good chance to win. Never in history the 24 the top, such a grid in number, in quality and in number of cars that can really win. survived and we survived and we are really happy. We are not the favourites, not in the beginning of the season and not now. We need to be in the front of all if we want to win the champion. For sure tough, but yeah, I'm quite confident. The Ferrari behind me, and he just pushed me out of the track. I'm more than 200 k.
I think this was a thriller until the end. Maxi made a unbelievably good job and I think it's a really important championship for us. So that was last year, full of drama, full of excitement, but 2014 is looking just as good, if not better. Let's have a look at some of the leading runners. The opening round of the championship at Monza runs to the traditional format of a three-hour race, with Audi being one of the teams to beat. Newcomer James Nash drives for the Belgian Audi club, Team WRT. It's going to be a big challenge, um, big steps for me, um, but I think I need that in my career to, to progress. Uh, and get to where I want to. You can't beat these cars. Everybody recognises it, everybody loves R8s, Lamborghinis, BMWs, they all love those. So we're all in it together and we all want the same result. New to the championship this year is the mighty Bentley Continental GT3. It's a two-car team and Bentley, having won Le Mans in 2003, is now turning its attention to GT racing with a cosmopolitan lineup that includes ex Grand Prix racer Jerome D'Ambrosio. I've got a very limited experience of the car in general and of, of GTs in general, so it's difficult for me to really judge that at the moment. But I think they had a great start at Abu Dhabi. Uh, here, if we can enter in the top five, it will be a great result for the whole team. But for me, it's, it's, it's pretty special. It's great to be part of a, of a brand with such a legacy. In, uh, you know, the road car is fantastic, but in motorsport as well. And so clearly it's going to be a, a learning curve for me, and hopefully I can be quite quickly in the rhythm. Last year, Ahmad al Hafi was a class winner at Silverstone in a Porsche. But this year, he moves to the Pro Cup, he moves to Aston Martin, and the Oman Racing Team is going to be an impressive debutant this weekend. He's partnered by Michael Kane and Stephen Jelly. Ahmad is looking forward to the race. I'm, first of all, really excited to be back into the Blanc Grand Championship. Um, obviously, last year was my debut. This year, it's going to be more competitive. We entered into the pro category, which is the ultimate. And I think we have a very strong package. I mean, it's just uh, about seeing how strong the others are. Further evidence of the international lineup for the opening round of the championship comes in the brothers racing team. It's an entry dominated by Chinese drivers, headed by block pound returnee Frankie Chang. He's optimistic. It's a great opportunity for us to be back in Blanc Pine, and uh, we are very much looking forward to it. I guess it's to win is probably, at this stage, uh, it's not really realistic, but uh, the, the aim too is to moving up the grade, and uh, definitely we start from the moment that we are looking forward to this. Last year's champion was Maximilian Buch. He only took part in three of the five races, but the success achieved was enough to give him the title. For this year, he's back with the same car, the Mercedes, the same team, HTP Motorsport, and the young German is after another champion's watch. No changes at all. I think um, we proved last year that there are no changes mandatory, and at the moment we are quite um, well with the car. I try to give my best as, as usual try to drive as fast as I can and I don't think that there's any extra pressure on me. Writer Engineering was hoping to bring its new Camaro. That had engine dramas before the race, and so the team has pressed into service its Lamborghini, handled by Albert Montona Taxis, Thomas Enger and the redoubtable Peter Cox. We always have to go out from the possibility that you can win, that's, that's why we are here. And uh, for sure, with, uh, with Albert, who's already a long-time uh, driver for Team Writer Engineering, and with Thomas, who used to be my colleague already for, for also a long time, you know, we have a, a quite strong driver lineup. Nevertheless, you know, there are some more quite strong driver lineups, so you never know, it's a long race. But I think we stand a good chance. I think we have a very competitive car, so uh, we look forward to it. Pole position at Monza is about McLaren. Alvaro Perrin put this car on pole in Q3, one of his co-drivers is Alexander Prema, who makes his Blanc Pan Endurance Series debut this weekend, back from racing V8 supercars down under. Yeah, I'm really happy, definitely, to be in the Blanc Pan Series for this year, 2014. It's going to be a new challenge. I'm looking forward for the championship. Everything is new for me. And I think, yeah, definitely, for all the TV and uh, for the fans, uh, definitely, they, they will love the, the racing in Blanc Pan Series. Once again, the Nissan PlayStation GT Academy winners are coming to the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. Bob Neville's team runs two cars, and Nick McMillan, the man who won the American Regional Final last year, can't wait to get started here at Monza this weekend. Super excited to be here at Monza, you know, and go from essentially the couch to, you know, a real racing circuit. I guess where we're at right now, it's kind of more a learning process, but of course all of us have, you know, hopes of 
being on the podium or winning our class. But you know, for me, it's you know, first off, have fun because when I have fun, I seem to do a lot better. We kind of just get into the whole process of racing and improve throughout the season. We're a bit down on Porsches numerically this year, just two in the entry list for Monza. But this car that runs in the Pro-Am class is going to be quick, that is for sure. Especially when it's got X single seater hot shoe Franck Pereira behind the wheel. It's my second season in, in Blancpain and we started pretty well last year with the, with the, the third time in the qualifiers. So I'm coming to with a big uh, bit confident, you know, we work a lot this winter with no number of tests. I hope we're going to fight again for the pole this year and uh, we are only two Porsche, so it's going to be hard for us, but we're going to fight and we're going to show that the Porsche is good. The Gentleman Trophy is going to have a big battle this year between Audi and Ferrari. And a late addition to the Ferrari ranks is former British GT champion, confectionery magnate Daniele Perfetti. The first time for me in, in a Ferrari, so it'll be, I just want to keep it on the road and hopefully do a good job for my teammates. A lot to learn as far as the car goes and uh, the team I know quite well, the racetrack I know, the car is the, is the biggest unknown. I'll take it as a, a big learning and try to stay out of trouble. A full grid of cars at Monza for the opening round of the 2014 Blancpain Endurance Series. The grid is full of people, it's full of cars, it's full of expectation as well, because with some teams having moved on, new teams coming in to replace them, there's a real sense of expectancy about this opening round of the championship. The Blancpain Endurance Series, with its five race format, as before, three three-hour races, 24 hours of spa, the 1,000-kilometer race, the Blancpain 1,000 at the Nürburgring, but then, along with the new Sprint Series, they are all included into the Blancpain GT Series. And it means there's a 12-race format split between Endurance and Sprint over the course of the season, over the globe as well. And here at Monza, a front row that includes McLaren and Ferrari and a great race in prospect. The weather is perfect. Teams nervous about fuel. If safety cars come approaching the fuel window, that's going to throw their calculations a little. But one thing we are in for is a great race that we can pretty much guarantee. And with a McLaren on pole position, a Ferrari alongside, and a Bentley lining up on the second row of the grid, there's going to be an awful lot to look for in the first few laps of the race. Pole position went the way yesterday in qualifying of Avaro Parent, and the car is going to be uh, started when we get the race underway uh, by the Portuguese hero. Alongside him is the best of the Ferraris, also the quickest car in Pro-Am, that Ferrari 458 that was hustled on yesterday by Giacomo Petrobelli to get on the outside of the front row. This is David Addison in the booth. Jack Nichols and John Watson are down on the grid. Let's catch up with one or two of the drivers and head down to the grid. Alvaro, magnificent pole position for McLaren. 0.4 of a second quicker than the opposition. Oh, definitely uh, a mega qualifying yesterday. Uh, now we just have to uh, conclude it today, you know, looking forward for the start. Try to avoid problems into a tricky first chicane, you know, in Monza. Uh, see what we can do from there. This is Ferrari territory, the Autodromo at Monza. McLaren, Ferrari, you know, not the best of friends, really. But yesterday we got, uh, we got the best out of it and uh, hopefully today too. Well, enjoy it, a hot one, have a good race. Thank you. Alvaro Parent, who drives for the ART Grand Prix team, and his car shared by Gregoire de Moustier and Alex Prema. So the McLaren MP4 12C, uh, a car that perhaps is better suited to the pro drivers than the gentlemen. It certainly gravitated that way. An awful lot were sold to customers to begin with, but now you find them uh, just in the Pro Cup and the Pro-Am category as well. But uh, perhaps, as I say, they're better for the real pro drivers. But alongside is the Ferrari 458 that's going to be uh, started by Giacomo Petrobelli back into the championship and a lot of expectation around the Ferraris. We know this is a good circuit for Ferrari. John Watson just touched on it down on the grid, but last year in the equivalent race, every class won by a Ferrari 458. Now, Bentley is another big talking point of the weekend, and the best of the Bentleys has qualified on the outside of row two. Guy, great to see Bentley here on the Blancpain Enduro Series at Monza. Uh, it's fantastic to be here uh, back with uh, the new Bentley GT3 car. Uh, what a fantastic day, and looking forward to some great racing. You're part of the Bentley family, you raced at Le Mans somewhat a decade ago now. Yeah, it's great to be back with Bentley. Obviously, um, we had a lot of success with the Le Mans program in 2003, making a return to racing here with the GT3 car. So it's, uh, it's a new challenge, but uh, one that we're really looking forward to. Now, there was a big challenge yesterday, because Stephen Kane 
punched the barrier. The Ascari chicane, all the work last night, all to good effect. Yeah, it was unfortunate uh, with, with what happened in qualifying, but uh, you know the pace of the car was very, very good. Um, M Sport did a fantastic job in, in, in prepping the car and, and, and bringing it back to life, as it were. And as you can see, it looks looks like new now. So all credit to them and uh, real team effort. And hopefully, we can reward them with a good win, uh, a good race today. Is a podium too much to wish? We'll do our best. You know, we don't underestimate the Blind Pond Championship. It's so, so tough, but we'll do our best. Look forward to it. Thank you. Guy Smith, who won Le Mans for Bentley. Good to have not only Bentley back, but also Guy back in European racing, having been spending much of his time in American racing of late. And number seven is going to be started by Andy Merrick, former single-seater racer. And Stephen Kane, who's the third driver, as you've just been hearing, had an accident at the end of Q3 yesterday. He just set the car's best time, got it wrong at the Valley Antiascari, really did hit the barrier pretty hard. But the good news is that Stephen's OK, and the car looks as good as new. M Sport, the team behind it, is the same M Sport, Malcolm Wilson's squad that runs the uh, Ford World Rally team. And if mechanics can repair Robert Kubis's car repeatedly over the course of an event, they can certainly sort out one drama for one car, especially in a proper pit lane, rather than uh, muddy puddles out in the field as it were in rallying so the Bentley is good to go it's on the outside of the second row of a very busy grid that stretches right the way up to pit in the fans are ready for what's going to be a storming race and the engineers have done their data they've worked out their computations and ideally they're going to try and just bring the cars in for the two mandatory stops on the hour mark if they can most teams should be able to do an hour uh, without fuel being a problem where things start to get a bit more confusing is if after about 40 minutes, uh, there is a safety car period because you've got to really take advantage of that. The maximum driving time for a driver is 70 minutes, so it kind of works out that you could do 70, 70 and 40 across your three drivers. But what you can't do is bring somebody in too early and then find yourself running short of fuel at the end. So they are going to have to manage all of this, and that's going to be something we'll have to keep an eye on as the race wears on. Let's hear from uh, Michael Brozniewski from the number 11 Kessel Racing Ferrari because he finds himself on the outside of row one. Cool. Pro-Am pole position, that must be uh, what you hope for. Amazing uh, beginning, yes. This is the right position, I think. This is even seems to be created for this, because Pro on the right, uh, Pro-Am on the left. This is a great one. And McLaren versus Ferrari going down to the first corner. Yes, yes. The track is in, in Monza, Italy. I, we hope the steel Ferrari will be enough strong to, to make a good fight. Thank you. Best of luck. Thanks. Michael Bronizeski talking to Jack Nichols down on the grid. Jack's going to patrol the pit lane for us for the next three hours and keep us abreast of what's going on in terms of dramas in the pits and also uh, with driver changes and indeed with strategy changes that may well have to be factored in. That Ferrari run by Ronnie Kessel's team really flew yesterday when Alessandro Bonaccini got behind the wheel and Giacomo Petrobelli back into the championship was uh, very impressive indeed. Good to have that car running so strongly. The second row of the grid is another Ferrari, in fact, on the inside. A new team to Blanc Pans, Scuderia Vero Bacorsa. Uh, Andrea Rizzoli and Francesco Castellacci, very, very quick indeed. So too Stefano Gai, who won here, in fact, last weekend uh, in the European Ferrari Challenge. And then on the last corner of the last lap of the second race of the weekend, when he was leading, he had a puncture and got to a podium finish, but he didn't get the second win, so that's going to be a quick car. Andrew Daniliv uh, for AF Corsa this year, the Canadian driver, starting on the eighth row, along with Simon Knapp and Andrea Sonvico. And uh, Andrew, the Canadian who's been in the championship for, what, three seasons now. Good to have him back. Always goes strongly. Great enthusiast for his racing. And probably, it's fair to say, with his best uh, choice yet, his best hopes yet in the AF Corsa Ferrari. Let's go to Audi. Mark Bassang is on the grid with Jack. Mark, a, a little disappointed to be here on the grid. Do you think you have your pace in the Audi? No, we are absolutely happy. I mean, uh, after last year, where the car was uh, much slower on the straight, I think we are quite comp a competitor this time and our car will run through the stint quite quick, so I hope in the end of the race we are really in front. Thank you, best of luck. Thanks. Mark was saying back to GT racing, of course, former world champion in the GT1 days. He's had a season of uh, running the all-inkle Munich.com cars in the World Touring Car Championship, and now he comes, instead of being the player manager of a team, just to being a driver once again, and he fetches up at the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT in number one, the car shared by uh, Cesar Ramos and Laurence Vantour, and with the chief engineer being uh, Adam Hardy, the man who helped Andrew Jordan to last year's British Touring Car Championship. Presiding over this full grid is the boss. Let's hear from Stefan Rattel. Stefan, another season of the Blancpain Endurance Series, another beautiful day at Monza, another huge grid. 
Well, we're very pleased with the Bentley, which is a fantastic addition to this grid. A very good competition with many different runs right there in the first five rows. So I think we're going to see another very exciting race and we're heading for a fantastic season. And who's your money on for the win? Of, you know, all competitors <laughs> are equal to my heart and I have no idea who's going to win. And that's the beauty of GT3. Brilliant, thanks. Thank you. It was a nice try, Jack. Stefan Rattel is the ultimate politician, the ultimate diplomat, and looks after all his customers. So what we need is a good race. We need everybody to be competitive, and it's going to be a great race. So looking forward to seeing who's going to come out on top at the end of three hours. The field is just about set, ready to go, looking down onto the grid, not aware of any gaps. We have had a couple of cars, in fairness, that have hit problems over the course of the weekend, one of which was the Emil Frey Jaguar that, sadly, uh, we lost after the bronze test on Friday evening. That's always been uh, a car in development, as it were, and sad to say the mechanical groundings have struck again. We also lost yesterday the Danish run Ferrari of Dennis Anderson and Martin Jensen that had a big accident. Dennis Anderson put the car off the road at the second Lesmo corner and I'm afraid the damage is just too great and a car that had problems yesterday and you don't often hear the next part of this sentence is the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT car that should start last on the grid um, it is in the pit lane at the moment in fact if it starts looks like it will have to start from the pit lane but the D Team WRT operation running a car this year in the gentleman trophy and one of the drivers is E. Wirtz who's actually one of the founders one of the uh, financiers of Vincent Voss's team and it stopped twice out on the circuit yesterday within the same session and the car still seemingly has dramas because it is sitting in the pit lane so if that car does go it's going to have it would start from the back anyway but it's going to have to start after everybody else has funneled their way through the first chicane and Alvaro Parent touched on the first chicane when he was talking to John Watson down on the grid well we know it's always a bit leery however big the grid and when you've got a field this strong with 38 cars good to go it really is going to be a bit heart in mouth for the race director Anna Adam as he hopes everybody will behave themselves they are told at the driver's briefing, it's a three-hour race, you don't have to win the race at the first corner, you can't win it at the first corner, you can lose it at the first corner, but of course these are racing drivers. And John will confirm in a moment that uh, as soon as you put the crash helmet on and the lights go to green, you're going to be racing. It's going to be a fascinating race, this a grid uh, full of delectable cars. There's the Bentley that certainly uh, won lots of admirers this weekend, John. Yes, indeed, and this is the second of the two cars, number seven Bentley, second row of the grid, and, uh, you know, is it too much to wish, to hope, that a brand new team coming in with a product which previously no one would have thought as being a competitive car in, in Blanc Pie Endurance Series, fourth quickest overall in qualifying, could get onto the podium? It's a big, big ask. Not impossible. Not impossible at all. And bear in mind, just thinking ahead, I know we've not got the first race out of the way yet, but the second race is at Silverstone. If it can get a podium here, wouldn't it be good if after an Aston Martin victory at Silverstone last year, Bentley's new GT3 car could score a win at the home race in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series? Well, I'll tell you what, nothing more would drag out the old boys in the BRDC <laughs> to come and cheer from their clubhouse overlooking the racetrack. Remember, Silverstone is a circuit privately owned by a members club, almost unique in the world. In the way the same that Monza is a unique circuit, it is probably the oldest circuit uh, in the calendar of any form of motor racing. Now let's have a look just down the grid. Uh, we will talk about Monza, I'm sure, as the race unwinds. You look left, you see Nissan, you look right, you see McLaren, Aston Martin and BMW, Pro and Pro-Am respectively. A curious cost, BMW is back. A rare Porsche there as you look down the grid. The Black Falcon Mercedes and the Royal Racing BMW. And then Ferrari and Aston Martin, Mark Poole's car, is on the grid. Boots and Gignons, McLaren, the second TDS uh, BMW. A green Ferrari, surely not. Well, there are two in the race and they certainly stand out the Nissan PlayStation Academy winners with two cars at their disposal from Bob Neville's team and at the back of the grid is the Ferrari in the hands of Howard Blank, Jean-Marc Michelier and Yannick Malagol and a space alongside it where the WRT Audi what is in the pit lane should have been. That is a run through the grid, that is the troubled Audi in front of it with the overalls round his waist is uh, Jean-Luc Longchemin, who was one of the uh, winning drivers in the Gentleman Trophy Championship last year. And as that car sits in the pits looking a bit forlorn, I've got to say, the rolling start is getting underway because the green flag lap has started. This is a chance for the drivers now to urge a bit of warmth into the tyres, getting ready for three hours of racing. Well, it's not going to take an awful lot of effort because I can assure you on the grid, <laughs> it is the warmest it's been all over three days. And certainly on the grid, it felt like middle 20 Celsius. 
And of course, that translates into track temperature. It'll heat up, it'll be beyond that. So probably warmer than any point the teams and drivers have been on track over the previous two days and now into Sunday. So they're going to have to think about it. And uh, obviously, the inclination is to push very hard, depending on which driver choice in your three driver or two driver lineup you've gone for. Interestingly, the pole position, McLaren has Alvaro Parent, the pole position sitter, by 0.4 of a second starting the race. Interesting uh, strategy from the team. And of course, if you've got three very fast drivers, it gives you that little bit more flexibility. But as we've said in the past, you always want your fastest, really, to be in at the end. Because if you have a late race safety car, uh, people can make up places. You certainly don't want your man in the car to be losing places. So the field circulates Monza. And as the grid girls and the flag carriers leave with the pole position boards for the individual classes as well, three races in one, of course, Pro, Pro-Am and the Gentleman Trophy and the gentleman trophy now with this problem for Audi uh, looks like it's going to be Ferrari dominated I can't see number four starting the race there's no work going on around it but let's look at the grid as the cars are on this warming up lap McLaren and Ferrari on the front row the second row of the grid is Ferrari and Bentley with Andy Merrick doing the opening stint the third row is where we have yet again Ferrari and Audi the fourth row is Ferrari and Porsche row five is going to be uh, Audi and Mercedes and looking further back on the grid as this 19-row field files through. You've got one or two names familiar from the championship in the past, but moving to different cars. Kevin Estra, for example, uh, who starred last year on the streets of Azerbaijan. Great Porsche driver. He's now McLaren-based and will certainly be a man to watch. Jerome D'Ambrosio, uh, the former Grand Prix racer we've talked about already in the context of Bentley. Frankie Cheng returns with the former Macau Grand Prix winner Andre Kuto for company and the brothers racing team Audi. Mark Schulzitzki back for a second season. Ahmad Alhafi, Stephen Jelly and Michael Kane in the motor-based run. Oman racing team Aston Martin. Nick Curia Cars is back. Andrew Smith, Alistair McCaig and Ollie Brandt doing the driving. You've got Hubert Haupt, former DTM hero many, many years ago in Mercedes. And another car to watch, even though they were really struggling for grip yesterday. Mark Poole's Aston Martin, Richard Abra and Joe Osborne, his co-drivers. A dark horse, I think, in Pro-Am, if they can get that car to behave itself. After a one-off outing at the Nürburgring last year, Alexander Matschel's Ferrari team steps up for a full season. Alex Buncombe's Nissan had all sorts of woes yesterday, largely about the lack of power and turbo pipe loose issues. Well, hopefully that car is going to be fit, ready and healthy and can storm up through the field. The redoubtable Mark Sword and Jean-Claude Lanier back for another season in the Gentleman Trophy. Mark Sword having been racing and winning championships in 1971 and he's still going strong. It'll be interesting at the start to see how the second row gets away, particularly the Bentley, because directly behind that are two of the factory Audis, the Santalock racing car, and that's going to be started by Edward Sandstrom and the Belgian WR team started by Cesar Ramos. They're going to realise that Bentley punches a massive hole in the air. If they can get that slipstream, they might be able to put themselves into a position into that first chicane. As ever, very, very tight. And as the cars turn through the Parabolica, the other car in the race that we've already seen in the pits is at pit out, ready to go. So, the opening round of the 2014 Blancpain Endurance Series here at Monza is about to get underway. That's the race director, Alan Adam, who will change the lights from red to green to get racing underway if he's happy with the start as this monster field pours out of the parabolica the lights are on red at the moment everybody getting very toey ready to go they head up towards the lighting gantry the lights go green we're in business the 2014 gt season is go and it's going to be a drag race between ferrari mclaren and don't rule out the bentley as they go down towards the first chicane alvaro parent on the inside alongside him as they dive down to the first chicane is giacomo petrobelli and up the inside here comes andy merrick who's going to get second under breaking great move absolutely superb start by Andy Merrick he got the jump on the cars alongside him got into position and has taken second place away from the Ferrari and lots of cars going up the escape road so there isn't quite enough room for everybody so they've all survived I think the escape road doing its bit Hopefully nobody suffered any damage in all of that as the field streams round for the first time. But Alvaro Parent leading the way and the monster Bentley. Andy Merrick at the wheel of car seven is there behind him in second spot. And then Giacomo Petrobelli in the first of the pro-arm cars, the Ferrari that was on the front row of the grid, disappointed to let the Bentley get the jump. But again, look at the Bentley. It's very gentle on its tyres. That's one thing we've learned about how the Bentley performs so far. Now let's see what its consistency like is over the race pace. We're going to have about a one-hour segment before we make the mandatory driver pit stop change and refueling. Giacomo Petrobelli then down to third, but still in the lead of the Pro-Am category. And then in fourth place, Edward Sandstrom, the Swedish driver starting in the car qualified. Best of all by Stefan Ortelli yesterday. The Nissan also gobbling up the opposition. 
cutting down the pack as they come up towards the Variante Ascari. And the second of the Bentley is turning its way through, number eight. That is the car being started by Antoine Leclerc. So, so far, so good. No dramas. Everybody out of the second uh, of the chicanes, then through the Variante Ascari. Now on the run down to the Parabolica for the first time. And at ART Grand Prix, it looks as though it's McLaren is going to lead. And indeed, he's gapping the field at the end of lap one. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, uh... McLaren just simply had the pace in qualifying, and they've been able to dial that in to the start of the race, clear air into the chicane first. And of course, Alvaro Perez knows this car so well. He said the car's a big improvement on last year's McLaren, still edgy, but he's able to control it and he's used it to full advantage. He's pulled out, what, a 1.6 second advantage on the opening lap. The Bentley is under attack because the rather more svelte Ferrari of Giacomo Petrobelli attacking down to the first chicane in fourth place is Edward Sandstrom and the Antoine Leclerc Bentley is in 11th place at the end of lap one but of course all this is going to shuffle and shuffle again over the course of three hours. It will, I mean everybody's just getting a feel for being a racing driver having spent the best part of four or five months playing on some kind of car game on a computer. <laughs> this is for real, they had a few days in fairness down at Porica side by side into the second chicane. Petrobelli on the outside, but Andy Merrick has large elbows and he staves him off, so the uh, man from Chester is hanging on in there in second spot. So Merrick is second and Petrobelli back in the championship, the former Formula Palmer Audi racer, showing he's as quick as ever. He's right on the tail. But of course, while they're squabbling, the leader's getting away. He is, and it's perfect for Alvaro Parent. He wanted that clear track. He wants to take advantage of it. He knows that in another 20 minutes or so, he'll be catching up to the tail of this train of cars. And from that point, then a lot of his driving will be compromised by where he can overtake, but happy faces down the pit lane. Nissan very happy indeed with the progress of their car. We saw Nick Miller, the last driver to be uh, focused on there in the Nissan pit bunker, watching his car, but it's Alvaro Parent leading from Andy Merrick, from Giacomo Petrovelli, and then the best of the Audis, not WRT, interestingly, but the Santilop car in the hands of Edward Sandstrom. The Bentley looking very, very good through the Ascari chicane. It was in the middle of this chicane that Stephen Kane unfortunately dropped it, stuck it in that green barrier behind or below the Blanc Pinsant. A lot of damage to the bodywork, nothing to the car as such, the structure of the car. The team had to spend all the night building and rebuilding that car. Marco Seafried in the very distinctive green Ferrari there, getting himself in a battle as he comes up across the line with Kevin Est in the second of the ART Grand Prix McLarens. Over the timing line they come, it's Parent to Merrick, three seconds now. Third is Petrobelli, fourth is Sandstrom, in fifth place is Rizzoli, in sixth is Est, seventh is Seafried, eighth is Cesar Ramos in Audi number one, and then in ninth place at the moment is Nico Verdonk in the Mercedes with the reigning champion Max Buch as a co-driver. And in tenth place is number 15, the Buch from Gignon, McLaren, Frederick Verviche at the wheel. Battles everywhere. Mercedes taking on McLaren. That is one of the Buchsen cars around the outside. Tries to go the Sergei Afanasiev. Mercedes and the Luke Oil livery. It's got the inside line down to the next chicane. Is that going to be a change of place on the inside line? The answer is yes, it is. And there was a little bit of a pinch coming into the chicane. McLaren had to go a little bit off track. Ferrari also, was that a puncture on the Ferrari or was it just simply a driver error down at the first chicane? As it makes its way through the markers to eventually return to the racetrack. But the gap now, Alvaro Parent, when he came across the start finish line at the second lap, was 3.1 seconds. He's just simply in a different league, lapping, well, the first part of a second, just under a second, quicker than the second place uh, Bentley of Andy Merrick. There he is, under pressure from the rest of the field. But on Merrick, he's holding that position. Yeah. You saw John Wickham on the pit wall, the vast experienced race engineer and team manager. He's been everywhere, done oh, everything. Absolutely. There's a song about that. Been everywhere, man, done everything. And uh, John Wickham, of course, so much knowledge, experience, insight. He makes it look so casual and easy. Been there, he's, done. he's got every T-shirt going. This long, long line of cars all queued up for second place as Alvaro Parent continues to extend the advantage. That Ferrari team going up the escape road got involved with uh, Steve Earls for our bit of contact at the first chicane, we're told, and that's what caused one to go up the escape road. Look at this great battle. Porsche versus BMW coming out of the Parabolica. It's the Royal BMW just ahead, and then you've also got Nissan joining in this mix as well as they come over the pits. Eric Dermont in the Porsche, Stefano Comandini in the BMW, and Mark Schulzitzki splits them in the Nissan. He's got past one, he's going to boom past the other, I think, on the outside. He got the run out of the Parabolica. He was best positioned, he saw what was going on. He wasn't able to do anything with the BMW. I thought he might have been able to get alongside coming into the first chicane, but uh, he thought better of it wisely in Mark Chelinski's case. He's got a long, long way to go. We're only, what, eight minutes or so into this race. Now, number three, Audi, James Nash, getting involved in battles midfield as well. James uh, 
having his first rear-wheel drive races since his Formula Ford days, moving from the World Touring Car Championship in Audi number three. Now there in number 80, uh, Nissan, pounding on in the Pro-Am category, Alex Buncombe, the start driver. We know that Alex is quick indeed. He led, didn't he, in the opening stint here last year? He did indeed. He made a very impressive run for the Nissan. Unfortunately, it didn't work out in the end, but it was certainly an indication of what the, the, the potential Nissan has. And again, talking about the Bentley, brand new team, brand new car, making progress, second place. And Alex Buncombe started 32nd on the grid. He was 15th at the end of lap one. He's 12th after three laps. He's absolutely flying. Well, he was always, always out of position. They had some issues with the turbo boost. One of the pipes to the turbo was not doing its job. That caused the team to lose track time and consequently didn't get the qualifying they run. Now they've got the car running. Remember, the Nissan has been given a slight uplift and boost this year, offsetting that. They've got to carry a little bit more weight. So it's all about balance of performance, and Nissan have gained a little bit of grunt with a bit more weight. Well, there's another battle building up now for 11th because Alex Buncombe is on the back of Sergei Afanasiev in the Mercedes. Two mighty cars, and they will be making their way up towards the timing line in a moment as there, look, Mercedes tackles Ferrari number 19 Mercedes in the hands of Hubert Haupt, who in the early 90s was an Audi DTM racer. Look at this, the battle is still well and truly joined down at the first chicane as still Andy Merrick is having to defend Giacomo Petrobelli right up behind him, and he in turn is being caught by Stefano Rotelli. Yeah, indeed, that was a close run and coming out of the chicane. The thing with the Bentley is it is actually a much quicker car on a straight line than we had thought it was going to be. It is a physically large car. And secondly, it's punching a big hole in the air. But the Ferrari, which ought to be a quick car on a straight line, doesn't seem to be able to gain any advantages getting that big, big draft. Malcolm Wilson, who runs M Sport, which runs the Bentley operation, looking on. Yes, I say Ortelli, it's Ortelli's car, Edward Sandstrom at the wheel of it. Apologies in this first stint. He's on the back of Petro Belli, and they're all bunching up nicely. Edward Sandstrom and Ortelli, of course, moving away for Blancpain endurance races from WRT to Santiloc. And whilst this long, long line of cars continues to argue over second place, so the leader, Alvaro Parent, is building up a huge advantage. Five seconds already. Alex Buncombe's progress. 12th place is on the back of Afanasiev. We'll see the two in a moment. Coming towards us, there is the Mercedes. Right with him is Alex Buncombe in the Nissan. And just about everybody except the leader has got somebody to play with. Well, I think what Alvaro Parent's going to try and do is build up a lead, maybe around 12, 10 or 12 seconds. And then he can sort of fall back to the pace of the rest of the field, which will save him on fuel. It'll mean that he's not using the tower quite so hard. And uh, I would have thought that would be a pretty sensible thing to do at the leading up to the conclusion. Down the inside this time into Parabolica. No. Petrobelli had a look, couldn't do it. He wants to get on with this because he's conscious, of course, that he is under attack. He wants to get past and try not only to pull away, but do something to stop that McLaren pulling too far away. Well, he's going to have a hard battle because the Bentley's covering every base that the Ferrari is trying to put itself into. So Petrobelli has uh, tried one way into Parabolica, and now he's going to have another look down the outside, coming down into the first chicane. But again, the Bentley's good in the brakes. Car looks very solid on the racetrack. And the Ferrari again has to fall in behind the rear wing of the Bentley and follow up through the chicane. Merrick can go through the chicane at whatever speed he chooses, and then they get on the throttle. Petrobelli's having to wait. How about this little fight between Aston Martin and Audi? Two British squads running these cars, Motorbase and uh, Team Parker Racing, as they run together. And once again, Petrobelli is lined up to have a go, but again, he's on the outside. Andy Merrick doing everything right here to defend. Everywhere Petrobelli wants to be, there's a Bentley in the way. And he made a mistake this time in the second chicane. Petrobelli might get alongside into the Lesmo. Edward Sandstrom also <laughs> trying to follow through, but again, acceleration off that second chicane. The Bentley just left the Ferrari and Audi in it. Slipstream. It's like a dragster, it just takes off, doesn't it? And don't forget that behind Sandstrom, there's another good battle between the Ferraris. Stefano Gai has got right up behind him, Marco Seafried. Remember Stefano Gai, a winner in the Ferrari Challenge here a week ago. These are the two Porsches, and they've managed to get themselves together, squabbling with BMWs and Nissans and Aston Martins and Ferraris and anything else you care to name. And the Bentley still holds its second place on the run from the second Lesmo all the way up to the Ascari chicane. That's where the car went off. In qualifying, this time car looks very, very good. The second Bentley has been drawn up yeah. to the battle for second place because of the place of and pace of Andy Berry. We've had a change for fifth, just as they wriggle their way through the Valiant Escari. You can see it's happened. The green Ferrari, that's Marco Seafried, is ahead of the black one, which is Stefano Guy. Right on the outside of him goes Kevin Estra in the McLaren. So Kevin Estra, who is a real star, no matter what you put him in, he's a star. He's now charging. Well, that's the kind of drive we saw from Kevin Estra when he went to Baku for the final round of the Blombard Sprint. 2013 and he got his drive a factory drive in effect because of that 
The Ferrari again trying to gain some slipstream as the lead for the battle oh. for second place. It's so frustrating for Petrobelli. He knows that if he can get ahead of the Bentley, he will pull away. He may not be able to run down the McLaren, but he will manage to do better than he's currently able to do in third place. And the other frustration is he's up against a good car, but also a good driver. Andy Merrick didn't come down in the last shower. He knows oh, exactly well, what he's doing. In the gravel. That's the Pro-Am car, Richard Abra, Mark Poole and Joe Osborne, and it's in the gravel bed. That's the Parabolica, and this is for second place, and Petro Belli knows exactly where he wants to be, but he can't do it. And look at Seafried round the outside, the Bentley goes straight on. Marco Seafried has gained the place in the Ferrari, but that contact has put the Bentley up the escape road, but it keeps its place. Indeed it will do, because that was contact from behind from Petro Belli. Hit the back of the Bentley. Merrick had no choice but to do it. Slightly to the right, there is a, a, an access road which you're allowed to use, and he did the, the, the clever thing, the right thing. He didn't panic. He used that access road. He came back onto the racetrack. He was ahead of Petro Belli as he had been ahead of the remaining remainder of the field. So now a, a different Ferrari is attacking, or maybe it's the same one, in fact, attacking as we come up to this Gary chicane. And we've also got a drive-through penalty being given to car 111, which is Steve Earle's Gentleman Trophy Castle Racing Ferrari. That got involved early on with the Howard Black Ferrari down at the first corner, sent it up the escape road, yellow flags out of the Parabolica because of the Aston Martin. Look at the size of the lead that Perent's got, and this is everybody else for second place. So Bentley still under attack, Andy Merrick really just turning his mirrors down so he doesn't see what's going on behind him and hoping that nobody lobs it down the inside and tries to be as forceful as we saw just a little bit earlier in the lap in the second chicane. Back into a green flag zone so they can carry on racing properly and thinking about overtaking race order. Perant leads the way, second is Merrick, third is Petrobelli, fourth now, Marco Seafried over the line. Down to fifth, it's got Edward Sandstrom, so that green Ferrari, driven by Marco Seafried, is the one on a mission. And look at Kevin Estra on the outside of Sandstrom as they break for the turn one chicane, he can't do it though. No, and again, very wisely decided not to force the issue, Edward Sandstrom is there on Merrick, he's trying to fight to make position. So let's look again at what happened down into this second chicane. The contact comes, there it is. The Bentley had to turn to the right. There's the access route, well, that is demarcated by that yellow line. He gets back as we now go back to real live racing. One lap ago, there was contact. This time, the two cars separated. But Petro Belli is trying to attack and defend at the same time. And in fact, he's doing a bit more defending than attacking because there, Marco Sifri, after a season or so in Porsche, is now moving to Ferrari, is right on his tail. And the Castle Racing squad looking on now to see how he's going to get on in this battle. So there is triple three. Marco Sifri and Petro Belli goes wide. And Sifri has gone again. The momentum off that second Lesmo. He gained the momentum when he got ahead of Sundstrom and the Audi. He now is trying to get the Petro Belli Ferrari in his sight. Not easy to pass down into the second chicane, but he's going one way, going to the outside. Petro Belli now having to defend from a fellow Ferrari driver, Siegfried, in the green car, third, fourth place on the road. Giacomo Petro Belli, who is very much the epitome of what Pro-Am is all about. He's a businessman during the week, he's a very quick racing driver at the weekend, and he is running very impressively in very good company, isn't he? Well, to be on the front row of the grid, time set by Giacomo Petro Belli, against people like Alvaro Parent or other professional drivers. That guy is more than a businessman. <laughs> He's doing a very good job at the moment of defending, but you can see now how the gap has opened up between second and third, and where does Marco Seafried attack? The gap. If it's going to come, it's probably going to be on the inside, but he's going to have to force the issue. And this is all about bravery. Foot st nailed to the boards as they come over the timing line, but they caught the Bentley, and Petro Belli thinks about attacking again. Is there more contact? There is. Off goes Merrick again. Well, again, that was assisted, so Merrick has done what he had to do. He was forced into taking the turn left, go over the grass route. Again, because of the attack from Petro Belli in the Ferrari this time, he would have felt that I really was close enough alongside to go down the inside and take the corner. But you need to have a long side, really, to do that and to turn one. The concern I'm going to have is that Petro Belli, and again, an error from Metna, whether that is seen to have any gain or advantage to Andy Merrick, no contact yet, he made an error. Is that maybe something aligning with the brakes, maybe overheating on the brakes? There's no other pressure on Andy Merrick. Then let's look again and see what happened into the first chicane. Yep, hip and shoulder from the Ferrari to the back of the Bentley. I mean, that Bentley has got a pair of hips and shoulders on them. No wonder it's a British brand. <laughs> it's a strong old car. You're going to have to go some to shovel that out of the way, aren't you? There it is from a different angle. Andy Merrick launches it over the curb, across the grass, back onto the circuit. And clearly, Giacomo Petrobelli wants a Bentley because he's doing his best to get into that one. But what he's also doing is damaging his own car. And yeah. the more he keeps contacting the back of the Bentley, 
where there's not going to be any significant damage. But around the front of the Ferrari, you've got all the aerodynamics, you've also got the radiators, the oil coolers, anything that could affect the performance of the car. Now Siegfried gets up alongside, can he maintain it as they go almost side by side into Parabolica? Marco Siegfried has to slot back in behind, what else is going on? Everything is going on lower down the order. There's the second of the Bentleys with Antoine Leclerc at the wheel. In 10th place as the Ferrari fight comes up over the line. Again, look, the Bentley has gapped them, they come past the pits. Marco Siegfried once again will go for the inside, I suspect if he can. I wonder has Petrobelli, when he's losing ground to the Bentley, as we can see it's now maybe half a second, Siegfried again going down the outside into the right-hand turn one, and the gap closes up and breaks, and I just wonder, that mistake we saw from Andy Merrick down at the second chicane is maybe an indication that he's having to be a little bit more cautious on the brakes than he had been in the opening lap, and that's why the Ferraris are running down the Bentley in these tight chicanes. Could well be, so one to monitor as this stint wears on. Petrobelli on the previous lap did the best of anybody in set to one, so he's certainly pushing and he has to push. Marco Seafried is right there, Giacomo Petrobelli defending as best he can, and the game may close a little coming into the chicane. No dramas on this lap for Merrick there, and coming out of the corner, so he pulls away once more. Petrobelli has got his work cut out, keeping Marco Seafried at bay, but he's doing a great job of doing so. Indeed, but really, this is all to the relief of the Bentley and Andy Merrick because he is aware from what's happening behind that there is pressure now on Petrobelli. He's thinking more about defence than he is attack, so that's allowing Andy Merrick to maybe lift off fractionally earlier, just roll the Bentley into these tight chicanes, rather than hitting the brake pedal hard and trying to stop it on a dime, which, of course, puts heat into the brakes. Up to the Valiante Ascari they come. This is lap 10 in a three-hour race. Great battles we've enjoyed so far. And the Marco Seafried green Ferrari, which is run by GT Course by Rinaldi, is on the back of the Castle Racing equivalent in the hands of Giacomo Petrobelli. Cars funneling their way out of the Variante Ascari. You saw the Nissan in the hands of Alex Buncombe, Stephen Jelly in the Aston Martin, and the BMW there from Royal Motorsport in the hands of Stefano Comandini. Right, Ferrari fight, Parabolica. What happens now, John? Yeah, Alex Siegfried has got an opportunity again. He's taken a later entry into the corner. He's got a different exit. Can he, get the, can he get the momentum to get up behind Petrobelli's Ferrari? He's got there, but he seems then stalls out. Petrobelli has just got enough speed in the middle sector of the straight. Now under brakes, down the outside, again Siegfried goes, but he's not going to get sufficiently ahead of the Petrobelli Ferrari to take the corner. The gap between Bentley and Ferrari over the line, 11 tenths of a second. Giacomo Petrobelli, though, is still doing a very good job of keeping Marco Seafried behind him. In fifth place, it is Edward Sandstrom. And then behind him, there is Kevin Ast, who is closing. So we're going to have an Audi versus McLaren fight before long. In seventh place is Stefano Guy. Eighth is last year's winner here. Outright, Cesar Ramos now at Audi, not Ferrari. And ninth and tenth, Nico Vedonc and Antoine Leclerc, meaning it's Mercedes and Bentley, to round out the top ten. It won't be that long before we have to start thinking about Lapri as well. Well, that's what I was saying. I think within about 15, 20 minutes, that's going to happen. In the meantime, Alvaro Perez has got just under a 10-second advantage over the second-place Bentley of Merrick. There is our race leader. His lap time is still about four or five tenths of a second quicker than the battle for that second place, but he's able now to drive his car. He might wonder, is there a race actually going? I mean, where is the rest of the field? There's nobody in his mirrors, there's nobody looking out of the front of the car, so he really is very lonely indeed at the moment, but he's still pounding in good lap times. His last was only uh, a tenth shy of his earlier best. Leclerc getting all toey now, isn't he, in the other Bentley to find a way past Nico Verdonk, who's driven a great variety of cars over the course of the Blanc Pan history. He's only ever missed one race, and he's doing a good job now too. And Antoine Leclerc looks like he's going to try and make a move on the Mercedes, he was close as they came through the exit. Looking at Marco Seafried's Ferrari as well, which I thought was about to dive up the inside, but to no avail. Uh, Leclerc, I thought, maybe it was a little bit closer on the exit of the Ascari chicane, didn't maintain that gap. So, uh, once again, we've got these two Ferraris battling over third place. Siegfried looks to go again to the long way around. He's right under the rear wing, you can barely see the car. Now he flicks out to the left. Has he got any more momentum this time? Can he get alongside? Can he force the issue? And he's going to try it this time. No, Petrobelli. And again, good thing to be from Siegfried because he could so easily have tried to be aggressive and cut across the front of Petrobelli. The result would have been contact and both cars would have been affected. Maybe both cars taken out. So the race currently works lap number 12. We talked about that drive-through penalty for Steve Earle's Ferrari. Well, he's ignored it four times. So now that car's been given a black flag which is not the ideal way to start your season, is it? Doesn't endear you to the race officials doing things like that. The Ferrari fight for third continues. It's McLaren, Bentley, Ferrari, Ferrari. And that is the garage of GT caused by Rinaldi, which is looking at the fourth-placed 
Ferrari, Kermit the Ferrari in fourth in the hands of Marco Siegfried. You can see on the screen that Siegfried is a quarter of a second quicker as his best on that last lap, 0, 0 0.4 at his worst. So clearly the quicker of the two Ferraris at the moment. If he can get past Giacomo Petrobelli and they're looking into the team, we've got matching T-shirts to go with the car. How sweet. Even though perhaps green is not everybody's favourite colour for a Ferrari. Excuse me. <laughs> it's the international racing colours of Ireland. My point entirely. There is triple one in the pit lane, uh, the car of Steve Earle that has now finally responded to the black flag for the drive through penalty. But I have a feeling there's not much through about this. I think it might have stopped for good. Well, I just wonder how a driver can miss a black flag for four consecutive laps, not least of all because there's radio communication. Yes. As we go back in this battle for fourth place, Siegfried again right on the tail of the Ferrari, closer than he's been on the edge of the par Parabolica on any lap, and this is his best opportunity. He carefully doesn't tag the back of the uh, Petrobelli's car, because that could cause an issue. Again, as soon as he pulls out, he just goes into clean air, and it's like somebody puts a big wall up in front of the green Ferrari, and it loses its momentum. And down into the braking area, this is where traditionally they close up a little on the Bentley. And yet again, it's Petrobelli able to just stand his ground. Again, it shows you the balance of performance, doesn't it, here? Because you've got the car so evenly matched, it's really hard to find a way past, even in a sister car. And has the Bentley got past it? Has, I think, the Mercedes. So there we see this battle again, fourth place through the Curva Grande, the magnificent Curva Grande. Before, there used to be no runoff, there used to be trees on the outside of the Curva Grande in the good old days. And in the next part of the circuit, coming up towards the Lesmos, if you go back into the early 80s, there used to be two bits of Formula One McLaren, John. Uh, that was later, that was in the 80s. <laughs> yes, quite, but yes. But in 1974, I had a suspension failure on the exit of this corner, Lesmo 1, and I was on a pretty hot lap, according to my team, and the car just turned sharp left. The barrier ran along where that white line is now. How much change have we seen at Monza? Yet it's still... It, it just it has got that magic atmosphere yes. of being old school and... It's the trees, it's the park, it's just the magic of Monza. And the atmosphere from the fans as well. That's Afanasiev under pressure from Alex Buncombe in the Nissan, who's going to line up to have a go. He's on the outside for the next corner, but if he's got the straight line speed, he's going to go through, and he does go through. Alex Buncombe up into 11th place from 32nd on the grid. Good run again out of the second, Lesmo. That gave the momentum to the Nissan, to Alex Buncombe, to get up alongside, and once you get alongside, you need to be alongside well before you get to the braking zone into Ascari. Otherwise, it's easy for the car you're trying to pass to defend. But Buncombe did what he had to do, and it was a clean overtake. And now you can see pressure from the purple, as I pointed out yesterday. Purple is the international racing colours of Egypt. Not that we see many Egyptian national teams in motorcycle. Again, down the one way, Siegfried has to cut back to the left to try and get alongside Petrobelli. This time he's got it done, has he? Yes, I think he's got it. Round the outside, very good stuff, and he's worked oh so hard to make that move stick. And now that he's ahead, expect Marco Siegfried to start to edge away, but boy, has he earned his money by just getting that one place alone. Good, clean motor racing between the two Ferraris. We see Petrobelli being combative, literally, in every sense, with the Bentley on two occasions bumping into the rear bumper. Well, that's going to make not much difference to the Bentley. It's going to think, well, there's other mosquitoes around or something. I mean, there's something nibbling at me. Whatever we now see, Manfred Siegfried, can he run down Andy Merrick in the Bentley? And if he can run him down, can he actually make a pass with the momentum? Let's look again into first chicane. On the outside, but this occasion is just about a car length ahead of Petrobelli's Ferrari. Clean pass, Petrobelli gives it up. He knows there's still another two hours and 25 minutes of this race to go. Great move, here it is from another angle. Uh, Marco Seafried went one way, he went the other. And of course the outside for the first part is the inside for the second part, but they almost touched John as they got to the braking zone. That was really, really good stuff. Yeah, but you can't be almost pregnant. Either <laughs> they touch or they don't touch. Well, thankfully they didn't. That in the pit lane, I fear, is drama for Nissan. Mark Schulzitzki's car has been in the pits for a long, long time, and the well, engineer's that, going well, to work. That's like power steering fluid mm. that's being uh, drained, so maybe a problem with the power steering on the Nissan. Certainly, without power steering, suddenly you'll realise how much... Well, there's another Mercedes SLS off the track being towed away. Was that from an earlier incident? Or it is. That that's Mikhail Loboda, who's just gone off the road, and I think he did that during pre-qualifying yesterday as well, didn't he? Consistent as a <laughs> So waved yellow with a red and yellow flag waiting whether there is fluid or water or oil on the racetrack let's look and see oh dear me up at Ascari well there's nothing on the racetrack to worry about unless something occurred 
with the Mercedes to cause it to do what we've just seen. So the flags are waved just to warn drivers that there has a car been off track and it's being attended to by the vehicle that is going to tow it to safety and you are obliged to not go quicker than your fastest point or fastest time at that particular point of the racetrack. The Aston Martin incident that we saw off earlier on, that is back in the race, three laps down. And Marco Seafried, as you've just seen, is now definitely on the tail of the Bentley. Kevin Est is definitely on the tail of Edward Sandstrom, so there's more to shake out yet. And the, the funny thing is it may well drag Petrobelli along to catch up to the tail of the Manfred Siegfried Ferrari, which is now going to try and find a way past the Bentley. So it's a bit of sort of musical chairs. Who's going to be sitting or who's going to be standing when the music stops? The one in the box seat is still Perret, who is just out on his own with nobody to battle against and now leading by 11 seconds. Meantime, at WRT, all sorts of aerodynamic aids, even for the mechanics, look. Well, maybe he needs... <laughs> well, yeah, well, yellow wave, yellow flags. I mean, there is an oil flag being waved, which indicates that there must be something on the racetrack at that point. The whole field clearly slowed down more than they had done previously into the Ascari chicane which is what you're obliged to do. Now you can see flashing lights from the Bentley. What's that all about? Let's see what's ahead, because it's clearly to try and alert somebody to the progress of the car, not to get in the way. It could now be that we've got one or two of the cars delayed early on, starting to get in the way. But Marco Seafried is nearly there, isn't he, on the back of Andy Merrick, who has done a very good job in this opening stint in that car. Heads up towards the timing line as they come through. The gap second to third is down to half a second. Is Marco Seafried going to be able to take full advantage of the aero shape of the Ferrari in attack? He's now flashing the lights to say, come on, let me by. Well, Andy Merrick's not going to just let him go through, is he? No, he's not. He's gone from left to right. He's entitled to do that. He's not allowed to come back again and make a second move. And he pretty much obeyed the regulation there. Got into the first chicane ahead of the Ferrari. Again, he got control of that. It's the exit of, the, of this chicane where he wants to be very strong. Siegfried now got a good run out of the chicane. Gets up alongside, coming through the curve of Grandi. Contact, and it gets ahead. So Siegfried has done it relatively quickly and without the drama we saw from Petrobelli. Merrick's fighting back as best he can, though, but he needs to be on the next corner because I don't think, now that Seafried is ahead, that he's going to be able to really mount a proper challenge. Marco Seafried has gone through, and now he starts to pull away. The car will be at its quickest in his hands because uh, Rinat Sonikov and Vadim Kogar, who are his two co-drivers, are nowhere near as quick, I'm afraid. Let's see how the Bentley deals with the Lesmo 2. Can it get a run? Can it challenge the Ferrari? Because the Ferrari really did struggle on the very quick parts of this Monza track to make any impression at all on the Bentley. Has the Bentley got the grunt on a straight line? No, it's got the benefit of a slipstream. No, it's not. Merit. The Ferrari has just managed to claw that extra half a second sufficient to keep it clear of the Bentley in for now in fourth place. So the co-drivers watch on for the pit bunker. Battles rage right the way around Monza. There's the second of the Bentleys, Antoine Leclerc at the wheel of it, but he is being hunted down by Alex Buncombe. And the team manager of car 93 is being summoned to the race director. That's Eric Dermont's Porsche, which has transgressed somehow, somewhere. Now look at this, Kevin Astre versus Edward Sandstrom. This is Audi versus McLaren, and Kevin Astre is, believe me, a real hero. So this is going to be one hell of a fight. It is, and you have to think that Kevin Astre is a bit of an overtaking specialist. A little bit too far behind Edward Sandstrom at this point. To be able to make a move, the Audi is showing good straight line speed, something that has not always been guilty of. So can the McLaren close it down under brakes into the first chicane? The gap has closed down. You couldn't get any closer in the case of the McLaren to the Audi, but it's the squirt out of that first chicane with the McLaren really having to wait until the Audi goes before he can get on the gas. Petrobelli coming back at the Bentley as well, isn't he? So, as John alluded to a lap or so ago, it's all these musical chairs, this uh, elasticated situation we've got between the cars, also some having their strengths at different parts of the circuit. Look at this, Audi versus BMW as they come over the timing line now. James Nash in the Audi, Henry Hassid in the BMW, and getting involved with them is Phil Quaife in the McLaren who goes to the outside line. Henry Hassid is ahead, or is he? Because Quaife's going to go around the outside of one, of two, but he runs out of road, he's all over the kerb. Two up, two down. Now, so he, he didn't gain anything and he may well lose another position. He opted to do what he had to do. He could have stayed on the racetrack and, and probably got more of a, an incumbent, but as the BMW has had a problem, it's just going through the chicane. Uh, as you're not intended to do, that is the safety. But down at the second chicane, we can see the BMW trying to get back as the idea also chases the tail of the BMW, got the run off the second chicane. So the BMW under pressure coming to Lesmo 1. The other BMW you saw there was that of Benjamin Lariche going up the escape road. This is what it all was about heading into the turn one chicane. So Hassid defends from Nash, and that of course leaves the outside of the road all clear for Quay to try and find a way round. 
but then he just runs out of road and has well, to back out of it. Actually, he sort of bailed out of it. He had room. He didn't have to do what he did because the Audi hadn't closed down. He was. He probably could have stayed on track, but maybe there would have been contact. Those are the judgments the driver's got to make in the milliseconds that all these decisions are being thrown at you. He decides, the Audi, I, can, I know it's there somewhere. I can't see it. I'll do the safe thing. Comes back on track. The Audi continues ahead, so nothing gained, nothing lost. In traffic now, the Team Parker Racing Audi being lapped, and that gets out of the way of second, third, and fourth, who all uh, dive past Ian Loggett going down towards the first chicane. Giacomo Petrobelli will see this as an opportunity. He's had lots of time to think about it. He's been stuck behind the Bentley since this race got underway, <laughs> and he's seen uh, the Siegfried, the Ferrari of Edward Siegfried, get through. Uh, he is going to try and repeat the situation, but he hasn't got the acceleration or speed from the second chicane, first chicane down to the second. Now, side by side, McLaren. And the Ferrari as well in the hands of Pierre Arendt as they come down to turn one. This is that battle we were looking at a lap ago. Henry Hassid ahead of James Nash, ahead of Phil Quaife, ahead of Pierre Arendt. They've just switched back again, so Quaife goes back ahead, although the Ferrari was just in advance when they came over the timing line. Ahead of them is the Ferrari there, the AF Corsa car of home soil, Amato Ferrari's car. Uh, Andrew Danilov, the driver, the Canadian, and the BMW of Henry Hassid really is under pressure. James Nash in the Pro Cup Audi looking for a way by. James switching from the rough and tumble of the World Touring Car Championship to the slightly different version of rough and tumble of GT racing because it's all action so far and he's on the inside. Can he make the move on the inside? Not quite. No, he needs to be really long side before you get to the braking area coming into Lesmo 1, but he's positioned well. He has to maintain that position coming through the second Lesmo and ensure that he gets a clean more not losing your downforce in the middle of Lesmo 2 and then being able to get the, the drive off the corner but the BMW did a good job so James Nash would have to scratch ahead again and think probably unlikely up the hill into the third chicane the Ascari chicane Parabolica he's got to be thinking about preparations for that he's also got to be mindful that Phil Quave ain't that far behind him and he wants to get the McLaren in that mix as well if he can there is the Boots and Gignon car Phil Quave is the star driver in that car as Merrick's car quivers a little under braking for the chicane is he going to be able to turn it in yes he is but Petrobelli is right back on his tail yeah you can see that Andre Merrick is slightly slower now in the middle of that first chicane from turning right to turning left there's a little bit of laziness coming into the car but you know hey this is a brand new car running on Merritt in third place and second and only because of the, the severe challenge from the Ferrari of Siegfried that he found his way through down to the chicane they come, this is the second chicane and Petrobelli needs to be mindful that he's still under pressure himself in the pack behind, and look at the first chicane again John yeah and again Andy Merrick just going in the middle of the racetrack, it is a physically imposing car and of course everything around it is dwarfed you can also see the damage on the front of Petrobelli's Ferrari there'll be damage on the back of the Bentley I think because of the earlier dramas, let's hear from the Bentley team principal John Wickham with Jack Thanks, David. John, you're getting bullied a little bit out there. Yes. <laughs> um, the car is uh, holding together very well, the, the car that had the accident. Um, we're just finding that the uh, rear tyres are going off a little bit, a tiny bit more than, than the others, I think. Um, but generally, the car standing up to the treatment is getting... <laughs> and uh, no damage from a couple of taps that you've had from the Ferrari? Not that we can see it from here, so and it was this side, so we think we're okay with that. Cool, thank you. Okay. Good strong British car, you see. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a car built by a company who's known for building exceptional rally cars on behalf of the Ford Motor Company, and they've put all that expertise, experience, into building a car for GT racing here in the Blanc Pie Endurance Series, and it's paid dividends because on two occasions they've had more than a love tap from the Ferrari of Petrobelli, and there's no contact, no damage. Uh, Petrobelli again having a little look down the inside but really hasn't got the pace. There's certainly damage on the front of the Ferrari, isn't there, on that front left corner? No surprise, really, given its aggression early on in the race. Now, that is the Sandstrom Est and Guy battle because Stefano Guy has not given up either in the Pro Am Ferrari. And look at Petrobelli, he's right under the rear wing. Yeah, Petrobelli's got another opportunity coming down to the second chicane, gets alongside, but will he be able to hold that position under brakes? He's going to have to go deep under brakes, he can brake fractionally later than the Bentley, but again, Andy Merrick is absolutely stunning on the brakes, and Petrobelli's had to back out of it. 
Andy Merrick's an experienced driver of sports cars, perhaps less so GT relative to prototypes, but this is a very, very good showing indeed. He's doing everything right, and remember, that Ferrari 458 is a well-developed car. The Bentley is a real infant. Well, it is in relative terms, but what's been proved to me, and I think proved to everybody who's watching this race, is what a well-sorted, what a kind handling car the Bentley's proving to be. We've had John Wickham say they're maybe giving a little bit more rear tyre wear than they had anticipated, but that we know from practice and from the little bit of testing that Bentley have enjoyed that their car is relatively light on its tyres. Giacomo Petrobelli still there on the back of Andy Merrick. And Giacomo Petrobelli, as you look at a replay of the Boots and Gini on McLaren running out wide, Petrobelli, as we said earlier on, is an am. He goes very, very well in the pro-am category, but he's not a professional racing driver seven days a week behind the wheel of a car. When you put him in the uh, hot seat once again, he always delivers. And this is, I think, in fairness, one of the best drives I've ever seen from Petrobelli. Yeah, you know, it's this difference between what is a professional, what's a gentleman, is somebody who's a businessman who has got the skill of a professional driver, is he a, whatever. I mean, Petrobelli is, by all intents, a professional driver, but he, it isn't his profession, his profession is a business. Up the inside, this for, for third place, heading down towards the first chicane, he locks up, does Petrobelli, but he's got his foot off the pedal, he turns in, he's going to run out wide, the curb beckons, Andy Merrick tries to get back up alongside, but finally, Petrobelli is through, and here comes Edward Sandstrom, he tries to buy into this as well, on the outside, going to the curb of Grandi, this is going to be really brave stuff, can he do it? He tries, they're level, they almost touch, the Audi keeps on coming right the way around the outside, Edward Sandstrom is still fighting, here comes Kevin Esther on the inside to make it three wide, not quite able to do it, Sandstrom's gone through in the Audi, fantastic! Outstanding driving, outstanding racing, Kevin Esther, he's also going to put pressure on, on the back of the Bentley, we see car Ferraris, McLaren's going one way and the other, I mean that was a tough moment for Andy Merrick, he had to deal with the uh, Petrobelli Ferrari getting past, finally down into the first chicane, and then Edwards Sundstrom monstered him all the way around the outside of the Curva Grande. Kevin Est was there saying, I want a bit of this action too. <laughs> He's now got to find a way. It's taken Ferraris, and what's the best part of it, we're on lap 21, to find a way past the Bentley. Now Kevin Esther is going to go the long way around, coming up to the Ascari chicane. He's on the outside, but he hasn't got the... No, he don't think about going around the outside. He's tagged the back of the Bentley, but that's just, you know... Hardly any damage whatsoever. You wouldn't even know it had been touched. Well, everybody else seems to have tagged the back of the Bentley, so why not somebody else? But the Bentley keeps on going, even you know, though it's dropped down the It's like a new belt. boy going to school. Everybody picks on you. Exactly. You know, you're going to get bullied. Kevin Astro comes out on the outside going to Parabolica. Now he'll get the cut back, but has he got the straight line speed? He's had to come out of the throttle a little bit because he was slightly misplaced by the Bentley. Now the Bentley's again, the gap opened up on the exit from Parabolica. So Kevin Astro's got to go through the whole merigmarole, the process of closing up and doing it at a part of the track where the McLaren strengths, and you can see coming down the straight, the McLaren has closed up, and it's got not quite enough grunt before the braking zone to get alongside. Remember, we heard John Wickham saying the rear tyres were going off a little bit more and a bit sooner than they'd anticipated. Well, if they are in stride with those rear tyres, then Andy Merrick is going to be in for a pretty long further 20 minutes before he can think about bringing the car in at the hour mark for a new set of boots and relief from one of his co-drivers to take over behind the wheel so he's still going to be a busy boy for 20 minutes as Kevin Est who is a very determined driver indeed tries one side and then the other but he slots back in behind the Bentley going to the second chicane behind is Stefano Guy and then also Cesar Ramos in Audi number one and he also is trying to join this battle as well and he's taking with him Nico Verdonk in the Mercedes and Antoine Leclerc in the other Bentley well it's inevitable the two Bentleys are being determined by the pace of the lead one here, which has now dropped down into that fifth place. But, you know, I, I wonder, are, are, are drivers going to start complaining about the Bentley because they're going to say, this car is physically so big, it occupies the entire circuit, the width of the entire circuit, certainly the width of the racing line on the circuit. It's not fair, we can't get past. Well, some do eventually, and now it's up to Kevin S to show us how good he is to find a way past. You saw in the pit bunker Frederick Vasseur of ART Grand Prix looking on. He's got one of his cars in the lead, the other is sixth in the hands of S. Still Alvaro Parent leading the way. We've rather forgotten about him in all the drama for second and back in the last few laps. Parent has just done 22 laps, nobody else anywhere near the timing line. Here comes S to the outside of the Parabolica, and yet again Andy Merrick is able to defend. This is a great drive by Merrick and to defend nice, as best he can. And it's an outstanding drive by Andy Merrick. Again, the Bentley is very, very stable under brakes. You can see the car, when you brake, there's no sort of 
nose to tail alteration. The car brakes very flat. There's a lot of anti dive somewhere in the brakes. Now Kevin Hestra goes one way, back cuts back to the right, gets alongside this time. He will have the corner going into the first chicane. Oh, they touch, they run, Jimmy. they lead, but he's gone through. Kevin Hestra's done it. Out of the first chicane. Now, the next one to try and find a way past the Bentley is Stefano Guy in the Ferrari. So Andy Merritt is dropping down the order, I'll grant you, but he really is working hard in this new car. And if the rear tyres are going off and he's still able to do this pace, it's very, very impressive indeed. Guy in the Ferrari looks for one side, he looks for the other. And in the background, you can see also there, Nico Verdoc trying to find a way past Cesar Ramos. That's Mercedes versus Audi. I mean, it is a great drive from Andy Merrick. We've seen him defend, defend, defend. Inevitably, we've had two Ferraris get past now, McLaren. And again, under pressure. Let's look again and see how this overtake. He got it alongside at the part of the straight before you get under the brake, into the braking zone. He braked late. You can see the Ferrari weaving and bobbing around. The Bentley much more stable. Again, Merrick comes back, but he's misplaced as they have to turn left to exit that chicane. And then Edward Sandstrom reads all that like a, a book, not an audio book, a proper book with words in it, and gets the job done. So Petrobelli through, Sandstrom through, and then Merrick had to defend from Kevin Est, and this was the third. Again, the McLaren gets alongside well before the braking zone, begins to nose ahead slightly, but then the Bentley under brakes very strong. Kevin S trying to push the Bentley a little bit more to the left to give him, that is the McLaren and Kevin S, a more margin to turn into the very tight first part of the first chicane. Duncan Tappy and Jerome Del Rosio waiting their turn in Bentley 8, sitting in the pit bunker. Good to have both of them in the championship. Duncan returning. Good to have him back after being on the sidelines from international GT racing a season ago. Jerome Del Rosio from Formula 1, and there's a car off at the first chicane. It's an Audi, by the look of it. And you get waved yellow flags. That's James Nash's car, I fear, that has had a spin. Hopefully he can rejoin from there. Number three Audi it is. So uh, James Nash in his first race in a GT uh, Audi for WRT has had a drama. Whether it was down to him or down to somebody else, we know not yet, but the car is off the road, but it still brought out the yellow flags, of course, in that part of the circuit. And that's when Leclerc sort of slightly lost out of that because he was shaping up to think about a move down the straight, but uh, he's now under pressure as well, so the Bentley, Antoine Leclerc, gets oh, nearly get mugged coming into the second chicane. Again, Ferrari thinking the wires are of it. Let's look again and see this little bit of action. The dive down the inside from the McLaren, and then it gets a bit messy and clumsy. Oh. Contact with Nash. Nash is the, the victim, and uh, that may well be a penalty to the McLaren for an avoidable incident. I think that may have been Phil Quaife that tagged him, so two Brits getting themselves together. And yes, it is. I'm afraid Phil Quaife went up the inside and bang, turns James Nash around. That answers the question. We were wondering whether it was down to James or somebody else, not James Nash's fault. Uh, it looks like a little bit of damage to the front of the McLaren as well. Yeah. Van Saint Boss thinks about it, and that's disappointing. That's the number three yard. He looks like it's going to be retired. So James Nash has opened the door, and the car is being pulled away to safety behind the barriers, just across the escape route in the entry to the first chicane at Turn One. Well, they got, has he got the car going? Or yes, he has. So the car was pulled to safety, but now. He, James Nash has got it fired up. Will he be able to continue or will that be a trip into the pit lane to check for any, any damage to the car? And has he stayed on the lead lap is the other question. I fear he would have gone a lap down. We'll check in a moment. So the car has got going. And I think Phil Quaife has stopped as well somewhere. The report is that that car has also stopped. Not surprising given the whack. No, there's the left front certainly there was some bodywork damage and whether that again had any bearing on oil cooling or water radiators. So the front of these cars are fragile. They're not something you want to do too much contact with. That's the leader, Alvaro Parent, in and amongst the traffic. As you can see now, he's put a lap on the Santelot car behind, which is the uh, Gosselin Lanier Sword car running in the Gentleman Trophy. But Alvaro Parent, by the standards of almost everybody else, has had a pretty easy first hour. No, it's not that easy. It looks easy because he's just been out on his own, concentrating on his lines, his driving, his lap times. Everybody else has had a fight. Yeah, but remember, Alvaro Parent has put in the hard yards with McLaren over the winter, developing this car, improving the car, making it an easier car to drive. I mean, it is still effectively a bit of a knife-edge car in terms of it's either with you or it's away from you. And, uh, I mean, we saw in qualifying yesterday, Alvaro, and he had two stunning laps in the 1 minute 47 seconds. Coming into Parabolica, it was right on the edge, trail breaking into the Parabolica. It only took millimetres for the back end of the car to swap round. That's where the speed in that McLaren is. 
but sometimes you want a car for a race that's a little bit more kind to its driver and not take out the mental energy that I know Dada Alvaro Perez having to deal with. And Kevin S likewise in the second ART car, and he's busy doing all of that and trying to find a way up through the traffic as Marco Seafried second turns his way into the Parabolica in third, Giacomo Petrobelli, Sandstrom is fourth, fifth is S, sixth is Merrick, seventh is Guy, eighth is Verdon, ninth is Leclerc, and into the top ten is Alex Buncom, tenth from 32nd. Yeah, interesting, from fifth all the way up to tenth is now beginning to concertina. And we see on the exit coming out of the Parabolica, the two Audis side by side. And in fact, our friends, the gold, purple, and red, Chinese. Is that something to do with the Chinese driver lined up on that, do you think? Or well, the Macanese, yes. Macanese. It's Andre Couto as well yeah. as the Chinese drivers. Bit of, bit, of, bit of bling in an Audi. Exactly. And it worked. Go well, this guy. And he made the pass. Made the pass against Cesar Ramos. So there, number one, that's the WRT Audi dropping down the field. A replay of what I fear is Ian Loggy's Audi going gravelly at the Lesmo. First part, it is, yes, uh, new to the championship. Ian, who's done a season or so of brick car racing, won the championship in fairness with Chris Jones and now into this. Right, round the outside of Stefano Guy goes Nico Verdonk. Mercedes takes on Ferrari, and that is a change of place for seventh. Nico Verdonk in the Mercedes ahead of Stefano Guy. Right, so let's have a look and see what Mercedes have got. They've got a car which is a well proven and endurance winning car, three hours, six hours, 24 hours. 48 hours if it existed, <laughs> but it's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. It's a much softer race car than maybe some of the cars around, maybe in particular the McLaren. And there we see is this James Nash getting out of the Audi. Is that all over for the Brit and the WRT ID number three? It'd be a disappointment for him and for WRT. Well, we have got two hours and 12 minutes to go. They could just about take that chance now of a driver change uh, and get away with it, I think, looking at the time. So repair the car if needs be, give it a full service and a driver change, yes, that's what they're going to do. Uh, I mean, I, I wonder if James out. Nash advise the team that this is going to happen, because it looks like Audi were not expecting the car to come in and to have a driver step out. Now, that's what it looks like, or maybe just the driver wasn't ready at the point that James Nash was frequently drivers. They knew when the car is due in, let's say eight minutes or ten minutes before, then they helmet glove up. And it could be that maybe the James Nash's teammate wasn't quite ready for the driver change, which came somewhat earlier than would have been planned. A legacy of that crash with Phil Quaife, as we saw. Ferrari versus McLaren coming over the timing line. 49, Jean-Marc Machelier is in the Ferrari as he goes through. There is that car being lapped as it is. It is being lapped by the 15 McLaren. Frederick Leviche, the 16th car of Phil Quaife, has stopped out on the track after its earlier accident. Number 19, Mercedes, who had helped the wheel around the outside, losing out to the Ferrari, isn't he? Because Gilles Vanillet comes through on the inside, then just hooks the wheel onto the dirt, out of the Parabolica. Everybody trying so, so hard in this opening stint, and in about 11 minutes' time, you can anticipate people heading for the pit lane. Well, Herbert Hoop did have a look around Parabolica, had to get out of the throttle, and loses the momentum, consequently loses it, and contact down between the BMW and the Ferrari down on the first chicane. Again, looks somewhat clumsy, but Hoop following the Ferrari now back on the tail. He'll be thinking about something maybe down into, we go further up through the field, but down into that second chicane, another opportunity. You've got to be committed to do it. You've got to be in the right position to do it. This is what the Blanc Pan series is all about. Everybody finding a battle and wriggling out of the chicane. Pierre Erret in the green Ferrari here desperately trying to gain a place as he comes now up towards the chicane. Gilles Vanillet defending strongly, though. Yeah, it was a little bit tepid in the way that he uh, he got almost nine-tenths of the way into position to be able to control the corner, but sort of wasn't certain if the Ferrari, the red car ahead, was going to give ground. Now, the gentleman trophy at the moment being headed by the 458-numbered Ferrari of Pierre Arret involved in great battles at the moment. Second in the class is the 51 Ferrari, which is being hustled on by Felipe Barreros, and third in the Gentleman Trophy, despite starting from the pit lane, is the number four Audi, Christian Kelders, switching from Porsche to Ferrari uh, to Audi, rather, for this year. Fourth in the class, number 41 Ferrari, Ronen Brandella is the entrant, and Georges Caban, former Lamborghini racer in this championship, is the man behind the wheel. Fifth in the class, Jean-Claude Lanier's uh, Audi, the redoubtable stuntman, and sixth is Jean-Marc Bachelier's Ferrari number 49 that we saw at the escape road early on. And there's contact here as Audi number 22, which is the next car in class anyway, of Ian Logie, gets muscled out of the way by Hubert Haupt. 
the class being completed by number 111, Steve Earl, but that's been black flagged anyway. Yeah, but Hubert Hyde was all over the back of the Audi, coming through the Ascari chicane, and in fact, came out of the chicane, pulled out behind the Audi, and then again, it just stalled out, so had to go deep on the brakes and go very committed, and there was contact between the Audi and the Mercedes, but the Mercedes was the more forceful of the two, has taken that position, and uh, I suspect nothing much will be done about it. It'll be probably classified as uh, a racing incident. Ooh. That, I'm afraid, is André Couto, the Macanese driver winner of the Macau Grand Prix, who is in the gravel at, I think, the first Lesmo, and that is a big, big problem for a car that was running in 10th place. Strange to be out there. I mean, that's not even the corner. Mm. He's gone a long way off as well, hasn't he? Damage on the right rear. Let's have a look and see what this is all about, first of all. This is a different Ooh, incident. Dan, this, is... this is Kevin S. Oh, come on, and come Jack on. Como Petrobelli getting themselves together, I think. That will be something that, uh, as the amateur and that group of drivers, will probably two Bentleys side by side. And wow. a change. Leclerc's gone around the outside of Andy Merrick, so eight goes ahead of seven for the first time, although Andy fights back. Up the inside he comes, but Antoine Leclerc is ahead as they head towards the line. And as they come up towards the timing line now, Petrobelli is heading for the pit lane. So, Bentley's a side-by-side. -side. What a sight. Unbelievable. Never thought I would see these two cars <laughs> racing on merit for a position. I suspect the reason is that Antoine Leclerc has had the easier ride all the way through. It's still Andy Merrick, of course, who's just ahead going into the chicane. But Andy Merrick has had to drive really hard to defend his position in the early phases of this race. Antoine Leclerc's had the slightly easier job. Maybe his tyres had a little bit fresher. But again, Andy Merrick has consolidated, pulled away from the Frenchman as they come through the Cava Grande. So we've got the race leader on lap 29. And there is Giacomo Petrobelli's car. Look at all the damage on the front left. They're taking advantage of a driver change as well as doing some repairs and refuel and tyre change to this. Well, Giacomo Petrobelli has driven it hard, but that's got two hours and a bit of racing to go, and it doesn't exactly look in concourse condition. No, the left front has been... You can see the damage to the bodywork. Bits of it are all over the place, and a uh, substantial amount of damage. Part of it has been peeled back, and uh, I wonder, will the team be allowed to let the car go back out with the bodywork in that condition, or are they going to have to put a bit of what they call gaffer tape on it to bandage it up. I don't think that certainly would be something that the team would want to let the car continue in that condition. Well, the mechanics are doing the work of change. There you can see one of the engineers trying to push it out of his way. It's actually the best thing they could probably do is remove it in total, but what that does to the rest of the bodywork, then he falls over as he pulls that body with that carbon. What about 10 grand's worth if you went down to your local <laughs> Ferrari dealer just down the road in Monza? You can plan your pit stops, you can practice them as much as you want, but when the car arrives after an incident like that and suddenly everything becomes far more urgent, it all becomes rather less orchestrated. Away goes number 11 Ferrari, then back into the race, so that was an early stop, effectively, after just 53 minutes of the race. So it's going to be slightly out of sequence. It's not the end of the world for them in Pro-Am, but it's going to be a bit out of sequence, and the car heads down the pit lane back into and the he race. comes in just at the same spot almost, <laughs> with the two Bentleys and the Nissan in the battle, so he's got fresh rubber, he's got more fuel on board, the driver change, uh, and he's had to really concede considerably to let the cars on there, and he lets two more cars go through. Is there a problem with the Ferrari? He hasn't conceded. He's got a problem with that car, and that car has slowed down to a crawl, and it is in, it's just lost all power. It's in gear, you can see it chugging along. All power has been lost. Well, actually, he's maybe running over the curb stones as well, which is contributing to that sort of vertical movement. So. What has happened to the Ferrari that one time was battling for the lead? He's got it fired up. He couldn't have hit a switch by mistake and uh, caused it. No, he's pulled over again at the marshalling post just on the exit of the first chicane. And that looks like it's the end of the day for Petrobelli, the number 11 Ferrari. So the car stranded into the pit lane as comes from Claude Lanier in 25. Driver change in the Gentleman Trophy. The Great stuntman and stunt coordinator Jean-Claude Lanier, but a hugely experienced driver, so that car uh, takes its first routine stop. I had a horrible feeling I'd seen the Christian Kelder's car being pushed away again as well, number four out. He said the pit lane is getting busier here. And the race leader, Alvaro Parent, on lap 31 now. A load of dust and coming out of the second or the, the second or the third chicane up at the Ascari. We didn't see what that was. The two Bentleys, the gap has opened up. Antoine Leclerc did run down his sister car. And Andy Merrick has been able to, once again, pull that gap to about a second and a bit. 
they come through the Parabolica and the pace of the Nissan also this group of cars that did get quite close together about four or five laps ago now has opened up again and now it's the Mercedes chasing down Alex Buncombe in the Nissan and closing up on the Bentley number eight the second of the two cars driven by Antoine Leclerc in for its driver change refuel and tyre. Interesting that that's the first of the two in because it was seven we were hearing about was suffering with its rear tyres but they brought Leclerc in. It does of course make sense to bring them in on different laps and you've got space in the pit lane but let's uh, try and catch up as we watch the pit stop with one or two things down in the pit lane. Jack's been busy trying to hunt down drivers. You're looking at Antoine Leclerc's car that has come in. Driver change will take place as well as the refuel and a new set of tyres on that car as well. And let's hear from uh, Giacomo Petrobelli, who had a very busy first stint. He's in the pit lane and he's with Jack. Giacomo, uh, really tough work with that Bentley. And then is the car out of the race now? I don't know, but I think so. Um, the Bentley was zigzagging on the braking, which made it, and it's a wide car as it is, so it made it really hard to go by. I just, after trying twice, I just sat back and just thought, you know, he's going to run out of tyres if he keeps doing that. And eventually he did. My car had a little bit of damage after the first touch with the Bentley but it was fine. And then I ran out of tires because the arrow wasn't working very well. So I made a mistake at the Parabolica. And uh, I think the second ART McLaren tried to go past me. I was just sitting on my side and he just bumped me on the side. And I don't know, I mean, I think the stands of the driving have got worse since last year, but um, they're out of the race. And I don't think it's our fault, but that's racing. Well, thank you for talking to us. I mean, and a very honest appraisal of what's taken place. And I mean, Giacomo Petrobelli was guilty, he said, of buying in the back of the Bentley on two occasions. And that one occasion coming into the second chicane where Kevin Estra and he got into contact was more like dodgems than it was motor racing. And that's ultimately, I suspect, what may have led to the demise of that Ferrari that was so strong in the early stages. And I mean, Giacomo Petrobelli, I mean, he was driven a hard race. I mean, you don't often see a driver in this kind of endurance racing as breathless no doubt he's a fit young man but certainly he's put a huge amount of effort into driving a car which began to become compromised with the contact that occurred especially losing front end downforce and then you know having an effect on the, the grip the tyre has due to understeer and other effects triple three in the pits Marco Seafried his work done gives way to his co-drivers and that car I'm afraid he's now going to drop down the order because they just do not have his pace but it can still be there or thereabouts I would have thought in Pro-Am come the end of the race so what we now have with pit stop cycling through is Alvaro Parent leading from Edward Sandstrom and then Nico Verdon will take third Kevin Estra is pitted as well for ART there's the leader metronomically heading towards the hour mark and doing just a tremendous job Alvaro Parent he's a class act oh absolutely I mean this is a driver of a quality which I mean above pretty much the majority, I mean, there are some outstanding drivers in other cars and other teams, but there's no doubt Alvaro Parent, a, a driver that maybe should have had a career in single-seaters but didn't quite work for him. Maybe timing in these things is a very big part of it as much as other factors. And I've been just hearing from the pit lane, in fact, it was damage to the radiator on the 11 Ferrari, the Petrobelli car, the one that we saw with the contact. Not surprising when bits of the carbon fibre bodywork were literally stuck out like an extra pair of ears on the front of the car so sad sad retirement for a car that gave us such entertainment in the first third of this race so the pit stops underway the refueling can take place and that's part one of the pit stop then the car it can have the tires changed so they're not ultra fast pit stops because you have a limited number of mechanics that can do the work and you have to do them as these two part pit stops fuel and driver is part one tires part two and there now also you can see the leader of Alain Parent in but so too 26 Edward Sandstrom interestingly Nico Verdonk has now inherited the lead in the Mercedes that has now done 32 it is on its 33rd lap so they're stretching the Mercedes just a little bit more on the fuel I think if you could stretch your fuel particularly in the opening stint which is the stint that everybody's going at at gangbusters um, may give you a small advantage when it comes to the last stint because you're going to do it with less fuel on board and fresh tyres, so it will probably pay dividends, not quite so much now, although you've got the lead of the race, but you're going to be coming in within the next three to five laps. It's all about the closing, maybe 15, 20 minutes, where this race will actually become the end result. Also in is Andy Merrick now, so 32 laps down by Bentley number seven. You drive a new tyres for that car, and we're into the middle hour of the race then, so now the order will 
shuffle again and with different drivers in the cars so they in turn will take on a different personality triple three then which now has the uh, russian driver vadim kogai behind the wheel having taken over from marco seafried and kogai has experience at national level but he's not going to be as quick as seafried i don't believe well it's interesting a number of the teams have opted to run their what you might call professional or, or number one driver in the opening stint and i suspect the reason for that is is all about track position if you can keep that track position when your second and third drivers go in it's easier than trying to fight for it if they've lost it in what would be the opening two stints nico verdonk has just pitted so he has come in at the end of his 33rd lap and that's the was the leading mercedes so we'll see whether or not that car starts to creep back into the picture as the pit stop cycle through Kogai, is it going up this game? There's Verdonk in the Mercedes that he shares with Max Buch, last year's champion. And uh, also in that car for this season is Harold Prima. Yeah, it's a strong driver lineup, a team that's won a lot of endurance races, particularly Maximilian Buch. Young German driver, very small in stature, but a real fighter behind the wheel of a Mercedes SLS. And again, you know, oh, trouble for McLaren. The Mutsu Machini on car, Olivier Grutz at the wheel of number 15. And he has just taken that over from Frederic Vervige. So on his outlap, virtually, there's yeah, a drama. I mean, again, looks like coming out of the uh, first again. So work still going on on the Mercedes. Driver change taking place, refueling. Still in process. And waiting now to make the wheel and tyre change. Car jacked up, the fuel hose has been disengaged. Door closed on the Mercedes, make sure that gull wing is closed. We've seen in the past on some occasions the gull wing door has actually gull winged itself open. So the HTP pit stop for the Mercedes continues. Remember, it was that car that dominated the Nürburgring Ring Thousand, it was the car that dominated at the Spa 24 hours. And this, at the moment, is the order, but it's a shuffled one because of cars being in the pit lane. But what we now have is number one Audi for the first time up front, helped by pit stops. But Cesar Ramos now has done 33 laps, which is very good going. It is, and you know, sometimes winning these races, it's not about being fast, it's about being quick at the end. And uh, Cesar Ramos has done the job in that number one Audi that he has been required to do. And, you know, betting against Audi in anything other than a 10-lap sprint is a, a brave move. So Mercedes back out on track. And, uh, fresh rubber refuel, driver change. So keep an eye and see where that car has filtered back in. It'll take another five or so laps for the whole thing to filter through and get a true picture. There is the car that was momentarily Cesar Ramos. And assistance. The Portuguese driver getting out. And it's going to be Mark Bassang who takes over. Lawrence Van Thor kept in reserve as the faster driver for the third yeah, stint. It's interesting that in this particular Audi they put Lawrence Van Thor, who is arguably the quickest driver in an Audi regardless, he's going to do the final stint, whereas in the case of the McLaren, where maybe Alvaro Perez is slightly ahead of everybody else in that car. So drivers of teams like WRT and the Mercedes team with uh, Maximilian Book, strong driver lineup, so they've got flexibility in when they put their top driver in. Alvaro Parent, incidentally, in 98, replaced by Grégoire de Moustier, so he will take over in that car for the second stint. Harold Primat has taken over in 84 Mercedes, and we'll get a better idea of the order at the end of the next lap, because we've only got a couple of cars now to cycle back in at the end of this first round of pit stops, and then we'll start to see the complexion of the race change once more, I'm sure. WRT mechanics, well drilled at pit stops, go to work. But this should now put 98 back up front. It had such a big lead anyway, uh, it really should continue to hold track position. And over the timing line, Gregoire de Moustier for ART Grand Prix goes back into the lead of the race. Yeah, now. and then Gregoire de Moustier, a driver who has improved over the last two seasons as the ID goes a bit of rally cross coming out over the Parabolica. That's one of the gentleman driver cars. So there is the, the number one ID going back out onto track. And it'll be an interesting to see how, once this whole first round of pit stops works its way through, who actually is in the lead. It's got to be the McLaren, because Gregor de Musia was given such a comfortable lead by Alvaro Perez, but behind, it's up for bids. Number one, then, Mark saying at the wheel. 
gone back onto the circuit. 79 has just pitted as well, which is the Akuri Cost BMW. That's gone a long way. 34 laps for the Pro Am BMW. But now we'll have a driver change because out of it we'll get uh, Andrew Smith in, we'll get Alistair McKay. That was how the car of Christian Kelders, having started in the pit lane, ended up in the gravel at the Parabolica. And from there he went to the pits. Maybe that was the reason why he went off. He had to go into the pits, there's a problem. But let's look and see what Mark Bessang is going to do on his out lap in the ID. He's got the Ferrari. 3-3-3, the car that was so strong and Siegfried in it early in this race, so these cars have found themselves together on the track effectively once again. And of course the pace of the Russian driver in the Ferrari as opposed to the pace of the Audi is uh, interesting to see. Bryce Smith incidentally took over Bantu number seven, but that's down in 15th place at the moment, so lost time in the pits has also dropped quite a long way back behind number eight so I wonder whether they spent a bit of time just looking at whether there was any damage there they may as well because although we're hopeful perhaps John on the podium as far as Bentley is concerned this is still a bit of a development exercise yeah just watching Greg Rodemusier enter the second chicane it looked a little bit airy fairy looked like he was uh, uncertain as to whether the car was gonna go with him or go against him and they uh, sort of got through it running wide and the exit of the Lesmo one under pressure from one of the Porsches which is What's going on there? Now that's 26, Stefan Ortelli at the wheel. That car is running in second place, but it's over 26 seconds adrift of the race leader. So Gregoire de Moustier is the one to look for in terms of his lap time, because I don't think de Moustier is going to be as quick as Ortelli. So 26 seconds, it is that gap. That, I suspect, will come down over this stint. So the Audi versus the McLaren and the gap reducing is what we need to monitor going into the final hour of the race. There's no doubt that Stefan Ortelli in any race car, Audi or whatever you care to give him, is 100% racer, written through him like a piece of Bogner Regis rock, and he will do everything he can to cut that 26 second deficit to the lead car driven by Greg Van de Moussier. And you know, as good a driver as de Moussier is, he is not of the caliber of Alvaro Parent. Whereas you have to look at Stefano Telli and say he is a full time professional gun for hire. He will drive anything, anywhere in the world and great driver. Now there's number four. Christian Kelder's brought it in. We've had a driver change, we've not been told to whom yet. The transformer's still in the wrong place on that car, but he's back and running once again, a long way back in the Gentleman Trophy, which is also still being headed by the 458 Ferrari. Now another drama, is it the same Audi? It's been in the walls a lot, been in the gravel a lot. If it's car four, yes, it, it is. is. Yeah. Yes, so it's not Kelder's at the wheel, but it's being shown as such because they've got the transponder in the wrong place still. Uh, and I suspect it may be EV. Now that is the leading car, Gregoire de Moustier then. And I told you the gap was 26 seconds, it's down to 25.6. So Ortelli, as predicted, is inching up onto the back of him. And also, we're now into a situation where drivers are having to catch and pass other cars, and how good you are on traffic affects where you will end up. Let's hear from Alvaro Perez with Jack. Alvaro, really impressive first stint from you, and uh, you've got a big lead now. Well, uh, we decided to use new tyres at the beginning with that purpose to, um, to use well the new tyres and uh, gain a little bit of a, of a gap. Uh, the car was very good to drive, it was managed to, to attack well. Um, and great, you know, great first stint, controlling well with no cars in front, uh, didn't stress too much the tyres. You know, what, everything, um, what a driver um, wants, so, so, you know, great first stint. And so do you think Gregoire's going to be able to hold that advantage in this second stint? We'll see. Um, some guys going fast out there, so uh, I hope Greg um, will keep the lead and uh, keep focused. He's doing well all weekend in uh, the free practices. He, a bit, you know, so he's driving well. Let's see now his stint during the, the one hour. Cheers, Alvaro. Good job. Don't go really down with praise from Alvaro. He knows that Gregoire de Moussier is a good racing driver, but he's not at, he's not at Alvaro's level. And even Stefan Otelli, who's behind in the Audi of what 26 seconds or so, 25 seconds the gap. The key to what Gregoire de Moussier's stint is going to be about is managing the lapping traffic and knowing where you can take the risk and knowing where you should not take the risk. And that probably is going to be the difference in the stint. It's not about out and out pace between the two drivers, but just managing the traffic. 
Carvalho Perez now just has to stand and watch. He's done his work for the day. Now let's catch up on the Audi number one because it's in fifth place. Mark was saying at the wheel of it, coming into the equation perhaps. John? Gerard D'Ambrosio in the Bentley, fastest second sector time. Yeah. The young man from Belgium, the part-time commentator when he's not driving a racing car, and eloquent he is too. He's showing I am a racing driver. <laughs> In the Bentley, of course. The better place of the two Bentleys, as I said earlier on, that eight having got itself ahead of seven, Guy Smith. The Gentleman Trophy, Frank Schmickler leading it still in the 458 458. There's triple three 458, if you're still following all of this, with Vadim Kogai at the wheel. But he's under pressure now because he's got the BMW of Eugenio Amos behind him. And this is the lead of Pro Am. So this is a very significant battle that we've got on our hands now Ferrari versus BM. Well, the BM has been taking lumps out of the advantage the Ferrari has had. You can see on the screen we were seeing. Big, big time differentials. So, again, down into the second chicane. The BMW, we know, has not been the quickest car in a straight line. The Ferrari traditionally has always had a good straight line speed, but it's about lap time, and the BMW right on the rear wing of the Ferrari coming through the second chicane, now into the first of the two Lesmos. Again, it's all about positioning the car, almost overruns the back of the Ferrari. It's not a good place of thinking about making a move going into Lesmo to get the job done on the exit and then get the run down to the third chicane at the Iscari. Side by side they come, Eugenio Amos, former Lamborghini racer, up alongside the alongside Vadim Kogai, who stays on the inside for the first part of the Valiente Iscari, but here comes the BMW. No, can't do it. Hasn't got the straight line speed. That's the aerodynamic differences between the Ferrari. It's not horsepower, it's just down to the aero. Again, all over the bank of the Ferrari coming through the Ascari chicane down now, and the run down to the parabolica corner again, seeing the Mercedes and the Audi having a similar issue. The BMW can do everything as possible in a corner, but when it gets onto the straight line, and two major straights here dominate the Monza racetrack. Mark Bersang on the back of Harold Primer, Mark Bersang in the Audi, ex-Mercedes racer, he knows all about these cars, he pulls up to the inside on the run down towards the first chicane, this is for fourth place. Neither of these cars really shone in the first stint, but they're in the mix now. The Audi's going to go through on the inside. Uh, Harold Primat fights back as best he can. Audi takes the place. Yeah, and that's, that's clean, fair motor racing. Primat recognised that there was a run coming from Bessang as we look down the inside. Now, the BMW trying to go the long way around, compromises itself by being on the outside of the corner. This is part of the give and take, the, the cut and thrust of motor racing and trying to force the competitor that you're running behind you try to control them, and in effect, and you can see now that Bessang is being challenged by the Mercedes as a consequence of maybe the slight compromise in the first chicane. Now out of the second chicane, Bessang can relax because he had control of the entry, the mid and the exit of that second chicane. So Mark Bessang in the Audi pulling away. This is how he did it. John, talk us through it. Yeah, Audi on the inside, takes the inside line, gets control, comes across to the left, intimidates a little bit the Mercedes Benz, but clean, fair, no contact but in doing so, slightly slower off that first chicane than the Mercedes. And another battle going down. No contact, oh. heavy contact, and that's a bit, well, I'm going to say, a bit stupid. Just, I think, the Mercedes was totally unsighted, didn't realise the BMW had slipped up the inside. Unusual to see anybody trying to make an overtaking manoeuvre into the inside of the entry into the, into, uh, the Lesbian corner. Contact puncture over the right, on yeah. the front on the BMW. That's Nick Katzberg, uh, the Mercedes in the hands of Lucas Wolf, and the puncture puts him off through Ooh, the gravel, and he comes back on with gravel, with dust, with everything, and the Mercedes nearly gets wiped out. That's made the circuit very slippery, and it's just a knock-on effect. Yeah, I mean, it's simply the contact between the two Lesmo corners, left front of the BMW, right side of the Mercedes Benz, sufficiently heavy to cut down the left front of the BMW. Nicky Katzberg probably realised it, but it all affected the BMW coming into the Ascari chicane, and it's all over for the meantime. He's trying to drag that car back, but again, into the Parabolica, can't slow the car down, can't steer the car. The worst thing for the BMW is it's just going to be choked, the engine bay totally choked with dust, dirt and whatever. Gravel on the racetrack. It's going to be like what a rally stage, oh, isn't it? Oh, you must be nuts. Into the pit lane comes Nick Katzberg then. There's gravel everywhere, all over the Variante Ascari, all over the road at the Parabolica, and that contact brings the BM in with it punctured tire. The Mercedes in the hands of Lucas Wolf, who is new to racing at this level, and uh, the Mercedes has survived. Nick Katzberg gained the place briefly, but you can see the slippery surface flag is out, understandably so, with all of that gravel and dust on the road, so it's going to be slippy for sure for a lap or two. Interestingly, Gregoire de Moussier is maintaining that 26-second gap 
to second base Stefan Ortelli. Ortelli has not been able to make any inroad. Now, forget about the, the, the dust and gravel that's on the, the car. You want to check under the bonnet to make sure everything around the area of the throttle linkages, although it's a fly-by-wire throttle on the BMW. Let's look again and see where Nicky Katzberg was a little bit ambitious. He was quicker through Lesmo 1. He thought, I'll dive down the inside, but the Mercedes did not expect that manoeuvre. He may have been ahead, as a, well, technically half the car was ahead. The Mercedes didn't know the BMW was there. So, Lucas Wolf is therefore down the order, but this was when the tyre went down at the Valiant Escari, and this was the first snowplough effect through the gravel, scoops it all up, bounces back on the road, and nearly gets the Merc again. I hate seeing that. Our producer knows it. He tells me in the <laughs> headphones, no, look at that, look what he's done. And there's all the gravel, or some of the gravel that's been brought back. Of course, two trips into the gravel bed, so this is going to cost the car a big chunk of time, isn't it? I mean, it's a lot of time. It's probably going to be the best part of two laps by the time. It's not just the gravel that's gone into the air intakes, it's into the brake intakes, it's into the engine air intakes. Now they're putting it over. Problem number five, the McLaren. Or was it 15? I beg your pardon, number 15. Uh, that's the second time we've seen that Olympic, isn't it? Remember, Groups had just taken yeah, it over and it's slowed down. Now just it's the exit of done it again. Chicane, yeah. yeah. So whatever it is, it ain't fixed. They're having to put air hoses into the, the air exits on the bonnet, and I, mean, I would imagine the whole engine bay is coated in gravel and gravel dust. And, of course, that what's got into the radiator as well, so they're trying to remove all the small bits of gravel that are, you know, I don't know. What a mess. What a mess, Nicky Katzberg. What have you done? He's given the TDS mechanics plenty of work to do. Uh, this is homecoming, because he won the Euro Cup McGann Trophy with TDS a few years ago. Now, uh, you've got here the Ferrari in the hands of Vadim Kogai, which has lost its Pro-Am class lead to this car, Eugenio Amos in the BMW. And still in the pit lane is the TDS BMW, and it is still having its uh, repair work completed, and of course it is still losing laps. This was the second off caused by the puncture. Yeah, I mean, this one was actually... He didn't need to do that, he just didn't slow down enough. Um, he thought he could get back a bit quicker. Now drags half the gravel trap onto the racetrack, pretty much on the racing line. Sh look at the look at the gravel. I mean, it is... Oh, I wish I was a race director. How are these guys up? I mean, I would bring back corporal punishment. I forget about <laughs> human rights. Flog the sods. <laughs> I wonder whether or not there's a good reason why you're not the race director, John, but you never know. If there's a vacancy... I'll, uh, I'll second your proposal. It's all too lenient compared to my days. Oh, well, you see, gravel traps, runoff areas, you never had those. No, gravel traps, that was a potentially hospitalisation if you hadn't been on the old circuit without <laughs> gravel traps. You just had to drive the circuit as it was. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, coming over the timing line is this battle that rages on between Ferrari and Audi. And the Audi in question is number three, which is Frank Stippler, who we know is very, very fast, and he's trying to get himself back after losing a lap to James Nash. They're on different laps, these two, but he's put himself up past Vadim Kogar, who's just yeah. had a bit of a workover. Yeah, but he, he forced that issue. So the pro am standings have been talking about the BMW in the lead. That green Ferrari is second, but not for long, because right on his tail now is number 80 Nissan with, Mark, with uh, Nick McMillan at the wheel of it, the American. He's never raced here before. Look at him go. He's right on the back of the Ferrari. Uh, in fourth place in the class is the number 50 Ferrari, which has now got Simon Knapp at the wheel of it. Fifth is the Porsche, number 70. And then at sixth in pro am is the Acuria Cost BMW. Seventh is Ferrari, eighth is Porsche, and you can see a car, yes, that's the McLaren, McLaren that yep. stopped in the background, so yellow flags means no overtaking there. You can see how Pro-Am Cup is at the moment with the variety of brands, but this is the battle that's on for second in the class with Vadim Kogai in the Ferrari versus Nick McMillan, the American, in his first car race in Europe. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a bit of intimidation, inexperience, and lots of experience, even though there's a gap between them in terms of, of what they are doing. But that's what you try to do to a car, particularly an inexperienced driver. We've had the change, look. So Nissan up to second now in Pro-Am. The change has happened, and a very, very good effort this is proving to be from Nick McMillan. There is the other Santilock Audi slowly making its way down to the parabolic, including Gosselin at the wheel, and that is at walking pace. Yeah, so it's, it's a limp home, yeah. limp home mode. And then we get a glimpse of one of the two Bentleys. We haven't seen much of them in this. Second phase there is the pass from the Nissan coming out of Lesmo 2. Again, it's all about getting the good drive out of the Lesmo. The second Lesmo don't run too wide in the exit. And uh, 
So we're coming up. We're not all that far away from midpoint of this race. We're one hour, 39 minutes and a half a minute to go. It's gone pretty fast, hasn't it? It's been a cracking race. Lots of action, lots of good motor racing, good clean racing, a little bit of sometimes, let's put it, amateur dramatics. But uh, overall, for an endurance race, I think it's been very, very interesting. You can see the way the overall classification is on the screens at the moment, and significant amongst that is that number seven, Bentley, has dropped way down into 13th place. We're on the case to try and investigate why. The white flag showed at the exit of the Parabolica to the leader, Gregoire de Moustier, to warn him of a very slow car. It's clearly Gosselin's Audi that is still staggering back to the pits. The we're Moustier not, goes through. You're not seeing an awful lot of it, but it's the number eight Bentley with Gregoire de Moustier, who's doing a really good job. His lap times outside of the... the the lead car, which is in the 1 minute 49s, Greg Rodemusier doing a great job, but Jerome D'Ambrosio lapping probably quicker than most people around him. Uh, certainly, with the odd exception, he is lapping pretty much quicker than anybody else around him. Doing a strong job. The other hero of this, for my money, is Nick McMillan, who's only ever raced in the Dubai 24. He doesn't know and Monza at all. And Nick McMillan never class. raced at Monza. It is compulsory to walk away from this place saying, isn't it wonderful? Now, let's find out a bit more about Bentley's travails. Jack, what can you tell us? Well, I'm here with uh, Andy Merrick. We'll see what he can tell us. Great start, but it hasn't gone quite as well since then. Yeah, I mean, the start was, was fantastic, and obviously we were up to second, and uh, unfortunately we couldn't live with the, with the McLaren, but uh, very happy to keep the Ferraris behind us. And then, yeah, mid-stint, but then we lost a lot of time towards the end when there was a couple of Ferraris in front and hit one another, uh, put fluid down, and I... I had to take take to the grass to avoid it, and obviously there was a, I don't know if it was if it was uh, you know water or, or oil that was on the track, but obviously it became very slippy, and and I went off uh, just trying to avoid it. So we sort of 10 seconds or so then. So unfortunate really, but the pace at the start was fantastic, and um, especially as we went into it in the, a little bit of the unknown from obviously overnight when the guys have worked to, to rebuild it. So uh, and we, there was a, a slow pitch just dropped us down the order a bit but I think we're still we're still doing some decent lap times now and hopefully we can uh, we can go forward cool thanks Andy and uh, David just to cross the I's and dot the T's the number 90 Ferrari lost an awful lot of time in the pits with a right rear wheel nut issue so that's why the Stefano guy the Lorba Corsa Ferrari has dropped out of the contention excellent thanks Jack yes that was another on my list of question marks as to why it had dropped down we're gonna have another car drop down incidentally which is the 85 Mercedes of Lucas Wolf, who is being given a drive-through penalty for causing the collision with Nick Katzberg's BMW. Yeah, I mean, he, he didn't know the BMW was there. He turned into Lesmo 1, and all of a sudden, wall up in the passenger door, that's the right-hand side door of the Mercedes. Didn't damage the Mercedes at all, but it did all the damage to Nicky Katzberg's. It was, to me, a, a, a very high-risk manoeuvre by Katzberg to do what he was doing, because there was four cars all squabbling over the same bit of racetrack. And consequently, you know, all the focus of concentration was not either out to the side or behind, but focusing forward. And uh, consequently, the Mercedes driver has received that penalty for, again, something which was avoidable. He should have been aware of, of what was happening around him. And interesting as well that we now know that the Bentley lost time by an off. That is Vadim Kogai having his own off. And through the gravel and sideways, which direction does it face when it comes out of the dust cloud? Anybody's guess. I uh, think you're the right one. Yes, I think so. That's the Santa Lock, Claudia Gosselin, uh, Audi in the pit bunker. Go back, what, two, three decades? Claudia Gosselin was a quick Formula 3000 racer. Now he's a gentleman driver in GT racing terms. The Mercedes is serving its drive through, and there, Frank Stippler still trying to work his way back up the order. He's in 32nd place, so this really is a rather thankless task because, of course, they lost time after James Nash's accident and the long pit stop. But Frank Stippler is so, so fast and consistent, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he is the perfect driver to put in as an endurance race. He's he metronomic in everything he does. Again, being challenged by the BMW into the second chicane as the Mercedes leaves the pit lane. So that's the drive through for that. On a four four of the avoidable contact with Katzberg's BMW, so he's making his way back out, and that's a lot of time lost. Very difficult to recoup any of it, frankly. He's going to put the car down in 14th place now after that stop. So there uh, is Lucas Wolf, who's racing at this level, really, and say for the first time. So there are quite a few new things to him, and we are almost at the halfway point with Gregoire de Mustier still leading from Stefan Ortelli, and then Kevin Coyos who's taken over from Kevin Est in third place. I mean, He's sort of pointing out that Gregoire de Moussier not at the same level that we're familiar with Alvaro Parent, but in fairness, Gregoire de Moussier has been running consistently 
in the low one, I'm oh, sorry, high one, 149s. This is the last lap of 150.9, no doubt due to traffic. But De Moussier has really consolidated the advantage that was built up by Avaro Parent. Still 25 seconds between first and second, and getting all messy again in the exit of uh, the second Lesmo. That was the replay of the Lucas Vols, Nick Katzberg coming together. That is the Pro Am leader, Eugenio Amos, who's not had a lot of luck in this championship over the last couple of seasons, but he's going well now in this BMW, the Royal Motorsport Run car that comes over the timing line. He is in sixth place overall as he comes through now. And behind for second in Pro-Am is the Nissan of Nick McMillan doing a really, really good job. There's Frank Stippler's Audi that, frustratingly for him, is 30 seconds. So although it's good to watch this, it's not really a genuine fight for position. And we've had another shuffle a bit lower down the order, yes, because we've already seen him, we not the of Vadim Kogai go wide. So Thomas Enger, who we've not seen yet in the Lamborghini, but he's there, I promise you, in ninth place, working his way into contention. Wonderful, I love Thomas Enger. He's so... just... I mean, if you wanted a character, one character, in any form of motor racing, it has to be Thomas Enger. And with Albert von Tonon Taxis as a co-driver, it's a very jolly camp, that, isn't it, well, the uh, know, motor engineering almost squad? Almost a clash, a clash of characters. I mean, who is the bigger personality? Who is the bigger... Who's the richer? Well, that's easy to answer. <laughs> is there anybody richer than Albert Montoya Taxis, the German Baron? Well, Thomas Enger is certainly quick, and Peter Cox will do the last stint in the Lamborghini Gallardo as this opening round of the Grand Prix Endurance Series continues here at Monza. Just looking further down the field, Frank Stipper in particular, running sadly all the way down in 32nd place. His lap times are again are matching, or probably slightly quicker than anybody else on the racetrack. So Stipper pushing as hard as he can in spite of being in 32nd place, knocking out low one minute, 50 second laps. There is Thomas Anger. We found him for you, John, in the Lamborghini. Turning his way through ahead of the battle now between Ferraris, where you've got Vadim Kogai ahead of Simon Kanat. Now, this is the third in Pro-Am, so it's another significant battle. Vadim Kogai drawing attention to himself, A, because he's in battles, and B, because it's a very colourful car. But Simon Kanat, the Dutchman, ex-BMW racer in Blancpain, now at Ferrari, looks for a way by as they get to the Parabolica. Not quite near enough. Oh, the Ferrari runs wide onto the ground. You can see he was getting it all wrong. Didn't slow the car down again. No confidence in turning the steering wheel off the throttle, on the brakes, runs wide, and, uh, well, there's an illustration of how to get it wrong, and the Bentley now comes up, has to go very acutely back to the left-hand side of the track to pass the Ferrari as it takes a bit of racetrack, the Bentley at greater speed was uh, anticipating taking. Now the Ferrari's now up to speed, tries to find a way around the Bentley, suddenly it's all battles to the fore coming into the first chicane. Guy Smith having to be a little bit defensive to keep the speed of the Ferrari, which picked up a lot of speed in the second half of the straight. That's three incidents we've seen from Vadim Kogai, though, in his stint, which is half an hour old. And I just wonder if he has another one, whether the race director may not show him a driving standard like just to calm him down, because if he keeps going off the road like that, sooner or later it's going to bite. But he's got a quick car. I mean, he's pulling up again to the tail of the Bentley. If I was Guy Smith, I'd be worried, <laughs> because I just wonder whether that Ferrari might fancy a bite at the rear of the Bentley. And as a consequence, let's look again and see just, you can see on the brakes, no throttle, car just pity tippy toes around the outside of the gravel, gets it back, no damage to the car, but um, a very messy entry and conclusion to the corner. And Marco Seafried watching his hard work being unravelled here, isn't he? Ka-ching, ka -ching. You might think that, I could possibly comment, yes. Marco Seafried, the gun for I mean, hire Siegfried in that did team. a great job he on this did, car, and, I mean, his teammates are not again to his level, but you know that's what endurance racing is about. Not every driver is a fully paid, top-line professional driver. And the mix and match of, of skills and qualities, and that's why we've got the gravel. Now, that's yeah. all the consequence of Katzberg. That is a mess on the outside. Anybody gets out there, the arms of the barrier are going to say, come to me. <laughs> and we're all embracing, for sure. Number one, Mark Bassang, running in fourth place at the moment in the Audi, and he's trying to work his way through traffic. He's being held up here because that Ferrari will not get out of the way, and it should get out of the way. It's 51, it is, the Ferrari in question. That's the Barreros Peter Mann Francisco Guedes car, which is in the Gentleman Trophy and should not be fighting. Maybe that car thought the Audi in question was the Gentleman Trophy equivalent. But anyway, through now has gone Mark Bassang, and he can set off in pursuit of Kevin Koyos, the Estonian, in the ART McLaren further up the road. But the gap is 15 seconds between them. So. Uh, Mark Bassang has got work to do here. Yeah, I mean, it, but as long as he gets clear road, he can see where he wants to go again. 
looking at the BMW, trying to look down the inside into the second Les, but it's not a place you want to do it because most drivers, their focus and concentration will be on the second Les, but not about somebody thinking about a move up the inside. So the race is currently on lap 49 for the leader, Gregoire de Moustier, there's Basang. There is the lap 51 Ferrari with Peter Mann, in fact, the Brit at the wheel of it, and off again almost. Well, the two BMWs coming together, yeah. and one going round the outside, having to run across the gravel that the Catsburg car dragged on a number of laps ago. So a little bit messy for the two BMWs up at the Ascari chicane. It's all happening at Catsburg in 12. 10 is now Eric Clemmer at the wheel of the sister car behind, so... Those two cars battle on, albeit in different places on the classification, different laps as well after their dramas. And water attacking as well on the far side of the circuit because they're getting up to the Alistair McCaig BMW is Franck Pereira in number 93 Porsche. Ahead of them both is the overall race leader, Greg Wilder Mustier, doing exactly what's required of him in this middle stint. Yeah, I mean, he's just got to be careful with the lap yeah. traffic. He's got to make sure that his speed is going to be effective on parts of the racetrack where he's not going to catch a slower car or a car driven by a less experienced driver unaware so it is really tippy two stuff right now but the pace that mclaren's got has got straight line speed it's got good corner speed as well so for greg radamusier just pick him off in the parts of the track where you're strong and Stefan Ortelli in second place. What's interesting about this is that it's Santalot we're talking about as the leading Audi team, not WRT for a change. Stefan placed at Santalot by the Audi management for the Endurance Series, and Santalot has its good and its bad days, but when it's a good day, it's a really good day for the French team. And I, I suspect there's a lot of WRT in the Santalot preparation. They know exactly what they need to do to make these cars both perform and be reliable. Uh, the gap currently, well, I think it was down to 23 seconds between Ortelli and uh, Gregoire de Moussier principally, and there's the, our friends in the uh, Macanese are the back on the track, but uh, it's just the ebb and flow of traffic. Again, look at the understeer and the Ferrari all over the shop, coming into the first chicane, and that's only going to get worse from here. It's not going to improve. Driving a car like that, a lot of understeer entry over the bumps and the crash and the bang. So that's his fourth off. It's not, a, it's not, it's not the way to treat a Ferrari. Mm. And now he's being caught by Ahmad al Hafi behind there in the Oman racing team Aston Martin. And the Omani driver in a British car run by a British team, Motor Base, based near Brands Hatch. And that gap has been coming down and down, helped of course by Vadim Kogai throwing the car at the scenery on more than one yeah, occasion. Yeah, I mean, you can see up, up seven seconds on one lap that was due to the off mm. that we've just witnessed. And now the Aston, I mean, you could even get caught unawares by an error from the Russian driver in the Ferrari. So just, again, plan where you think your strengths lie and uh, you use them accordingly. Behind the Aston is the uh, Porsche of Nico Maroc, oh, and that McLaren. is a McLaren, I think it's a Boots and Ginion car again. It's 15, Frederick Verviche, I understand, who is limping, or sorry, uh, Olivier Grutz at the wheel of the Verviche car, limping back to the pits. It is, yes, there's Olivier Grutz making his way past the camera. Yeah, and he's got to stay way, way, way offline at parts of the racetrack. He'll have oh. to cross the racetrack. So we see the Ferrari. He's got that straight line speed. The Aston is just being left. Lights flashing. <laughs> knows that he's capable of lapping a lot quicker. But for some reason, this particular Ferrari has had more straight line speed, I think, than any of the other 458s we've watched in the race. And there oh. is that McLaren limping back. That's well, it's coming awkward. back. He's back. I mean, that's, that's a concern because that car is so slow. That drivers are on sighted coming out of Lesmo one, and uh, as the car gets midway between the two Lesmo corners, the problem decreases. But it will be a problem again in the exit mm. of Lesmo two as it creeps mm. around. I mean, you could walk as quickly. But I go around far more reservoir on my power walk quicker than that but coming back to the pits. And I sweat doing it too, believe me. <laughs> In fairness, I think Olivier Grutz might be sweating at the moment. Can't be much fun in there. Hoping that everybody avoids you, because here are very quick cars that are bearing down on him. So there is Kogai, ahead of Alhafi, the white flag to warn them of a very slow-moving vehicle. Blimey. That's the problem. You know, the white flag's being waved, but you can't see where the car is, so you think, well, I'll wait until I see the car. You're then committed, and that's an incident just waiting to happen. Well, the race director will be aware of the problem and hopefully we'll be able to communicate it to the teams. Kogai's on the verge of another drama here, isn't he? And Al Hafi is right up behind him, but Ahmad almost gets, yes, he does get himself on the marbles and has to hang on to a slide in the Aston Martin. 
Another good battle developing here. This, remember, is between cars in different classes. Pro-Am versus Pro, 12th, 13th and 14th. Nico Marotte, Porsche behind. This is where we stand in the overall order. Yeah, I mean, just the Aston can do nothing in a straight line with the Ferrari and again going through Parabolica. Again, Ferrari all over the exit of the corner. Aston right up behind it, gets to the tail of the car, but just watch how the Ferrari stretches its legs and the Aston's just left. Well, Harfi tries his best on the inside. He's going to have to be very heroic on the brakes and he might just level with the Ferrari. There's still a bit more straight to go, though. Maroc wants to follow him through as well if he can. And Ahmad Harfi does go through under braking. Good he, job. Good job indeed. So the Ferrari straight line speed this time didn't save it. And a good job from the Oman Racing Aston Martin. Uh, that was a lot of hard work, a lot of thought went into it. It was all assisted by the Ferrari being poor in the Parabolica, but now coming back through the Curva Grande and watch for the dive down the inside from the Russian-driven Ferrari because I suspect this is a mission which has got problems written all over it. No. Nico no, Barock in the Porsche wants to buy into it, doesn't he? Yeah, well, he's, he's watching this action and uh, Porsche may well have a good straight line speed. Again, trying to follow the Aston through down into the first chicane. Again, pulls back to the right to give himself a better exit from the chicane. Ferrari, you can see, closes up to the back of the Aston mid -point. Such a strange driving style we're seeing from the Russian driven Ferrari. So Ahmad Al Harfi moves himself through. The Oman driver, who was really specialised in Porsches before, I mean, driven Porsches in the British GT and Blancpain last year. He was the Pro Am 1 winner in Carrera Cup GB the season before that. Still limping back is Olivier Grutz. When he gets into the Ascari chicane, please, please let him get through without having any effect on any of the remaining cars on track because that's not an easy place to have to drive your way around. Although he will be online on the entry, he'll be offline in the middle, but he'll be back online for the exit. And on the exit of the chicane, and certainly middle part of the chicane, is a lot of gravel. And the battle continues between Vadim Kogai and now Nicolas Maroc in the Porsche right up behind him. Yeah, Porsche should have good straight line speed, got a powerful 3.8 litre flat six engine. Can he manage to get out? He's pulled out, but again, the same thing. The Ferrari is pretty quick in a straight line, and the Porsche can't do enough just to get alongside. If he can get alongside, he could sort of put pressure on the Ferrari, and uh, but still, the Ferrari's got good acceleration. So Kogai, for the moment, hangs on to his 13th place. Maroc 14th and then 15th is Lucas Wolf in the Luke Oil Mercedes after the drive through that we saw a few minutes ago. An hour and 22 minutes, give or take, still to run. The lead gap's coming down it instantly. It is, just going to say 18 seconds now. And again, I imagine principally due to the ebb and flow of traffic around the racetrack, but Otelli has managed to get it to below 20 seconds down to, what, 18.890. So he's beginning to see a little bit of light further down the road. Let's catch up with Nissan news because it's been a busy race for both cars. And Jack Nichols in the pits has news for us. Thanks, David. Uh, I've got Mark Shosinski here. Mark, your car's been in the garage for, for a little bit. Just headed back. Problem? Yeah, we have some problem with Regatta. So, some small contacts, and uh, I think we lose our front uh, bumper and some. Now, some parts coming off, so we lose Regatta too. It, it was a problem, one hour to change it, so we lose race. Okay, thanks Mark, thanks for talking to us. And I'm going to uh, try and find Alex Bunkham in a minute, talk to him about his great drive, but for the moment it's back to you, David. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, it was a heck of a drive, wasn't it, by Alex Bunkham? And if you've lost an hour, as Mark Szczytski refers to for his car, they're effectively going to be not classified. They, I suspect, will not do enough distance well, in the yes, race. And so that's going to be, uh, although now continuing to the end, one hopes, only ready for a test session. Now, tell us about this flapping bodywork. Well, the left side of the body, you can see the bonnet is flapping. So the, the, the clip, the safety clip, for some reason, has become detached. And once air gets under that, it's never going to improve. There is. McLaren in limp mode, so it's managed to get through the Ascari chicane safely. That Ferrari not only has it got its flapping bodywork, it's a significant one because it leads, as you can see, the gentleman trophy. Uh, this is uh, Frank Schmickler at the wheel of it, having taken over from Pierre Eret. And if the car has to make an unscheduled stop to sort out the bodywork, it is going to lose its lead. It's only 25 seconds ahead. Yeah, I mean, they may well try to stretch this out, but of course, once that is seen by race director, they may feel that. It's a problem that's not going to improve, and uh, the only way they can find a solution is 
to give that car uh, a flag to get it back into the pit. It's a question as to whether it is deteriorating or it's in control. That's the car that's second currently in the Gentleman Trophy, with now Romain Brandella at the wheel of the Ferrari. And it's just gone past the limping McLaren that's on the outside of the Parabolica and has now got to cut right across the track to get into the pit lane. That's going to be pretty risky. Not a good place to do it. Wherever you're going to do it on the Parabolica, the later you do it, the quicker the cars are going to be exiting. So ideally, he wants to just do it before he gets to the Parabolica. And if he has to compromise somebody on the apex, that's probably the best solution. So there's the second gentleman trophy Ferrari. Remember Andela, former Formula Renault race winner. He's been seen in Blancpain before in Lamborghinis with Georges Caban, who indeed is one of his co-drivers in this car. And so that's second in the gentleman trophy. And then third is number 49 Ferrari with now uh, Yannick Maragol at the wheel of the car, which went up the escape road early on, but they've recovered strongly. Good to have the likes of Brandella and Georges Caban back into the championship. Georges Caban was the gentleman trophy winner in its very first season. That's the third placed Ferrari, Yannick Maragol who's been in the past very successful in the Ferrari Challenge, winning the Copper Shell for the uh, amateur races. He's at the wheel of it now. The car's run by AF Corsa, so on that alone, it's going to be a well-run Ferrari. Yeah, and it's going to be a, a well-prepared car, reliable, and it's just in the hands of the drivers to ensure that they avoid any off-track excursions or any contact with fellow competitors. There's the second-place car, Stefano Telli. It was down to 18.9 seconds a couple of laps ago. We wait to see is the car it's about to come across the start finish line. We've just we're back to the race leader. One 15, 15 seconds, so the gap is now closing more significantly. Let's look and see what's going on up at the Scari. That's the leader, that's uh, Demustier, and that's why he's lost some of the time. Yeah, and he doesn't need to make mistakes like that. I mean, a, a lap car, he shouldn't have put mm. himself into that position. That's sort of a, an error that I wouldn't have expected. Now he's got to still get past the Porsche. And he's got now the realisation that he's made a mistake and that Ortelli will be aware of that from his pit. So he'll be getting a message, push, push, push. We're putting pressure on Debussier. Maybe we can make him make another error. So we have there Stefan Ortelli running in second place. The gap 15 seconds now as he makes his way out of the chicane, still hunting down the lead car. Third is 99 Kevin Koyos in the second of the ART McLarens. There it is. Kevin Koyos very, very quick in single-seaters. Formula Renault 2-litre, Formula Renault 3.5, now switching to GT cars. And I think somebody that's going to become a real force to be reckoned with as the season goes on. Not a bad debut, is it, running in third place? No, it's not. Again, looking at the McLaren, when it's being pushed as it is being pushed right now, it's not the most comfortable car. It's the kind of car a single-seater race driver would probably find fairly familiar. But for gentlemen drivers or drivers that are not accustomed to having an edgy car, it's, it's, it's a racer's car, not a gentleman's car. So we've got the race leader working lap 55 now. Uh, we had talked about Alex Buncombe's amazing first stint, working his way through the field, so it was a very, very impressive job. We talked about it, but let's hear from the man himself, Alex Buncombe's with Jack. Alex, brilliant start, brilliant first lap, and what well, brilliant opening stint, really. Yeah, absolutely. The start was amazing, and uh, yeah, got got the the initial really good. Managed to do uh, three or four, I think, and then uh, into turn one, everyone was on the brakes really early, and I just sort of pick pick my way through, and uh, yeah, found myself uh, in front of Mark at the first corner, and uh, passed a few more on the first lap, and just got my head down from there. Really, yeah, I was quite surprised enough to come round at the end of lap one in P15. So. Uh, yeah, the car was handling uh, extremely well, and uh, we made some slight adjustments on the car overnight, and uh, that seemed to improve us. And Nick's doing a great job now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's got a, a lot of weight on his shoulders. You know, he's uh, out there in P9 or 10, I think, now overall. So, um, yeah, the boys have got a lot to do, but um, you know, it's their first, sort of, you know, their first major race, and uh, we'll see how they get on. Cheers. Good luck. Back to you, David. Thanks, Jack. Well, off has gone number four Audi. So that's the gentleman trophy car yet again having a moment. And it is Jean-Luc Blanchemin at the wheel of it, last year's gentleman trophy champion. And triple three, Vadim Kogai is already there. So under the yellow flag, he has gone off. And that's going to go down like a cup of cold sick with the race director. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, that was done under a yellow flag. We understand. You can see the yellow flag on the timing. And let's look. I mean, where did he... What is he doing? I mean, what, that was fifth on the, off, sixth well, that, off? That was unassisted by what we have seen in the camera. And uh, all of a sudden, you've, you've got a yellow flag. Let's see what's going to happen. Then another car. Is there oil? Maybe there may be something on the racetrack. 
must be something on the racetrack because two cars going off in a similar corner, you've got to believe there's a reason for it. One car going off, you can put down to a driver error. Two cars, something beyond that. That's Pierre Erhet as well, looking a bit nonplussed about his flapping bodywork. So uh, we've got 333 in the gravel, we've got number four in the gravel, and there's a slow car there as well. And again, is it still a yellow flag situation? Was he overtaking under a yellow? Yes, there is a yellow flag, yeah. so that's going to be a problem as well. Let's see which car that was. That might have been the Lamborghini, Thomas Engel. We'll check in a moment. So, where's Triple Three gone? That's been snatched out of the way, I think. And it's all happening. Now, what does this do to the Aston Martin? That's 44 Ahmad Al Hafi running in 12th place overall. A good, good job for his first race in this car. Yeah, and it means he hasn't got the pressure of the, the green demon mm. Ferrari all over him and uh, not knowing whether the predictability um, was going to be even that. Blanchard has gone a long way off, hasn't he, in the Audi? All through the I mean, it's, it's strange. The Ferrari going off, we thought, driver error, followed then by the Audi. Something must be on the track um, because two cars would not just go off at that point of the corner. That's very, very early. It's really on the turn in rather than on the apex itself, or more likely to go off on the exit. Uh, Stefan Ortelli is still hunting down the leader. There is Thomas Enger with his punctured tyre. That's why that car was going slowly and heading for the pit lane. So Thomas Enger will go for the pits. So is Thomas Enger going to continue this stint? It's a bit early to think about doing your final stint with an hour and 13 minutes to go. So what would you do? Keep Thomas in or...? Yeah, because Peter Cox could... I mean, he would have to do 73 minutes for his so last stint, so he can't do it. So one tyre or, or four tyres? Certainly, he might change two because, well, I'm interested to see what happens with the team. So the Jack, with the air, well, they're putting fuel in as well. Yeah. So they're going to keep Thomas Enger in the car, refueling him, and uh, we have to wait until the refueling is complete before they put. Is it just one tire or all four? There's a little bit of confusion. So one tire certainly looks like the left front is going to be clearly changed. That's the tire that's gone down. Is the right front? I don't think anything is going to be done at the rear of the car. Or it's just simply one tyre, one tyre, yeah. indeed. Fuel and so one tyre. fuel tire. and one tyre, so Thomas Enger back out. Now, Thomas Enger's puncture slows him. There's the BMW that comes round the outside. He can't really slow enough. Well, there is a yellow flag, actually. If you look from the camera looking back from Lesmo too, I think I did see a yellow flag, but it was quite a long way off the racetrack. I saw a yellow flag. How many racing drivers have said that? I saw a yellow flag, he overtook me. <laughs> Racing driver's eyes are different from no, no, mere we, mortals. No, eyes, no, I think that, that there was clearly a, a view looking from the Lesmo to Lesmo 1, and there was a marshal holding something yellow. If it wasn't a flag, then it must have been something, maybe a T-shirt. Well, there could be a still yellow before the wave. God knows you get to the zone. There's Albert, What's Albert got under his nose? It's what not, is that? It's not very happy, is it? Whatever it is. It looks like he's brought his eyebrows down below his nose. He's still got his eyebrows, though. Somebody else's. When you're that rich, you can afford more than one set, you see. Thomas Anger back on track then, having had his lengthy stop for a new tyre. But Ortelli has eaten further into yeah. the lead of Gregor de Moussier. Now we've got an hour and 11 minutes remaining, and it's 12.3 seconds. In 50 minutes, he's effectively half the gap, hasn't he? In this stint, he's that's halved it. That's what Stefan much. Ortelli can do. Yeah, that's what he's paid to do, that's absolutely. He, he's a super little scrapper. Hans Reiter saying to everybody, shh, don't speak too soon here. Uh, they've got Peter Cox to get back into that car. This is the Pro-Am battle that's really coming alive now because Eugenio Amos has been caught by Simon Knapp in the Ferrari. Simon Knapp, the Dutchman, again, he's one of these people that flies under the radar. He's about to fly underneath the BMW if he can on the inside. Can't find a way through there. Dust cloud ahead. Somebody's had a drama and got back on at the first Lesmo bend. But Eugenio Amos here is really under attack, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, again, the Ferrari is going to just get a, a, a better run out of the corner. It's got more straight line speed, we believe, than the BMW has got. And he'll be thinking about a move up into Ascari. He's already thinking whether they're going to go left. He's made it, he's committed to going to the left, to the inside. He's taken control of the corner and he's taken the. He's made, well, he's made the overtake anyway, the most important thing. So, change for the leader Pro Am. Ferrari goes ahead of BMW. Simon Knapp goes ahead of Eugenio Amos. And a Bentley update, sixth, Jerome D'Ambrosio, tenth now, Guy Smith. Uh, D'Ambrosio's done a good job. Let's catch up before the pro -Am battle continues at this, which is over at Lesmo it's 1, and Vadim Kogai again in Trouble 3. Matey boy, 
again, I mean, it just, I mean it's just oh. a joke. Look at the way he comes back on. I mean, he nearly calls it another drama. Yeah, that, well, the race director's got to do something about I mean, it. I, I, there's, an incident, there's an incident of a driver just, I mean, even almost drives off the racetrack yes. under braking into the first chicane. I mean, somebody needs to take him, sit him down, give him a chill pill, and explain to him that if you want to go rally cross, don't come to a Monza three hour long by endurance series event. The car, despite all the abuse, is still going. It's got another hour and nine minutes to do. Not all with Kogar behind the wheel, thankfully. Sort of guy, I wouldn't want to meet him on a dark night, would you? If he's no. as wild as this in a racing car, You'd go walk on the other side of the street, wouldn't you? Let me know where his hire car is on the way out of the circuit. I'll let him go. It's uh, the black, old black Hummer, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, with the dents in the front, you mean, yeah. The bull bars. So that car is tumbling down the order now. It was, remember, running second early on. It's now 26. So McMillan dives down the... Uh, on again, gets out on the outside, gets the line, but the idea on the inside, so that should be an overtake on the exit for McMillan in the descent as we look up to the exit of the... The Scarry Chicane, and there is one of the two Bentleys. Can't work out whether that's Ambrosium or is that Guy Smith. Remember, I've been saying that maybe the race director should do something about Vadim Kogai. The team manager of that car is being summoned to the race director immediately. I think officialdom have now decided I mean, enough's I, enough. I think something more emergent, a more. I mean, just immediately is not good enough for me. <laughs> I want something more urgent than that. Something more than immediately. <laughs> so, we'll see what happens to poor old Vadim Kogai. I'm intrigued to see whether Jack's going to go talk to him yeah. and ask him about all of this. The guy Smith picked up time on the Nissan. Again, somebody runs wide down in the parabolic. Don't tell me it's, it's the a Ferrari. green Ferrari. It is! Are you it kidding? is! I can't believe it. <laughs> and now he's got bodywork damage <laughs> so much so he's got a puncture. And that tyre is going to literally fall apart oh, because gosh. the bodywork is just sliding into the side of the Pirelli. And hopefully, hopefully, there's a message. Even divine interception on this one might help. <laughs> Now, when the tub goes bang, it's going to be an enormous moment. I mean, he's had enough with four good tyres. This is not a good tyre anymore, and he turns in all right, but I'm not optimistic about I, this I, lap. I, I bet you when he gets out of the car, he'll look like an angel. Me? Yeah. No, I didn't yeah. do anything. I had a small problem with no, the no. whatever. Now the message has gotten through. Maybe the radio, the two-way radio, actually does work in the Ferrari after all. It's come Guy up on Smith the... just ahead of them. This and yeah. pass position for ninth it's come up on the screen that triple three has got a puncture well, yeah great so it's going to limp back to the pit lane and somebody else can take over that car uh, it would be Renat Solikov you know I would not hour. want to be the cool driver taking it over having watched what that car has been through <laughs> that's one of the problems when you race an endurance racing you need teammates that are your you can trust come on this nice one nice pass by Stefan Otelli using the traffic to his advantage when you're having to share a car, particularly in long events, six hours, 1,000 kilometers, 12, 24 hours, that's where trust in your teammate is imperative. In a short race like this, it's much more of a sprint. Nevertheless, if the last driver in that Ferrari has seen what it's been through, well, I would, I would be cautious on my first two or three laps to make sure it's everything, steering wheel straight, have I got a brake pedal? What's the car doing? The dampers must be knackered of nothing else. Yes, when you ask, has it got a brake pedal? There's not been much evidence in the last hour of that, has there? Well, it's an interesting view, isn't it? <laughs> Number 80, the Nissan then. Nick McMillan, a really good job in ninth place overall. Into the pits comes the Romain Brandella Ferrari, methinks, 41. Yes, that was second in Gentleman Trophy. That doesn't look all that well organised as a pit stop. Pro-Am, just quickly to talk about it. Simon Knapp, it is, who heads the class. That's the class second, 43 BMW, Eugenio Amos. And Nick McMillan in the Nissan, number 80, is in third. Fourth is Porsche, Nick Omarok. Fifth, Porsche, Franck Pereira. Sixth, Ferrari, uh, which is now number 90. The man behind the wheel of it is Andrea Rizzoli. Nick McMillan only four and a half seconds behind in third place to take the lead of the pro -Am category, so uh, interesting to see. Absolutely, look at this little battle developing as uh, Stefan Ortelli forces his way through the traffic. Gets past Michel Albert on the inside. Uh, how's the gap doing to the race leader? We've had Greg Wadamuskier over the timing line. Stefan Ortelli goes through 13 and a half seconds. Got up a bit in it's traffic. Got a, it's, it's, it's because of uh, the ebb and flow. No, no, no doubt uh, Greg Wadamuskier had the same issue of passing groups of cars who are involved in their individual battles. So it would be artificial to say that the gap... Oh, and mistake, what's Stefano Tilly done in the first chicane? 
Schoolboy error. Stefan. Like you lost all concentration. Don't often see it, do you? Stefan or Tony makes a mistake. Well, I mean, that traffic. I mean, such a, I mean, it was clear of all traffic. Yeah. He just seemingly overran the entry into the first chicane and had to take avoiding action. So, he's got to do that hard work again and get through the traffic. He's lost time to the race leader model has gone on. Here he comes, down in on the brakes. Everything looks normal, looks normal. Ah, a little lock up on the right front and just runs the car too deep. So, Atelier has to take to the inside of the corner, bounces over those curbs and the two cars, the Ferrari and the Aston here, just overtaken. He's got to do the work all again. And Greg Radamoussier and the McLaren team will be on the radio saying, wow, he's, done, he's given us a help here, he's given us a hand. So that gap, which had accelerated up to 13 seconds, now probably going to be nearer to 15, 16 or 17 seconds. Again, Otelli comes up, gets alongside the Ferrari into the Escaria chicane. So he's got one of those paces back he lost half a lap ago. I reckon the leader should be on for two more laps before the next pit stop. They might, in this, be able to eke out one extra on top of that. But two slash three laps before the leader should be due in for the next stop. Stefan Ortelli will give way to Greg Gilver, who you saw with his crash helmet on a moment ago with Edward Sandstrom down in the pit lane. And we are almost at the end of the second hour of the race. And there, ladies and gentlemen, is Vadim Kogai, a man who has drawn attention to himself in every way. I hope that... No, I'm just, I hope that we can get hold of Jack. He's there, I can see him in the background, and, and he's promised me he's going to go hope, and talk to I him. Jack, uh, I hope Jack's Russian yes. is sufficient to ask the tough question. And your membership card, John, of Vadim's fan club will be arriving in the first class oh, post he's on Tuesday. Great. He's wonderful for television. <laughs> Absolutely. So everybody loves what he's doing. <laughs> but so many us idiots who think, you know, what kind of guy drives a racing car like that? But the public at home watching in television, and there is a problem on the right, left front that's of the number. Thomas Anger again. Yeah, and that's the second time he's had a puncture on the left front. Same corner, absolutely right, yes. So this at least means they can combine this with a driver chain stop to put Peter Cox in the car, but it loses them even more time. Yeah, but it's why is he suddenly suffering left yeah. front punctures? Is some of the bodywork getting close? Has there been damage, contact or something? That is not normal, and uh, Thomas Anger having suffered now the second of those two in his stint roughly of an hour, duration. Thomas is going to get out, Peter Cox is going to get in, there'll be a full four-wheel tyre change as well as refuelling. Can't change the wheels and tyres of course until the refuelling has been completed. If I say about that tyre that there's more and more gravel being brought onto the road, you will say, but it's not affecting anybody else in the same way, which is absolutely true. So Guy Smith having to go slightly defensive with the BMW, and Guy Smith is in eighth place and the Bentley the leading Bentley of the two the other Bentley players no, so say, it's going to D'Ambrosio. Jerome D'Ambrosio has done a really good yeah. job in his first drive. From, I'm sure he's driven closed cars in the past, but to come out of a, you know, a Formula One test program that he'd been involved in or whatever, to jump into a car so totally different, and particularly going from high downforce cars to relatively low downforce cars, not an easy transition. And Ambrosio, I think, has done a very yeah. good job for Bentley this weekend. Go along with that. There's something fishy, by the way, happening for AF Corsa at the moment, because the team manager of both cars, 50 and 51, being summoned to see the race director. I wonder whether this is a pit infringement that's happened for both cars. So we'll keep an eye to that story as well. So the Nissan also in. Nick McMillan mm. having a good stint in that car. And uh, he was only 4.5 seconds behind the lead when he came in, so uh, whether they can get him out again and uh, see a challenge to the last just one hour and one minute of this race remaining. Just in case you're waiting for the next replay of Triple Three going off, it's still in the pit lane. Uh, so you've seen all the spins and the dramas it's had. I get the feeling the car just doesn't want to go out anymore. It's had enough abuse, but for the moment, the car is still in the pit lane. And I wonder whether that's something to do with official. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I was well. a, a director of Ferrari, the, the, the car manufacturing company. I would take that car from the team and I would take it on a world tour with a video of what we've been watching and say, this is the kind of car Ferrari makes. We can give it this level of punishment, yes. and it still comes back. Yeah, we thought the Bentley was strong after the first hour. We hadn't seen anything like Badim Kogai's uh, stint in the Ferrari. Right, in comes eight. That's your own D'Ambrosio to give way to Duncan Tappy, is it not, in the rotation this time? So number eight from sixth place. Good effort, that. D'Ambrosio out. Duncan Tappy will get in. We have also got Simon Knapp and Eugenio Amos into the pits, the cars first and second in Pro-Am. There is the BMW, Eugenio Amos, to give way now in the Royal Motorsport BMW to Stefano Comandini. And 
also coming back into the race. Number 44, Aston Martin. I think Michael Kane it is now, isn't it, to have taken over that car. So we've got to the uh, end of the second hour, the start of the final hour of the race, some pit stops cycling through. And Gregoire de Mustier has done now 64 laps, or the car has done 64 laps, and he stays out. And so they are just going a bit further on this second stint. But you know what, more importantly, his last lap, 1 minute 49.4. No, his last was a 52 five. I beg your pardon, you're right, I'm looking at those passes now, but I was getting too excited there. 52.5, I mean, that's, uh, again, traffic related. Yeah. So and Ortelli is 12 and a half seconds behind. Because his last was a 50.6, so he took very nearly two seconds out of it. Again, it's just traffic it's related. Yeah. the ebb and flow of what traffic is at any given point in the circuit. So Whereas, uh, Mark Bassang has just done a personal best lap in what is now third place. Yeah, because yeah. Kevin Kurios has pitted out of third spot. And... <laughs> You like this, John? Vadim Kogai overshot his pit and left the car in gear, so he couldn't, the team couldn't get the fuel rig attached. This from Malcolm Sweaten, who's been watching is a, he's these a things. Star. We need to, we need characters in motorsport, and he is, without question, a character. Bring them on. Let's have more of them. And Jack, we can't wait to hear from him. I tell you, we're looking forward to it. I mean, Jack's Russian has got to pick up. I mean, I'm, I'm going to send him on a course, crash course. That's the wrong word. <laughs> an, intensive, what you wish an, for. an intensive Russian language course. <laughs> if, he, if he crashes on the way, well, that's up to him. Yes, only in a green Ferrari would he do that, of course. So we have got now 58 minutes of the race remaining. There is the 43 BMW back into the race. Stefano Colombo then at the wheel of it. And the teams, that Stefano... Comandini getting themselves ready for this last hour of the race. We'll pick up how the class situations are once this last round of pit stops are cycled through because there are still one or two still to uh, be done. Gregoire de Mustier is doing a very good job at eking out the fuel in this middle stint. No safety cars, of course, that we have thus far. And he's now done 65 laps, so uh, that's two more than anticipated in this stint. Stefan Ortelli, likewise, still 12.8 seconds back. It's been a good drive, I think, Gregoire de Mustier. He lost time in the middle sector, or middle section of this mm. particular run, but he's, uh, with the assistance of an error from Stefan Otelli, has managed to do a good enough job. It's down to 12.8 seconds. Otelli is still able to use the trap, I think, more efficiently than uh, Gregoire de Moussier is able to do. Nonetheless, de Moussier will be, I think, and the team, happy with what he's achieved. And then uh, the sort of the, not the dash to the cash, but it's going to be. Alex Premat in the car, who one would assume, judging by maybe his performance in Bathurst earlier than the end of last year, that McLaren was blinding. Was he driving it or not? He has done Bathurst Premat. in V8s. There was, uh, was uh, certainly one of the McLarens mm. was stunning yeah. over the mountain in, uh, in the Bathurst 12 hours uh, at the end of last year. Oh, Bathurst 12 hours, it was 12 hours. Start of this year, yeah. yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. There's Ortelli, he's running second. And you've seen Max Book getting ready to take on board number 84. Nico Verdonk has just, uh, sorry, Harold Primat, I should say, brought that back in. They've transformed to the wrong place again, so it'll be Max Book to take it over. Out gets Harold Primat. Well, we saw Max Book win the championship last year. He was only a part timer, wasn't he? He only did three of the five races, but hey, with a bit of help from Ben Schneider and Max Gertz. Found and he did, but in fairness, Max Book did a very, very oh, good job. I mean, no doubt, Baron Schneider, all hail to Baron Schneider. <laughs> as a, an endurance GT driver, a man in his early 50s, fit as a flea, and, uh, I mean, really, really put a lot of young professional drivers to shame. Ortelli squeezes by the Aston into, as he's coming in, he's on his way into the pits. And the leader is already in. You've just seen Gregoire de Mustier come into the pit lane, so the top two, both in at the end of lap 66, and they'll be good to go to the end. There's no concern about fuel now, so they can come in, refuel, change drivers, put the tyres on, routine stops all round, and now it's going to be fascinating to see how Greg Gilbert, who knows the car, shakes up against uh, Alexandra Premat, who is new to the McLaren. This is going to be quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean Stefano Telly came in right on the limit and uh, couldn't have been any more precise than stopping the car. Gets out, helps Greg Gilbert get in. And, yeah, I mean, that's pit work between the two lead cars. You can see them all with their nose to tail in the pit lane. So the McLaren just ahead of the Audi when it comes there's the car now going up on its jacks. Uh, the fuel is still going into the Audi, but the driver changes complete in both cars. Yeah. Stefano Telly, great guy. You definitely have to have him on your team. I'm not saying in to give way to Lawrence Vanthor. This is going to be a fascinating last 55 minutes with these three drivers. Absolutely, I and mean, it's going to be a real battle, and it's going to be a battle of you know, 
Who's the weak link in the middle of it? Is there one? If you have to point the finger at the answer to your question, if you have to point the finger at anybody, is Prema being inexperienced in this car. Oh, and he got caught literally by the Aston coming down, or the Bentley, I should say. Yeah. But the Bentley peels off, so no difficulty for the McLaren now going out. So let's have a look and see what Alex Primat can do as the Audi comes down. And uh, so the, as the gap, it was 12, roughly 12 seconds, the point when they came off the racetrack. It looks like it might be a little bit more than that by the time they get back on as the Mark Bessine car comes in for its final stop. You could argue this is the first round of the sprint series in a sense because you've got three very quick drivers with now 54 minutes to go, all going after the race lead. I think Lawrence Van Thor, in fairness, is going to be too far back. But you never know if a safety car Absolutely. arrives. Absolutely, that's all you need is one incident. Safety car gets deployed and then it becomes a race. Yeah. So away goes Van Thor then. Guy Smith is also in, as we have seen, in number seven, Bentley. So we'll run through the order once this round of pit stops is completed. Blue flags wave to the slower drivers coming out of the pit lane to say there's quick traffic behind you. When, when Lawrence Van Thor came out, literally he was just about at the exit of the pit lane, Gregory uh, Gillet was going in in the, the 26 car, 26 Audi, was just about to go into the uh, first chicane. So the gap between second and third may be a bigger issue mm. than the gap for the lead of the race. So we're going to see a, a strong run, I'm sure, from Alex Premat in that lead car. I suspect a consolidating lead, but it might be a battle for second place between the two Audi drivers. Alexander Premat, very good in single seaters. He then went to the DTM for Audi and rather upset the hierarchy there, didn't he? And so he was uh, sacked out of the DTM drive. He's had a couple of years in Australia where he had OK results, but didn't really sparkle perhaps the way that people hoped, but he's come back to Europe, and now we'll see how quickly he can adapt to a McLaren that's a new car to him. I think Duncan Tappy makes his way down the pit lane in number eight Bentley. Lights flashing now, comes on to the racetrack. We've got to stay to the right of the blend line, not move, stay to the right, Duncan. Wait until you get done. It's really to prevent drivers swinging straight across the, the cars that are at high speed coming down the racing line, that that line has been introduced a number of years ago. And uh, a lot of emphasis in the driver briefing is to respect that line and respect other cars that are travelling probably much quicker than yours. That's the race leader, that's Alexandre Premat, who is at the first chicane. Where, where, where is the second place car? 20 seconds back, that's the starting point. Yeah, and that's, let's wait and see when they've both completed flying laps. But uh, it was something like 12 seconds when they came in. There is the second place car. It's coming into the chicane as the lead car makes its way through the Curva Grande. It's really the battle I'm going to keep an eye on. Lawrence Van Four and the current second place Audi. Those two WRT or one, the Sandlock car, but effectively it's a WRT car. Uh, to see whether Van Four can actually make it second. Well, he's fourth at the moment because their third is Andy Suchek, and that's ah. going to be the first change, well, I think, Andy because Suchek the way that he's McLaren. going yep. in the 99 McLaren. Sister car to the lead car, he's going to be up with, is he not, Gilver very, very soon indeed. I think Andy Suchek is the man who's going to take the position away from the RD. We saw a stunning drive from Suchek in the McLaren here last year, and uh, a driver with a lot of single-seater prowess, test driver in Formula One briefly, and uh, if he doesn't make a mistake, he's got to have the legs of the RD, and uh, he can catch him, but can he pass him? 51 minutes in which to do it, and whilst Gilbert is trying to defend, when we get to that point, of course, he will be losing more time against Alexander Premat. But the next lap, the one they're on, is the first flying lap after the pit stops that we need to monitor. There is Greg Gilver, who is set to give, if he can hang on to a podium finish, the best long pound result for Santa Lock in terms of the outright position, in terms of the Pro Cup results. So uh, there's quite a lot riding on him from the team's point of view here, and it's good to have another new team fighting for honours. So he comes into the Parabolica now in second spot, and there for third behind him is Andy Suchek. And disappointingly, we have to tell you that Vadim Kogar has uh, told us that his English is not good enough for an interview for television. Whether it's good enough for an interview with the race director, we'll wait and see. Well, you know, he knows he was I mean, just completely out of order. But how to entertain him, I, mean, I go back to the whole essence of entertainment. As long as he didn't do something that was endangering another competitor, you know, we can have a laugh about it, we can criticise him for driving off the track and dragging gravel back on. But, I mean, you're talking about an audience at home watching a race on television. They want to see incidents. They don't want to have wheel-perfect driving from 
wheel perfect drivers. So Vadim Kogai's car is still circulating down in 30th place. And we've got one car which is under investigation for speeding in the pit lane, and it's the Michael Kane Aston Martin, number 44. Oh dear. Andy Suchek really hasn't made in this opening stint for both these drivers in the, the final leg of this race made any impression. I thought he would have been all over the back of the Audi at this stage. And uh, if anything, it looks like the Audi's consolidated its position. So 19 seconds, Prem out of Gil there. So it's hovering around the same mark. Mm -hmm. Max Suchek third, fourth, Laurence Van Tort. Max Buch fifth, but quite a chunk back, really. And then sixth is the Pro-Am leader, Stefano Colombo. Yeah, I mean, the, the one, the, sort of the outside shot and all this is Laurence Van Tort, who's 13 seconds, almost 14 seconds behind Andy Suchek. It's a big ask, so for Van Thor to get that ID up onto the podium, I think, is uh, with 48 minutes or so remaining, probably unlikely. The only thing, again, we think is if there was a safety car intervention, which is always the case, the whole field then is closed back up and it's a dash to the, the line. Looking at the cumulative pit stop time that's been taken by the cars, you can see who's had good stops and bad stops with the two added together. There's the leader, Alexandra Premat, who could be on for a maiden block. That win here, the way that he's going. Crosses the timing line. Second spot, Gilver. Third is Andy Suchek. ART looking at first and third at the moment. But Suchek a second and a half back from Greg Gilver. That is Suchek just behind the, the ID. So uh, we're looking at the car 99 there. So Andy Suchek in the gap again. It's a visual sort of thing, but it, it does look as if it's not, not, yeah. not able to, to challenge the idea, which I put my money on Suchek because I know his reputation, I know what he can do in the McLaren, so maybe he's got to refocus and uh, look to see where he can gain some advantage and try and put pressure on the second place ID. On that last lap, the quickest out of Prema, Gilver and Suchek was Greg Gilver in the Audi, so interesting oh, this. Yeah, so there's chipping interesting. away chipping away, he's not carving into the lead gap, but he's just chipping away as best he can. Of course, there's always the traffic thing to bear in mind, as there, Prema has to get past a green Ferrari. Yep. And in fact, the gap between first and second on the last lap, down to 18.2. We did see it down to as little as 11 seconds before second round of pit stops. And what's Van Thor doing? I haven't had to file through yet, so he's still 13 seconds behind Suchek, so he's sort of in consolidation mode as well. Slow lobber down the inside. Oh. It's early against the Porsche, the Ferrari on the inside. That's brave stuff, isn't it? That was certainly... Um, wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so, over the timing line. In fact, Francesco Castellacci it is, I should say, now, who's taken over number 90. We know that he's quick, he's also brave, and he's just sorted out Eric Demont in the Porsche. So that now secures him in 12th place coming over the line. Next target, Steph Dusseldorp in the Mercedes, ex-McLaren racer, now with the demise of Hexis as a team. Uh, he's uh, gone to HTP in the Mercedes. Hasn't really sparkled in the car this weekend, has he? No, it's, it's quite a I spoke to him and I said, you know, what's the difference between the McLaren and the Mercedes? And uh, the, 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 the Mercedes, he feels, is probably a, a car that's by design as much a long-distance car rather than a, a sprint Euro event as this one is. Well, ART having a great race, first and third. What does the boss think? Fred Vasseur is with Jack. Fred, uh, a really strong performance for ART today. Where do you think you're going to finish? Uh, until now, everything is going well, but uh, still one hour to go, and uh, the Audi is pushing behind us. But with one three, it's quite comfortable. That uh, We'll see. <laughs> do you think the Audi has the speed to, to close you in for the lead? <laughs> it looks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Best of luck. Well, his car's being caught, but he can still raise a smile. So Fred Vasseur, who's a proper racer. Yep, the gap has actually dropped on that last lap again, another point half a second or so. So 16.2 seconds. So Gilbert, Gilbert in the ID, confounding me. I didn't expect it. I thought Suchek would be really on his case. He is a further second behind in third place. And again, all the way back to Lawrence Van Thor, Van Thor in fourth place. Unchanged at 13.2 seconds. Michael Kane being given a drive-through penalty for speeding in the pit lane. Whether it was Michael speeding on the way out or Ahmad Al Harfi on the way in, can't tell you. But either way, car 44 uh, cops the drive-through as it's a team race, team penalty, so they all have to take it on the chin. And the car's lost time anyway. It's way, way down in 27th place now after dramas. In fact, it's sitting in the pits anyway. So clearly there is a bigger problem than just speeding. It's brought it back in, and 
the Aston's in the pits. When it goes out, they'll have to come back in and drive through anyway. Two Bentleys, seventh and ninth. Uh, if you look at the second place car, come across the line, 15 seconds. And in fact, traffic has caused a bit of a, yeah. But two Bentleys, seventh and ninth at the minute. You have to say, first time out. Good effort. Absolutely. Yeah. And you see how the race format and the race pattern changes hour by hour, driver by driver. Now, Stefan Ortelli did a very good job in that middle stint, didn't he, to try and bring it into contention. And Stefan now is in the pits, ready to uh, talk to Jack Nichol. Stefan Ortelli's stint, putting the car second place. Stefan, uh, Greg's looking fast, but is there enough time left to get the lead? Uh, we see. Uh, I think I was closing on my client on my uh, previous stint, but uh, the car is really, really good. We just tried to, uh, to play a bit more with the fuel, and I did one more, one up more. This lap, uh, I had fuel cut and I lost quite a lot, but that's the game, you know, you, we had to try the trick and uh, unfortunately, uh, this lap cost me a bit. Plus I did, uh, I did a mistake as well in the chicane, so all together it's, uh, it's like that, you know, we have to play that to the maximum and uh, the fuel cut was too late to come in. So I had to do one complete lap to save fuel and I lost too much. C'est la vie. But Greg is looking fantastic, so... He has a good car to the end, and now he has enough room for the fuel, which was the purpose of uh, extending our, my, my, my steed. And the speed looks good uh, for, for the Scientolog team. It's great to see them battling at the front. Yeah, you know, it's not normally the best track for the Audi, so... We've been improving the, the car through the weekend, and I'm very pleased with our car. I hope we can get this podium or maybe the win. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Stefan makes the point. It's not a great circuit for Audi. We've not had an overall win for an Audi R8 here in the history of the Blancpain Endurance Series. The lead gap still 15.3 seconds. Alexander Prema doing his best to respond. And there is the replay of what Stefan Ortelli was talking about, making that little error down at the first chicane. Yeah, just, he just tripped over himself coming into the first chicane. I mean, it looked all perfect then. That very late lock-up. In fact, it looks like a rear lock-up rather than a front lock-up. And uh, Stefan had to bail out of the corner and go over the, the, the curbing and the... And the Again, the two cars, the Ferrari and the Aston, he had already gotten ahead of, had to repass them. So all the hard work, the hard yards that Stefan had put in. And uh, you know, those little, little issues that you've got to try and avoid. But when you're right on the edge, as he had been, and taking time out of the lead car, got it virtually halved the gap between the gap when he started to where he was at that point. Um, you know, great drive again by Otelli. Great enthusiast as well, just loves his racing and delighted still to be an Audi factory driver at my age, as he phrases it, because he's not as young as some, but he is still quick, still competitive, and still a great ambassador for Audi and for GT racing in general. As you look at the race leader, Alexandra Prema, and off the road has gone yet again, number 15. I'll say yet again because it draws attention to itself when it's got problems. That McLaren is well, going to turn the car way, around as best he nice can, place, but it's not a good place all. to be stuck, is it at all? That it's also looking a bit low on the right front corner, so it had a very slow run to the pits when Olivier Grotz was at the wheel of the car and now it's trying to turn itself around and rejoin. Now he's got to get away from left to right, he's got to let all the traffic that's behind him before he makes any attempt to manoeuvre. Again he's back into that limp home mode that we saw some half an hour ago, maybe a bit longer and he's got it fired up and hopefully he can get into the pit lane. Change of place coming up here because Castellacci in the Ferrari look is up on the inside of Steph Dusseldorp and he's going to go through on the run down towards the first chicane. This is for 11th place. Through goes the Ferrari and just up ahead is Renat Solikov who's taken over the infamous triple three green machine. But he's not as entertaining as his teammate. No, no, he'll never catch on with it. This car looks like it's a Ferrari being driven that you'd expect it to be driven. First 15 limping to the pits. They get him off the circuit. Carl lost a lot of time early on. It's been another disappointing weekend, sadly, for the Boots and Ginion team. One car damaged early on in that clash we saw Phil Quaife have, and 15 with mechanical woes, bringing it back into the pit lane. So ignore triple three from this battle. It's in the 30th place. Bentley, BMW, Audi. Ignore the Audi, that's gentleman trophy. That's not in an overall uh, battle for position. And nor is the BMW Bentley fight for position either. Duncan Tappy. You know, trying to get position again to get the run out of Parabolica up the back of the BMW. And has he got any momentum? Not really. So it'll all be about a battle under brakes coming down. Can he sweep under the BMW down the inside? He's got to have a look at it. He's doing the single-seater thing of 
just take the opportunity and force the issue and it worked for him this time executed extremely well Duncan he gains the place and that's on the road he puts a lap on that car effectively Duncan Tappy running in seventh spot overall he's done the bulk of his GT racing in McLaren although we did see him in a one-off in the Mercedes on the start of last year but it's good to have Duncan not only in the championship full time but as a works driver for Bentley which is great for the ex-single-seater racer whose single-seater aspirations came to an end really through a lack of funding, certainly not through a lack of ability. Well, it's, it's the name of the game for so many young drivers, British, whatever. It, um, it's an expensive sport and needs funding like probably no other sport in the world. So the Bantry in its maiden outing in the Grand Prix Endurance Series, the car ran in the Abu Dhabi 12 hours at the end of last year still being developed but it's proved to be competitive if not on the outright pace as the race has taken its three-hour course but it's certainly been an impressive debut for my money yes i think particularly andy merrick's run at the front holding second third fourth positions for the best part of the race of his stint uh, error from the ferrari lets the nissan get through so stephen lost it between stevenson and that last year yeah 35 is the troubled Nissan that lost so much time early on, Katsumasa Chio, the Japanese driver, who comes to Europe as part of Nissan's driver exchange program and its driver development policy. He's learning about Monza and he is behind the wheel of the car that lost the hour early on. So Andy Suchek still pushing but losing ground. The gap to the second place, Audi. Gilbert is increasing last time across the line. The gap was, well it was just under a second but I'd say right now it is more than that and he's now got the problem of finding a way past a Porsche and getting held up in to the Ascari chicane and he's just got to be patient there's no way around the outside there's gravel there he's just got to wait and now he'll struggle because he's lost his momentum well, there's the Audi tantalizingly close up the road but just that bit far out of reach as they come down to the parabolic and the clock ticking away 37 and three quarter minutes of the three hours remain as there is the McLaren diving up on the inside to sort out the back marker all that does is then allow him a clearer look at the Audi that he's still hustling on and still trying to chase down. Well, it was just under a second now, it's going to be probably about two seconds when they come across the line, three and a half seconds. So all that traffic in the last half of the lap has cost Andy Suchek dear in his pursuit. There you can see the gap, the Audi coming into the first chicane, now the McLaren, that's three and a half seconds. But the traffic's not really helping Greg Gilbert either because the gap is still hovering around 15, 16 seconds against Alex Prema, the race leader. So Greg Gilbert somehow needs to start taking chunks out of that lead and he can't do it because A, there is the traffic and B, he doesn't have that much more speed in the car. He's not a second a lap quicker, he really is dependent upon the traffic or Prema making a mistake. Yes, I mean, there's no pressure right now on Prema other than, you know, getting involved in issues lapping some of the back markers there is the leader of the race that 15 or 16 second advantage over the second base idea so really thinking more about just drive to the flag um, there's no racing that he's going to be involved in keep it out of trouble keep it on the track stay out don't make any risky maneuvers when you're coming up to the back markers Alexander Premat back in European racing and a replay here of more fun and games as Nissan gravel. hits gravel and finds more gravel and brings more gravel onto the road. I thought that was going to be contact. Florian Strauss in number 80 avoiding the Bentley thankfully. What do you think this late stage of the race? Of course there are still perils up the road if you're not careful. There goes the race leader that now puts 76 laps in the book. Through goes Alex Premat. We now can just storm clear when the road permits. In second place, Greg Gilvey will be through shortly. In the first sector, he was slower. In the second, he was quicker. What's that all about? Little laps of concentration coming into the first chicane. Maybe something on the inside of the corner we can't see, but certainly not the line you'd expect from the race leader. So you can see how much time that costs Prema in the first sector. 34.5 he did in the first sector on his last lap and a 35-3 on this lap, so it's cost him a bit of time, certainly. Yep, there was a little error you saw, just ran wide on the apex and uh, then compromise in the turn to the left to exit through the chicane. There's Katsumasa Gio in the delayed 35. 
Yeah, Greg Gilbert has made up seven tenths in that first sector alone because of the error that so you've just seen from Pramat. And this hand powers on, yeah. way, way down the order. Yeah, thrown in 34th place. So that long pit stop to fix whatever the problem was for the cooling. We did see fluid as the Ferrari back in. Is that our... Is that, is that the triple three or...? Uh, yes, it is. Is it, it, sorry, it's, it's not given up the ghost, has it? Not sure yet. Let's have a look. They have to refuel it, but they're going well, to also take it to the garage, I think. Put yeah, it up on the jack, swing yeah, it in, and then more people can I work think it's cried it. enough, finally. Yeah. I don't blame it. It's the famous parabolica, out of which the ART McLaren comes. Alexander Premat then, he's about to break the timing beam and come through and complete 77 laps as he does so. That lap is a 51-2. And Greg Gilbert in second place still hunting him down. So ART versus Santalock. It's all about French teams at the head of the field now. Yeah, now let's see if it can get it correct uh, this time. Yeah, it looks much better. Gets the apex. So everything back in control. As Premat makes his way through the long... Wonderful Herva Grande. And uh, just flat out all the way through. 160 miles an hour on the exit, then. This is the more difficult part of the track. Under braking to judge your braking, and particularly lap cars. So gets through there cleanly, runs the curb in the exit, which you're permitted to do. Don't want to drop a wheel off into the gravel. Then settle the car, and it's almost like you want to float the car through the first Lesmo, always one of those corners where if you can get that lovely balance between attitude and grip, and then the slightly less impressive Lesmo too, used to be a magnificent corner, has been slowed down considerably in the interest of safety. Then you drop down under the banking of the old original full length Monza circuit, then on the brakes into the Ascari chicane, a great chicane. This is what all chicane should be like gets quicker as you go through it. The exit probably about 120 miles an hour. And uh, then you've got the long second main straight here from the Ascari down to Parabolica. And uh, into the Parabolica, you, know, you can break pretty late into the corner. You get an early apex. There it is. And then the car, again, I call it floating. You just balance the car on steering and throttle. And there's the banking to the right. Car, very, very late exit. Probably 400 metres from the apex before you get to the exit of the corner. Wonderful corner, traditional racetrack style of corners. Not this horrible matrix stop go that we do see at a lot of racetracks today. Every corner has character, every corner has colour. There's grass, not just endless tarmac runoff areas, for example. So it's, there, a, it's a proper racetrack. It's, a, it's old school, but it's a proper racetrack. It's what, when racetracks were built for the cars of their era, they didn't do stop start corners. They had long corners where you drifted the car on a mixture of throttle and steering and some of the most evocative shots of motor racing are people like Fangio going through the corners from the pits down to the hairpin at Raw in a 250F Maserati it just you know, brings a smile to my face Alexander Prem bringing a smile to McLaren's face at the moment because he leads the way and despite the best efforts of Greg Gilbert he just cannot find enough speed and enough room through the traffic to be able to close this gap. Every time Premat is delayed, then of course when Gilver hits that wave of cars, it has the knock-on effect to him. Well, the gap between Suchek in third and Gilver in second is three and a half seconds when they came across the line the last time. This is an opportunity for Andy Suchek, but he's also got to deal with the Ferrari. So one Ferrari for Suchek, two got a BMW and a Porsche for the second place Audi of Gilver and the bl waved blue flag. But, you know, has the Audi got the straight line? Grunt, he's got the corner speed, he's going to have a little sniff down the inside, but not close enough to the BMW to take the risk. That's the Acuria Cars BMW, is Oliver Bryan in it right now? Uh, let's have a look, it is absolutely right, 14 that car runs. And it's Black Bull Whiskey sponsorship, and it's lots of enthusiasm to try and take Acuria Cars back to Le Mans in the long term. So the Porsche alongside the BMW, blocking out any chance for the, no. the Audi to do anything. Change for 13 there, Oliver Bryant round the outside of the Porsche of Eric Trillier gains the place, so that gives him 13th overall and also 5th in Pro-Am. Yeah, but really it's the battle that's going on and uh, Andy Suchek has got an opportunity here because, well, it looks like the BMW has had, had to, or the Porsche had to concede position 
And now, can the Audi get past Oliver Bryant coming down under brakes into the first chicane? No. BMW got sufficient speed and grip to consolidate. And this is not a race for position, this is just cars, tail enders being lapped. Now the Audi is going to make an effort. Looks like it's going to be a run the outside, certainly down the inside into the second chicane. Shows again another of the features of this type of race, doesn't it? Because there's a car on the lead lap trying to work its way through back markers, but those back markers are themselves having their own race and are involved in their own battle. Yeah, right, they are being given a wave blue flag, so they are obliged to get out of the way of that lead car as soon as possible, but it's, it's not a perfect science. And of course, if you are embroiled in your own battle, you tend to think about that rather than some bloke who you're not aware of is actually yeah. the race leader or running in second place looking to get it through. Suit check. Don't think, well, the gap has come down to just under three seconds by about a, a thousandth of a second. But uh, he's still got to deal, Suit check's got to deal with the, the Porsche around the BMW before he can even get anywhere near the fumes from the Audi. And we've got just under 29 minutes of the race remaining. There is the third place car, Andy Suchek, from the three champion, from the two champion, and these days a very quick McLaren GT racer, as we've seen over the last two or three seasons. So Suchek runs third, Laurence Van Thor is still in fourth, Max Buch is fifth, and sixth is where you find the Pro Am leader, Stefano Colombo in the BMW. But that is Suchek pounding on as he comes through the Parabolica. He was quicker in sector one, he was slower in sector two against Greg Gilver. So I suspect by the end of the lap, nothing will particularly be lost or gained for either of them. Comes over the timing line now, and he was slower yeah. in the last sector as well. He's lost about two tenths and yeah. a bit of a second, so it's just the ebb and flow of, uh, of traffic. And comparing the pace of Suchek last lap, 150.3. Last lap of Primat, 50.4. So Suchek is actually fractionally quicker in a lap time compared to the race leader, but uh, it's not really having any impact on the battle for ultimately will be the final podium position with Suchek in third place. Through the traffic. Well, that was about the, an assistance of the blue flag. So that's played slightly to the advantage of Suchek. But the Audi's got clear finally of the Curia Cost BMW. And uh, again, I think Suchek will be looking for the same kind of assistance from Oliver Bryant when he closes up to it. Uh, to then, with what you say, 27 minutes remaining to make a final attack on that second place gap. Between first and second, still hovering around the 15 second bracket. So everything pretty much in control for the ART team and uh, Harold Greenland. You wonder how things would have been any different had people got past the Bentley earlier on and not allowed our Valaparet to have such a big gap early on. But that's the situation we have. Max Book in replay there, just running a little bit wide out of a second Lesmo. Yeah, and he's running like, currently like in fifth place. Book could do with an extra book in the seat to see where he's going. He, looks, he sits really low on that car, doesn't he? The reigning champion. Yeah, no, he's, he's, a, he's impressive. He's impressive in one of these SLSs. He's got that feel and touch for a car that is not the very sharp McLaren style of, of attack. It's a great long distance uh, endurance race car. Two years ago, he was the FIA GT3 champion in its final year of that series, World Pan Endurance Series champion last year. And he's hustling on to try and catch Lawrence Van Thorpe. He's about half a lap back, so that I'm afraid is a forlorn hope, but he's still pushing on as best he can. So 15.8 seconds between Alexander Premat and Greg Gilbert. As you see the number one Audi that's currently running in fourth place, Laurence Van Tour, who is 4.8 seconds behind Andy Suchek and lapped quicker last time by one second. Could be just out of traffic. And and I think we've, we've sort of been watching, but that gap has come down mm. like substantially. I mean, we're seeing Van Tour lapping in the middle of 149s, as is Maximilian, you know, oh, oh, sorry, beg your pardon, has been lapping is 50.1, whereas the rest around him are. Yeah, it's all very similar. Suchek doing 50.1s. Uh, second place, Audi 51. It's just about traffic. Everybody's more or less lapping at the pace. All top four cars roughly at the same pace. It's the Pro Am leading car, the BMW of the Royal Motorsport team that comes now into the first UK. And this has got Stefano Colombo at the wheel of it, the Italian GT Ace, and the BMW Z4. 
we've discussed earlier, makes a great noise. Trailing, it looks like maybe one of the exhaust boxes at the rear of that car. Looks a bit low, it's hard to tell whether that's something body where maybe it's part of the diffuser. Just hanging down a bit lower than normally would expect. He's got a very healthy lead in class now over the number 50 Ferrari that's still running second in Pro Am now. Uh, Andrew Danimov, Simon Knapp, having given that car over. So it is Stefano, sorry, Andrea Sonvico who is driving the second place Ferrari. And he gets through going into the first Lesmo. Audacious use of the, the lights just to intimidate. But again, you, know, you need that cooperation. Two different classes of car. So, you know, get out of the way. Let the leading car, the quicker of the two cars, go through. Gentleman Trophy Ferrari is the one that he's just put the lap on. And we've got 25 minutes, give or take, still to run in a race dominated by number 98, McLaren. Never had it since the start of the race. Alvaro Parant qualified it on pole. Scarpered in the first stint. Greg Wilder, Mustier and Alexander Prama have done a good job doing exactly what's required to bring that car home, seemingly. Stephen Kane sort of redeemed himself a little bit. He's gone from ninth place up to eighth. He's now got bent. He's running seventh and eighth. 14 seconds behind Duncan Tappy, his teammate. So Stephen, who's stuck it really royally into the barriers up at uh, the Ascari chicane and an all-nighter for the Bentley boys um, has done a good job. It was a big hit as well, Stephen was OK, but the car looked a bit second-hand. Uh, that's the second-place Pro-Am car I was just talking about, Andrea Sonvico. Out of the Valentia Ascari he comes, and third is Florian Strauss in number 80 Nissan. Now, that last lap was a little bit slower than the Ferrari, but again, not necessarily convinced second and third are totally resolved here yet. If Florian Strauss, new to racing this year, the European winner of the PlayStation GT Academy that Nissan runs, if he strings together a few good laps, he's in with a chance of getting second. And how about this for the, for the podium for him and Nick McMillan and Alex Bunker from 32nd on the grid and two drivers in their first ever race at this level and their first race at Monza? I think it's outstanding. I suppose it's all right. <laughs> I know, it's a great effort by two drivers who've never been here uh, in, a, in a pretty competitive race. This has been pretty much a flat-out drive through all the three categories. We're focusing very much on the front, maybe some on the middle, but there are gentlemen drivers out there who are pushing absolutely to their limits. It's been a competitive race. When Nissan and PlayStation launched this final driver, the if you like, couch to cockpit process a few years ago. Lucas Ordonez was that first winner. I think a lot of people thought it was a gimmick and looked down their noses, but Darren Cox at Nissan and his team have unearthed some very, very good people. Well, I asked Darren recently, said, when are you going to come up with a really top-line female racing driver? Because the world is crying out for one. And uh, he said, well, no, we're, we're on the case, we're on the case. We want it desperately. And I, I know there is, there is talent out there. It'll come through the system, and, and this, and I mean, a great perpetrators of uh, bringing talent from that area which traditionally you always think of get into karting and come through that way. Well, the PlayStation Academy has worked so well because so Ordonia, Jan Maldenborough is just two examples of, of that and there are more to come so it works well for all parties and good for the sport in general. There is number 90 Francesco Castellacci still pushing on he is in 11th and 4th in Pro-Am of this as well is the race leader Alexander Prema who has yeah. now got 21 and a half minutes to go. Yeah, we've got, we got Castellacci sort of beginning to, I don't know he's trying to run down or unlap himself, but certainly he's the car directly behind the race leader. And I think Castellacci is going to try and uh, get that Ferrari ahead of the leading McLaren. Wants to underline his pace. That was the car that lost time early on with its right rear wheel nut drama, Jack told us. So the car's been playing catch up all afternoon. The fact that it's now back up into 11th is impressive. Be even more impressive if Castellacci does actually overtake the yes. race leader yes. because um, that would be somewhat of a surprise to see a car that's unlapping itself with Castellacci we know is very very quick indeed in a Ferrari and at the same time Primat has no reason to keep that Ferrari behind and uh, it may well be that the pit lane will tell Primat the Ferrari behind you wants through he's not on the same lap let him go. But that Ferrari is about to get past Florian Strauss. That's a change for third in class, is it not, as they get to the chicane? So the Nissan, I think, may have just backed off a bit too much out of all of that. Let's just double check as they come out of the chicane. It's the right Nissan we're talking about. But I've got a horrible feeling that Florian Strauss was a bit too gentlemanly there. Let's see as the car goes through number 80. Yes, as just, I'm afraid, given a place away. Well, Mikasa was on a mission and he was following behind the race leader. So maybe in the confusion, maybe in the 
information coming to the driver. He didn't realise that Castellacci, I mean, Castellacci, right on the gearbox of the race leader, um, he's decided he wants to pass. So he's gained a place and therefore he's on the podium in Pro-Am. And having talked up the PlayStation GT Academy, Florian Strauss has, I'm afraid, dropped off the podium for the moment. So let's see whether he can respond. I'm sure he can, but Castellacci against Sonvico before the end. Is that possible? Mm, not sure. There is Sonvico first of the Ferraris, and then the fourth car in this line. Now the third. Now the second that you see there is Castellacci. He is chasing for second in class. Castellacci's last lap was 1.51. Very similar to the race leader. Let's have a look at this moment again, where the Nissan got out of the way of the leader. Yeah, and I think that just the Ferrari slipped through as well, and yeah. uh, you know, that's inexperience. Um, a lack of racing now, so you know, being aware fully of what is taking place around you, what's happening coming to Lesma 1. Ooh, that's the leader. That's the race leader. Survives a brief scare and continues to push on. The gap 15 seconds still. I mean, certainly if I was running that uh, lead car, I would be saying to uh, get, let the Ferrari go. You have to play that, let the Ferrari go. He's not in our race. He's going to, could cause a problem. Just let him go. Again, in traffic is the race leader. So Alexander Prema, a little bit delayed, possibly in that first sector, but Greg Gilbert still has to find his way through all of this traffic as well. So. He's not gaining a huge amount. In fact, he's even lost time in sector one. So Prema looking ever more secure up front. Yeah, I mean, why is he, why is he going defensive? I mean, yeah. he should be being told the Ferrari is not in his race. Let it go. Because all it's going to do is be... All this is going to be is trouble. This is somebody new to long-distance racing, Alex Prema. So he's got the car speed, he's got the race craft, but he needs perhaps just that long-distance discipline to be factored in as well. Well, uh, that's really where the team should be coming into play and, and the information by the radio should be the Ferrari behind you is not in your race, let it go. So down towards the Parabolica he comes for the 86th time, 18 minutes give or take still to run. And it's a car, this ART Grand Prix McLaren, new livery for this year that really has dominated the race. In the background, the uh, number four Audi of Evitz, who's in track position. Clarence certainly has thrown down the gauntlet to the opposition for the rest of the year because this car really has crushed them this weekend. It's been very impressive, and the most impressive thing I think is that McLaren finally seemed to have got on top of all the issues that bedeviled the car initially in 2012. You know, very quick car, but you're almost too clever and too sophisticated, and they've now managed to sort of engineer it into being in a very effective endurance car but still retain all the assets, all the, all the, the strong points the car's always had. And Castellacci still pounding on. He has got to make up five and a half seconds to Sonvico for second in class. Sonvico's last lap was a 50, Castellacci a 51, because he also has been mired in traffic. Even though he's quick, he's still got cars around him, so perhaps it's not a true indication, as Nissan, Porsche and Audi battles over the line. Frankie Cheng in 55 there, the Audi up on the uh, inside, trying to work his way through the traffic. He gets himself up past the Eric Dermont Porsche. Yeah, he had to sort of move over on the Porsche to make yeah. him aware that Frankie Cheng was coming down the inside and uh, good cooperation on the circuit. Doesn't give Cheng a place, I'm afraid, because of course that car lost laps early on when it was in the gravel with Andre Couto we saw over at the first Lesmo, so he's in 21st place but still pushing on. And Eric Dermont now being given a hard time by Peter Cox, I think that is, in the background in the Lamborghini after its woes with punctures. That car struggling a little bit because of the time lost. 17th Peter Cox is now in the writer engineering Lamborghini. 11 different brands on the grid this weekend, Lamborghini being one of them. There is Frankie Chang hustling on. Yep, yeah, brave move again up the inside into second Lesmo, it's a slightly easier corner to do that now because it's more of a break and a turn rather than just let the car drift and guide it into the apex when it was very much more of a well, throttle steering rather than a brake throttle steer. Eric Dermott up the inside of the Aston Martin there, Mark Poole's car. And Peter Cox slips through as well, so yeah. he read that one pretty clearly. It was easy to see what was going on and uh, that's when you want those opportunities just to come your way at an opportunity, an opportune time. 
Joe Osborne at the wheel of the Aston Mark Pools, the owner of it. It's an AMR run car. They struggled all weekend really with the balance of it, but it sorted itself out hopefully for the race. And the traffic cone adds to the effect of the McLaren's looks, doesn't it? No, it's not very pretty at all. <laughs> I don't think it was designed to have that on it. Way off the road to avoid a slow McLaren goes to the BMW. That's a novel approach. I don't, I don't know where there is a marker cone close to the circuit that you could actually pick it up. The white BMW with Stefano Colombo, who is running as the leader of Pro-Am, and virtually flung the car off the road so as not to be delayed. Now, Greg Wadamustier is, of course, the man that did the middle stint in the 98 McLaren. We've heard from uh, Alvaro Parentz. Let's hear next from Greg Wadamustier in the pits. He's with Jack Nichols. Gregoire, you're getting a bit hassled by one of the uh, the 90 Ferrari. Is there any thought to let the Ferrari go through? No, I don't think so. We need to, to let to let it go through. Uh, uh, Alex is, is keeping his pace, so it's, it's going well actually. We'll see how we'll finish the race. But you must be feeling pretty confident at the moment. You got a, a good advantage. Yeah, we have a good advantage, but we never can be confident in motorsport. So we wait till the end of the race, and then we'll see. We'll, was confident. <laughs> and were you pleased with your pace in, in your stint? Because Alvaro gave you a, a huge lead and you did well to maintain it. Yeah, yeah, I was pleased with my pace. The goal was, the goal was to, to keep the, the advantage we had. I managed to do it. No, it's OK. We are happy, really happy, actually. We'll see at the end. OK, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you just seen Castellacci put himself on the track ahead of Prema. That gets rid of a possible problem. Absolutely, and I think that couldn't have come sooner, as far as I'm concerned, because mm. Uh, it was going to be an issue, and you've got a driver who is pushing really hard against a driver who's really into a consolidation. And uh, to me, the team should have said maybe two or three laps earlier, look, let the Ferrari go. It's not our issue. He can run his own pace, his own race. We just need to bring our car home as clean and as basically slowly as possible. So, 13 more minutes of the race to go. This a replay of that move. Castellacci busy flashing his lights. And Alex Prema measures his pace, stays on the line, lets yeah. the car go around. I mean, Prema just basically lifted off early, cruised into the corner. Castellacci uh, really had no uh, problem getting past, and uh, you know, just you've got to think a little bit whether that was a team guidance or whether that was uh, Prema himself working it out. Uh, I don't know, but anyway, the point is, it's the right judgment at this stage of the event. What's also happening now is that Castellacci released. He's closing on Andreas Sanvico for second in Pro-Am, and is their contact as Frankie Cheng tries to get past the Nissan. Let's Look, see, I think they've survived. Uh, yeah, it's it was, just. It was probably messy. <laughs> yeah, quite. If there wasn't contact, it was probably as close as you can have without having it. Well, they've survived that experience, at least. But, yeah, second in Pro-Am, the Ferrari fight, building up nicely, because Castellacci is quicker in both sectors than Sanvico ahead of him. Yeah, Peter Cox pushing, as ever, in the right of Lamborghini. Uh, where is he? 16th. Yeah. That, that second puncture for Engel that did them no good at all, isn't it? There's Albert Montour on Taxis. Yeah, and Hans Ryder sitting alongside him. And Al, get rid of the moustache, it doesn't. I think he gives him a certain. Je ne sais quoi. When you looked at uh, Gregor de Moussier, I didn't recognise him. He's had a makeover of all. And he's got short hair now, got rid of the bins, the glasses, got lenses, obviously. And he's got a little goatee beard. I mean, it oh, looks oh. like he's really been to the, um, the tidy up department in the, in the appearance looks. Aren't you meant to celebrate a major win, like say your first Grand Prix win, by shaving off a bit? Only if you have an agreement with your team principal that when you do win that event, that you will shave it off. Which was Taking case. it off ain't going to make any difference. <laughs> <make no mistake. laughs> but that was John's situation years ago. Now we've got 11 minutes to go. Over the timing line comes Peter Cox, who is doing what he gets paid to do the only way he knows how to drive flat out he's in the car and of course he knows the lamborghini intimately he's hustling on 0.3 of a second between van four and suchek First he's just change, been creeping it? up there ever so quietly unnoticed and now that could be real pressure for suchek well we've talked about the facial hair of albert von turner taxis we don't care We'll come back, in fact, to Albert von Turner Taxis in a moment, I think, because we've got a story that there's a car off the road. Let's try and catch up on that first. Uh, yes, it's the Team Parker Racing Audi that's gone off at the exit of the Parabolica. Chris yeah. Jones at the wheel of it, out of the Gentleman Trophy. 
Uh, we've got Albert Montoya and Taxis ready to talk to us, but let's just catch up on this first, running wide, wide, wide. Yeah, I mean, Lupe Strange just didn't really keep the, 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 the momentum of the curve and uh, let the car run onto the gravel and then reverses into the, the barrier, which will, of course, result in a substantial bit of damage to the rear of the car. Uh, driver on injured, of course, but um, with 10 minutes to go. A, a bit sort of casual, I would say, um, in the way that he let the car get away from him. So in the last 10 minutes, that car ends up in the gravel. Big, big frustration. And there's your third place fight, look, because that is Andy Suchek versus Laurent Van Thor. So the last place on the Pro Cup podium could change, should change before the end. Well, the driver-car combination, I was a shoe-in for second place. Now it's going to be a struggle to be on the podium because Laurent Van Thor has run that McLaren down pretty much unnoticed all the way through his stint. Just knocked out laps and continuity and consistency. So now Suchek is into defensive mode rather than attack mode, which is pretty much he's been for most of the race. So this fight is going to go down to the wire, isn't it? As Andy Suchek rattles the curb, he's under pressure now, he's under attack, making his way then now towards the Lesmos, and you can see the way that Vantor is having to push then. Very wide indeed, up over the curb goes Andy Suchek as he forces his way then to the second Lesmo, and there's traffic ahead, he's going to be careful to get through this without too much time lost. Down they come to the Valiant Ascari, two back markers. And in fact, also in there, you have got Gilbert. It's not just third, it's second, third, and fourth because they both caught up to Greg Gilbert. There he is on the inside, so this could well all shuffle before the very end. For the moment, Suchek is caught up in traffic, and as they turn their way through the Valiant Ascari for the last time, it's game on, isn't it? For second, third, and fourth places with just over eight minutes to go. Well, I mean, what a change around in fortunes. This was a guaranteed second place, Suchek a guaranteed third place. Now it's all changed. Oh, good, what a finish to a race. Three hours has all of a sudden come alive. In many ways, it's just like the start. There's the 98 McLaren out in the distance, but behind for second place, there's a battle royal. And here it comes, over the line, Greg Gilver. Is he on borrowed time in second place? He's eight tenths up on Suchek, who is half a second up on Laurent Van Thor. And with less than eight minutes to go, we're looking at about four more laps of racing. Well, at the minute, well... Oh, my goodness, what's going on down in the chicane? Vantor passing his teammate to yeah. lap him. Yes. Yeah, and he has to, doesn't he? He's got to stay on the back of Suchek, can't yeah. lose any time. He did. He, I wonder whether he's going to get through or not, or whether that uh, number four idea was going to make way for the number one idea of Lawrence Van Thor, but he's got through and he's maintained the balance of the gap between Suchek and himself. And, uh, of course, second place car coming into the chicane, so it's second, third and fourth covered. What? Second in a bit? Absolutely. And it could all change, couldn't it? Lawrence Van Thor, we thought, we even discounted a while ago for being so far back. Alexander Pram just continues metronomically to dominate. Yeah, but his gap's dropped down to 12.7 yeah. seconds, so he's easing off a little bit in the closing minutes, seven minutes from remaining. And, uh, and now the battle for second, third and fourth is going to draw those three cars. It's not going to run down the lead car, but it's going to certainly make a, an exciting finish with these three battling over second place. So Greg Gilbert has lost all of that time in traffic. So it's not been anything to do with a lack of pace of his car. He's just struggled to get through the traffic as effectively as others. And of course, Suchek, with Vantor bearing down on him, has been spurred on. So that's another reason why that gap has come down. Here they come towards us then. Six and a half minutes are still on the clock. Second, third, fourth, Audi, McLaren, Audi. Up front is Alex Premas still. And last time he was 12.7 seconds ahead. Can they do anything about closing that gap significantly? It's just too late in the race, isn't it? If they were going to do it, they'd have done it by now, I think, unless the McLaren suddenly hits problems. Yeah, I mean, they've now got roughly a second and a bit between each of the three cars. It's all about... The, what, can, well, this is the defence by Gilbert on the one hand, but has Suchek got anything left in the tank to attack? So clearly Van Thor has got that, but uh, it's, it's running out of time. So they make their way over the line, 92 laps are done into the chicane they come, the first chicane, and it's 12.1 seconds between the top two. That gap has come down just a little bit further on that lap by six tenths of a second or so. And Greg Gilver now doing his best to pull away once again. When there's a clear road ahead of him, he will be able to stretch that margin just a little. And also Andy Suchek now looks like he's just measuring this gap over Lawrence Van Tor. So five and a half minutes remain. It's been quite a race, hasn't it, here at Monza? I know Alexander Prema, along with Gregoire de Moustier and Alvaro Parent, have dominated it up front. 
but behind we have had some fantastic racing and it ain't finished yet it was a bit like this last year if you remember the ferrari of castle racing dominated but we had podium places traded on the last corner with adam carroll's heroics and the gulf racing mclaren are we going to have something similar this year bentley news they're still seventh and eighth overall and sixth and seventh within their class good first time out in the blanc pain endurance series for the uh, two bentley continentals there, pushing hard, is 99 Andy Suchek. Kevin Est and Kevin Koyas have done a good job in their stints. Surely Andy Suchek is not going to get mugged at the end and lose a podium finish for them, is he? Of course, he's striving not to, and he's on his way now down towards the Palamonica with Gil there, again looking just a little bit more secure in that second spot, when there's no traffic for him to worry about, which does seem to be his weakness, if you can call it a weakness in this race, it's cost him time then that's when the opposition is able to draw nearer. Given a clear road, and he can stretch the car's legs once again, so that gap wide with Gilbert to Suchek coming over the timing line this time is a second, but Andy Suchek to Lawrence Van Tour is half a second, so it's still more likely, I fear, that third is going to change before the end. And look at the way that the Belgian driver closes right up, coming now down towards the first chicane. There it is, number one Audi. Lawrence Van Tour doing his best, but he's running out of laps now to try to do something about a third-placed car. A podium finish is what number one is hunting for. The lead, WRT Audi. We spent much of the last few seasons of Lompin talking about the battle between the Belgian teams, the Belgian Audi club and the Mark VDS racing team. Well, now we've got two French teams, ART Grand Prix versus Santelot. So, for Belgian Reed France, seemingly for this year. Gilvard just distancing himself once again from Suchek. And then Laurence Van Thor half a second back. He's quicker in the first sector by a tenth. But again, you see here, you come back to the balance of performance because it's designed to make cars evenly matched. They are evenly matched. It means that to overtake somebody, it's not that easy. You can get close, you can shadow them, but you've got to be brave to make that pass unless you've got a huge amount more car speed. And Van Thor does not have greater car speed. He's just got guile and bravery and ability. The Audi will be good at certain parts of this circuit, but traditionally not an Audi track. We've never had an Audi win uh, here as the race leading McLaren. Let's traffic go. Now, is that Alex Proud with a problem, or is that him just being oh so cautious and maintaining this cushion on the way towards the line? Across the three classes in the three years, we have not had an Audi victory. That should uh, be not changing today, at least, but an Audi close. And Greg Gilbert in second place comes over the line, but is the gap down? It is, 8.7 seconds, significantly down. So a 152.2 from Prema, a 150.2 from Greg Gilbert. Is this, as I say, just Prema being careful, looking after the machinery as Lawrence Van Tor goes for the inside again, Suchek can't do it. Tried to rattle him a little bit, tried to get him nervous under braking for the corner, but that move wasn't really on, so he has to bail out of that. And as the cars work their way around the Curva Grande, some people just cannot watch. It's that tense, it's that tight down in this battle for third and fourth places. But I'm still intrigued to see what's going on between Prema and Gilver. Is this a real drop in the gap, or is it just Prema being ultra-cautious with now a minute and three quarters to go? We've got one more lap at the end of this. I think Prema, in fairness, is stroking it home. He's lost two tenths in the first sector, but that's not enough to really worry him if it were a big problem. But now I think he'll be losing much more time than that. So I think now it's fair to say Alexander Prema has just got the car at a nice, smooth, gentle rhythm. And whether he was trying to make this the last lap even and not have to go round again, I'm not sure. But I think he will have just about enough time left in the race for one more lap as the cars currently are on lap 95. So it's still not going to be a circuit with Audi victorious, but not for the one to try and go on Greg Gilvers' part. So we got on the clock one more minute one more corner it's going to be another lap and that will give us a 96 lap race so the leader is about to start the last lap there is Gilbert second in the silver and blue Audi third behind him you can see is the hard charging Andy Suchek and Lawrence Van Thor has done so much hard work he's got himself close is there going to be the cigar at the end of it the extra place to be gained I don't think there is now coming on to the last lap he's dropped back a little bit you can see as they come now over the line heading down towards the chicane the first chicane and as they turn their way into that part of the circuit the gap is up to eight tenths between Suchek and Lawrence Van Tor 
we've seen that he can do the catching, but he hasn't been able to make really a serious bid for that place. I think we've got the order sorted. But all it takes is one tiny error on this last lap and things are going to change once more. So here comes Greg Gilbert for second place, but ahead of them all, Alexander Prema is heading for a win. And so too is ART Grand Prix because the number 98 McLaren, there it is, comes out of the second chicane and looks as though honours are going to go its way. It's been a very impressive weekend for ART Grand Prix. The car started on pole position and it really has not been headed throughout the race. The driver combination has been good. ART Grand Prix with a great single-seater background now I think has got its uh, hat on as far as GT McLarens are concerned. They've gone through the growing pains of learning about this car and now with those lessons learned able to run as a very strong team. The gap down again last lap, seven seconds it was. But it's just Alexander Prema now stroking the car home, making sure that no dramas before him on this last lap as he comes out of the chicane. ART Grand Prix is already getting ready to celebrate. There is Greg Gill there, and for Santa Lot Racing, this will be a mega result. It's a team that's been the real underdog in the Grand Prix Endurance Series. Goes well in French GT, but this, the best result it will have had on a really international stage. Out of the Parabolica, up to the chequered flag, victory in the opening round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series goes to ART Grand Prix, to McLaren, to Alexandre Prema, to Alvaro Parent and Gregoire de Moustier. A great job done by all three of them, second across the line. For Santeloc is Greg Gilbert, third for ART Andy Suchek, and fourth Laurence Van Tour. He did all that hard work, but he couldn't find a way through for third place. Max Boot will bring the Mercedes home fifth and sixth. And honours in the Pro-Am category will go the way of Stefano Colombo. McLaren is back in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. So after a really troubled season last year in the endurance rounds where the cars just never really delivered what was anticipated of them this time around. McLaren throws down the gauntlet to the opposition and says, come and take us on. And there is the car that's going to win the gentleman trophy despite the uh, flapping bodywork. Alexander Mitchell, uh, sorry, Alexander Maxwell at the wheel. The GT course, Barinaldi Carl, Alexander Maxwell, Pierre Ellet, and Frank Schmickler will win the gentleman trophy and come home in a really impressive 17th place overall. A great, great job by the team. Well, here at Monza, it's victory for McLaren. Only the second win in the history of the championship because it was Navarra two years ago that Fred Makavicki and Steph Dusseldorf and Alvaro Perret took honours. Alvaro, yet again, is involved in a win for a McLaren, no surprise there, as now the ART Grand Prix car comes through. You can see the results, McLaren wins from Audi, McLaren and Audi in fourth place. So a win for Alexander Premat, Gregoire de Moustier and Alvaro Parent in second place. Greg Gilbert, Edward Sandstrom and Stefan Ortelli and third, Andy Suchek, along with the Kevins, Est and Coyus. Fourth, Laurence Van Thor, Mark Basseng and César Ramos. Fifth, Max Book, Harold Primat and Nico Verdonk. And sixth, the winning Pro-Am car, 43 BMW, which goes the way of Stefano Comandini, Eugenio Amos and Stefano Colombo. Seventh, the quicker of the two Bentleys in the end, Duncan Tappy, Antoine Leclerc and Jerome D'Ambrosio. Eighth, the other Bentley, Stephen Kane, along with Andy Merrick and Guy Smith. Ninth, Second in Pro-Am, we didn't see it, but it happened at the end of the race. Francesco Castellacci got himself through and took second in Pro-Am, along with Stefano Guy and Andrea Rizzoli. And then 10th was the 50 Ferrari of Andrew Daniluv, Simon Knapp and Andrea Sonbico. And the gentleman trophy won by Pierre Eret, Alexander Mapschel and Frank Schmickler. Second in the class was the Sport Garage Ferrari of Georges Cabin, Bernard Delhay and Romain Brandella. And third was the Ferrari of Felipe Barreros, Peter Mann and Francisco Guedes. So ART Grand Prix takes a 1-3. At one point, it didn't look like that was going to be the outcome, but that's the way the cars finish, and they make their way into the pit lane. The cars will stop at Parc Ferme, and we should be able to hear from the drivers very shortly. We'll have a look at the podium ceremonies as well, and catch up on the standings at the end of the opening round. This year, the Blanc Pan Endurance Series and the Blanc Pan Sprint Series make up the Blanc Pan GT Series, the mix of sprint and GT races with 
the next stop for the teams, if they're doing both, being Magaro next weekend. The next round of the Blancpain Endurance Series, Silverstone in May. It's the same calendar pretty much as you're familiar with if you follow the Endurance Series. After that, it's Paul Ricard. After that, it's Spa for the 24 hours. Always a great race. And then the Blancpain 1000 at the Nürburgring to round out the year. But a delighted Alex Prema comes back from Australia, back from V8 Supercar Racing, takes up GT Racing, and starts winning. With help from Alvaro Parent and Greg Vardamustier, Stefan Ortelli is there to congratulate Greg Gilbert on second place. And top three the top three also in the pro cup and the drivers will make their way shortly to the podium but prior to that there's a lot of celebrating to do for some very happy drivers and you search out of the car congratulating his uh, teammate Alex Prema so the drivers shortly will make their way to the interview area and then to the podium after that Edward Sandstrom has arrived to uh, congratulate Stefan Ortelli and also Greg Gilbert. But for Santa Lock as a team, as I was saying in the course of the race, a really good result that the best on an international stage the team has had for second place overall. Andy Suchek, who made his name in single seater racing, very much now becoming adept at GT racing. He's the only Spaniard in the entry. We need a few more, according to Stefan Rattel, but he looked at all the different nations that were represented at the driver's briefing. He said to Andy, you need to spread the word to some of your fellow countrymen if you can. But uh, Andy Suchek has done a good job, certainly for McLaren getting that car for third place. And Alex Prema <laughs> making his way in a few moments time, I think, up to the podium. So we'll get a chance to hear from one or two of the drivers. And that the scrutineers will go to the cars and make sure that all is well. There's the Pro-Am winning team of BMW drivers. And let's hear from the winners, because down in Park Ferme with our three winning drivers is John Watson. Alvaro, fantastic drive, led from the start. What have you got to tell us about it? Uh, you know, the plan was uh, to attack with the new tyres at the beginning. Uh, get a good start. Um, that happened, you know, managed to pull a gap. The car was fantastic to drive with the new tires and uh, with clean air. It's a lot easier when you're following cars and destroying tires. So, um, so yeah, it was quite calm, but uh, attacking all the time for me. And uh, my two teammates, you know, uh, great performance. Um, Greg, great middle stint. Alex, you know, comes uh, comes back from uh, Australia and uh, to win the race straight away. So. Um, Really happy and uh, congratulations, we, well done. we, we dominated. Greg, well, you had the difficult stint, the middle one. Everything went well for you? Yeah, everything was well. Alvaro did a perfect job in first team, so I just have to, to keep the, the car on the piste, on the track. And so, so it was cool, car was quick. Thanks to the team, thanks to my teammate. I think we did a great job and it's, it's a good start for the season. Alexander, you had a little bit of pressure, but from a car that was lapping you, how did you let him go or you told to let him go? That's Castellacci. Yeah, of course, I was a lot of pressure from them because they were a bit faster than me and I just uh, let him by uh, because they, they were a bit faster and I was a bit worried that they, they missed their apex and yeah, they just smashed uh, the back of the car. So I was very, very careful uh, to bring the car home and I'm very proud yeah, of my two teammates. They did a perfect job and as well yeah, from IRT uh, by McLaren and yeah, Frederick Vassar yeah, gave me the opportunity to come back in Europe. So it's very pleased to to be back in Europe and win straight away a, a victory. Well done. Alvaro, looks like McLaren have not only got pace, but got the reliability we've always waited for. Yeah, uh, for sure, um, you know, we've, we've improved a lot and uh, it's only our third year uh, racing and, um, uh, you know, it, it's been going well, progress, huge progress, and, uh, and it's the car to be in, so I'm really proud to be driving uh, uh, the McLaren for McLaren GT and you know keep uh, keep winning races that's the, the objective. See you Silverstone. Well what a way for ART Grand Prix and for McLaren to start the season a 1-3 for the winners and there Andy Suchek talking about the hard work that he had to eke out of the car and the hard work he had to do in order to hang on to a podium place at the end and uh, we've got a chance no doubt to hear from Andy, along with the Kevins, Est and Koyos, in a few moments. So, 
Let's hear, first of all, from the second place drivers, Greg Gilbert, Stefan Ortelli, and Edward Sandstrom, because the Audi team had a great run, and the three of them are down in Park Ferme with Watty. Edward Sandstrom, Stefan Ortelli, Greg, what great drive. Yeah, it was a, a happy day in the car, I can tell you. Uh, it was a good fight, and the car worked really well, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy I was called Thursday to do this and uh, to end up on the podium as a second place is re really, really good. Yeah, it's uh, perfect. It must have been very tough, there was pressure for you all the way through. Yeah, I want to say thank you everybody, my teammate, my team. It was a fant fantastic day, like uh, Sandstrom say. Uh, he did a really good start, good job. Steph, he's Steph. And uh, that's it, it was a really fabulous day. Stefan, you're always familiar with WRT, but you're in a different sponsor this year, but it's the same car, same team, isn't it? I think it's a special day for St. Uh, it's such a tough uh, competition here in this championship, and I think they deserve to be here, shown the potential. Same for Greg, he did a fantastic job in the last stint. And for me, it's a special day because since my accident here in Monza, it's the first time I will go back on the podium, and I think now the story is over. You've got lots of stories about Monzo, but not go into all of them. Anyway, well done, guys. Congratulations. Yes, it was in prototype racing. Stefan Ortelli had his uh, huge accident at the first chicane when the car flipped. And uh, yes, I hadn't registered that that was his first podium since, but well played, Stefan. So that exercises any demons there. And it proves that he is back and as competitive as ever at every circuit, if there was any ever doubt about that. So the uh, drivers. As I say, we'll head to the podiums, but before we get them up there, we better hear from the third placed crew, hadn't we? Because Kevin Kuyas, Kevin Est, and Andy Suchek also had a great race each. Let's go back to John Watson. Andy, I was being asked on there, are you going to get past that Audi? And I said, no problem at all. Great drive last year. Didn't happen. Well, uh, I think we were quite close to the Audi in front. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of time on the pit stop, like 10 seconds, because there was a car in front, so we had to push the car back. And that was the, the result of our third place. Otherwise, I think we would have made the second one. McLaren's look really, really strong. They've been working, knocking on the door, but today I think it was confirmation. Yeah, McLaren has done a very good job during the winter, and now I think we'll be fighting for the wins in every race, I hope. OK, the next round we're coming to is going to be in Silverstone. Last year, McLaren struggled big time. What are you going to expect? I think we worked quite good in the winter. We'll still continue to work and we'll, we'll be there for sure. And Frederick Vasseur, 100% behind two cars. Got to be very strong next this year. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I didn't hear. I was just saying that with Frederick Vasseur behind you, it's going to be very, very strong. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it wasn't it an wasn't easy race, but I think uh, in the end, we managed to do maximum out of it after after the qualifying well done mike i can't hear a bloody thing the track so we've got the third place drivers very very happy with the weekend's work and they will now make their way up to the podium and let's confirm how things were at the end of 96 laps of racing at monza with ART Grand Prix taking a win for Gregoire de Moustier, Alex Prema, and Alvaro Parent. Audi second, Santa Locke, the team, Edward Sandstrom, Stefan Ortelli, and Greg Gilver, Kevin Kurios, Kevin Est, and Andy Suchek third. Cesar Ramos, Mark Basseng, and Laurence Vantour fourth, ahead of Harold Primat, Nico Verdonk, and Max Buch. The Stefanos, Comandini, and Colombo, with Eugenia Amos sixth to win Pro Am, ahead of D'Ambrosio, Leclerc, and Duncan Tappy in the better of the Bentleys from Andy Merrick, Guy Smith, and Stephen Kane. Rizzoli, Guy, and Castellacci second in Pro Am and ninth with Danilu, Knapp and Sonvico, 10th and 3rd in the Pro-Am class. At one stage, we thought number 80 Nissan was going to get 3rd in Pro-Am, but in the end, it was 13th overall for that car, and in fact, 5th in the class, the Acuria cost BMW getting by for 4th before the end as well. And looking down through the order, you can see that 17th is where you find the winner of the Gentleman Trophy, which is Pierre Eret, Alexander Matsul, and Frank Schmickler, second in the Gentleman Trophy, 23rd, the Sport Garage, Ferrari of Caban, Delhe and Brandella, ahead of Barreros, Mann and Guedes. But as you scroll down the order, so you come across the walking wounded, don't you? Because at the end, only 27 cars took the chequered flag. We know about the Reen Parker racing car of Ian Loggy, Chris Jones, Julian Westwood off with 10 minutes to go. The infamous number 333 Ferrari with its innumerable offs. The Oman racing team, Aston Martin, shown as 30th. That was a retirement into the pit lane. McLaren 15 really struggled all afternoon. 35 got to the end, uh, but lost an hour early on in the race. And number three, Audi never really recovered after its contact, but James Nash suffered early on. 
triple one. That, of course, was an early black flag to remove Castle Racing from the race itself. So Silverstone, the next stop for the Block Pan Endurance Series. And the way that the clowns have gone here, it's certainly going to be the brand to beat. What chance on home soil, a podium, a win maybe for Bantam. Well, the drivers making their way out onto the podium. And the podiums are being done in reverse. So you've got the Gentleman Trophy podium, first of all, for which the drivers head out. With the requisite badges in place, the third placed team being from the AF Corsa team, Felipe Barreros, Peter Mann and Francisco Guedes for second place. There's George Caban, who is with Bernard Delhe and Roland Brandella. But the top step of the podium goes to a Ferrari 458, numbered 458, driven by Pierre Harrett, Alexander Matchell and Frank Schmickler. Pierre Harrett is the man doing the filming there, so he walks out last with his camera phone to celebrate the moment. Pierre who drove for the CRS team a few years ago in the FIA GT3 Championship, and it's a win for Pierre Eret, Alexander Matchell, and French Mickle. A win in the Gentleman Trophy at Monza in the opening round of the Grand Pan Duran Series for Pierre Arrett, Alexander Matchell and Frank Schmickler. Alexander Matchell, somebody who's come from the VLN and only moved into the Blanc Pan Duran Series for the Nürburgring race at the end of last year. And in his second outing from the championship, he's a class winner. But there the trophies given. First of all, to Peter Mann, to Felipe Barreros and Francisco Guedes, the two Portuguese and the Brit with the American license. For second place, Roland Brandella, Bernard Delhe and Georges Caban, back on the Gentleman Trophy podium. You remember in the first year of Blanc Pain, he was a regular winner with his Lamborghini. But for the top step, the trophies will go away. Pierre Eret, with his Pirelli hat on, for Alexander Matchell and Frank Schmickler. And, uh, Hugely experienced German driver, one of the, the Audi DTM races many, many years ago, and BMW driver in the DTM in the 90s, Frank Schmickler, now enjoying himself as a bit of a business, a hobby racer rather than doing it as a career. And the GT Course Barrenaldi team takes the team's trophy, and therefore the team's representative on the podium as well. So there's trophies for them. Smiles all round. For Ferrari once again for the second Big year in a row the gentleman trophy is won by Ferrari. Pierre Eret, Alexander Matchell, and Frank Schmickler podium. win the gentleman trophy. So the drivers now Officer try to leave the podium. I think they might be being called back for photographs, and so let's have a look at how, with one race winner, done, the championship looks. Eret, Matchell, and Schmickler, of course, lead the way with Romain Brandello, Georges Caban and Bernard Delhay next. Then it's Valeros, Guedes and Mann. Jean-Marc, Michelier, Howard Blanc and Yannick Manigol finished fourth in the class in the race. And so they are next in the point standings. But for the reigning champion, Jean-Luc Blanchemin, it's not been a great day. Christian Kelders and Yves Verts joining him in the Audi, which was the last car to take the chequered flag in class. Jones, Loggie and Westwood off. Gosselin, Lanier and Sword in the pit box. Earl, Kramer and Daniele Perfetti. Black flag early on after Steve Earl ignored quite a number of attempts to get him through uh, to serve a drive-through penalty. Uh, as far as the team's trophy is concerned, GT course by Rinaldi from Sport Garage from AF Corsa. And then the Belgian Audi Club, Team WRT as the finishers. Team Parker Racing taking points for being classified on distance. Santelok and Kessel frustratingly not making it to the finish. So that is the Gentleman Trophy sorted and the next category will be Pro-Am for which the drivers are being rounded up and they will be brought to the podium shortly. 
where we've had another uh, great race and victory for BMW, but with Italian influence, of course, and with Stefano Commodini and Stefano Colombo as two of the drivers, and, and some of the great shots of Monza, that long traditional shot of the pit straight, and the look back from the Parabolica. And now the drivers for the Gentleman Trophy make their way to the podium. For third place, AF course of the team, Andrew Danilou, Simon Knapp and Andrea Sonvico, the three drivers. As they make their way to the third step, the second, and, uh, it the is the uh, drivers Stefano for Scuderia Veloma Corsa, Andrea Rizzoli, Stefano Gai, and, and Francesco Castellacci Diva, make their way Chris for the second step. Uh, Stefano Gai was a winner here a week ago in the Ferrari Chris Challenge. Uh, He's on the podium in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. <laughs> and Stefano Comandini brings and out his camera phone to join Stefano Colombo and Eugenio Amos anthem. as the winners of the Pro Am class. Very happy Stefano Comandini in the middle with Eugenio Amos on his left, Stefano Colombo on the other side, and out come the trophies to be presented to the drivers. And Andrew Daniluv, his first podium in Blockpamp, good to have that because he's been a mainstay of the series, he's missed occasional races, but it's great to have him and great to have him going so well in the competitive car this year, Simon Knapp and Andreas Sonvico with him. For second place, the drivers for Scuderia Milova Course celebrate Andrea Rizzoli, Stefano Gai, and Francesco Castellacci, former FIA GT3 champion, but also raced in the British Formula 3 championship for Alan Docking's team a few years ago. And on the top step, very happy Stefanos, Colombo and Comandini, and Eugenio Amos, the third driver, Eugenio, who's been in Lamborghini and then Ferrari, but now winning in BMWs in Pro Am. And it's good to have him back. We'll go back two years. He was regularly to be found in the car with uh, Giacomo Petrobelli and competitive. But uh, now, driving for different teams, talked early on about how good it was to have Giacomo back in the series. Likewise, it's good to have the uh, Italian driver Eugenio Amos back in the championship as well. So, the Pro-Ams are a bit more vigorous with the champagne than by the gentlemen, and as the champagne sprays, the Pro-Am trophy podium complete. Honours in Pro-Am in the opening round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series goes to the Royal Motorsport BMW of Stefano Comandini, Eugenio Amos and Stefano Colombo. And another clap for this winner. Champagne sprayed, trophies collected, photographs taken. The drivers in a moment will make their way off the podium. Let's just confirm the way the championship looks. It is, of course, the race result. So that's Amos, Colombo and Comandini ahead of Castellacci, Guy and Rizzoli with Danilo Knapp and Sonvico in third. Oliver Bryant, Alistair McKaig and Andrew Smith for a curious course in the BMW fourth in class after a year away back and the Barwell Motorsport run car back with a bang. Great result for the Anglo-Scottish drivers. And then fifth, in the standings after the results of this opening round will be the Nissan drivers, Alex Bunker, Nick McMillan and Florian Strauss, who were looking good for a podium until the last few minutes. Nico Maroc and Eric Trillier are six, the head of Michel Albert, Stefan Lemere and Gilles Vanillet. Eric Dermot and Franck Pereira, the Porsche drivers next, ahead of Nicola Armindo and Eric Clement and Benjamin Larouche, the BMW Z4 trio. Nick Katzberg and Henri Hassid, their co-drivers, taking the final point in Pro-Am. And as far as the teams are concerned, Royal Motorsport it is that takes the maximum, ahead of Scuderia Villoma Corsa, AF Corsa third, Curia Corsa fourth, the Nissan GT Academy team, RJM, Bob Neville's team, 
fourth in the point standings. And so now the drivers for the Pro Cup podium arrive. For third place, they're already there. Kevin Kuyas, Kevin Est and Andy Suchek. For second place, they're there. Stefan Ortelli, Edward Sandstrom and Greg Gill there. But the winners of the opening round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series are Gregoire de Moustier, Alex Prema and Alvaro Parent. National Hunter McLaren wins the opening round of the 2014 Blancpain Endurance Series at Monza. And on the day where the leading McLaren has dominated the race, let's see what the rest of the season holds. But you can guarantee that the opposition will be working hard for Silverstone. The trophies are presented to Kevin Koyas in the black overalls for third place, Kevin Est, and to Andy Suchek there. In the middle is Edward Sandstrom, Stefan Ortelli, and Greg Gilvert. Almost dwarfed at the other end is there for and, uh, third place, for the and team the team representative from ART is on the podium too. But there are the winners: Alex Prema in the middle, Alvaro Parent, and nearest to and us, the, the beard. There the you can see Gregoire de Mustier, his black first win uh, outright. And Blanc Pan, but a class winner at Navarra two and years ago. Videos, uh, ART Grand uh, Prix, which had a superb track record in single-seater racing in Formula 3000, in GP2, in Formula 3, and now turning its attention to sports car racing, GT racing in particular. And ART Grand Prix takes. The honours, therefore, the team gets the block hand clock. And after a victory, it's time for the winning drivers now to spray the champagne here at Monza and celebrate victory in round one of the five in the block pan endurance series. The champagne is sprayed. Happy and now sticky drivers on the podium at the end of a gruelling afternoon's work. So, victory in the opening round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series at Monza to Gregoire de Moustier, Alvaro Parent, and Alex Prema. De Moustier, Parent, Prema take over the lead of the championship, of course, ahead of the Audi drivers Sandstrom, Ortelli, and Gilver. And then third in the championship, Kuyus, Est, and Andy Suchek. The teams headed by ART Grand Prix from Santaloc, Elgin Audi Club third. Let's look back at some of the highlights. The opening round of the championship, the crowded grid had to funnel its way through the first corner. That has raged off right the way through the opening stint. For some, it was just too unbearable as the battles were certainly fierce. And when Giacomo Petrobelli got into the back of Andy Merrick on more than one occasion, Bentleys went leaping off the track. Ferraris suffered damage. Marco Seafried's green Ferrari did a good job to work its way through traffic. Alvaro Parent built up the lead early on. An early casualty was the number 18, Black Falcon. Mercedes that put itself off the road when being driven by Mikhail Loboda. Battles were going on on track, and Marco Seafried was just a star in the first hour as he worked his way up through the field. It was drama, though, for Phil Quaife, who found himself squeezed off the road, and worse was to come a bit later when his car suffered damage. Eventually, Petrovelli got himself up past the Bentley of Andy Merrick, ran wide at the first chicane. Andy Merrick fought back. Then it was time for Edward Sandstrom to make a move. He pounced and found a way past. Kevin Est and the McLaren was right there as well. And he and Merrick leant on each other going down to the first chicane. And once through, the McLaren was able to pull away. Not so lucky was James Nash, who got harpooned by Phil Quaif going into the first chicane. Neither car was able to get to the finish. Hubert Hout muscled out of the way the Audi in the hands of Ian Loggy. And then Kevin Est and Giacomo Petrobelli came to grief at the chicane. Damage to both, both cars continued, albeit out of the race after its pit stop would be the Ferrari. Nick Katzberg hit Lucas Wolf, had a puncture, went through the gravel, brought the gravel onto the road with him, nearly wiped out the Mercedes again. 
And meantime, Vadim Kogai, having taken over from Marco Seafried, went off again, and again, and again. The triple three Ferrari was a focal point of the middle hour of the race, being involved in a fair few dramas. This wasn't the last of them. It dug itself out of the gravel, even though it was nearly wiped out by the gentleman trophy WRT Audi. Good battle in Pro-Am, which puts Simon Canap ahead in the Ferrari, although ultimately they were heading for second in the class. Stefano Tali made a mistake at the chicane, hopped off and hopped back onto the road as the Gregoire de Mussier McLaren continued to build its lead, ready to be given over to Alex Prema. When Andy Suchek took over 99 McLaren, he was on target for third. Max Buch made a tiny error in the Mercedes. He was on target for fifth place come the very end. Francesco Castellacci, though, started to really charge in Pro-Am in the final hour. He unlapped himself from the leader and then hunted down Sonvico's Ferrari for second place as with 10 minutes to go, Chris Jones lost his Audi, coming out of the Parabolica and backed it into the wall. Lawrence Van Tour got himself onto the back of the third place McLaren, but try as he might, he couldn't find a way through. And that meant that ultimately the chequered flag would be waved at the winning McLaren of Alvaro Parent, Gregoire de Mustier, and Alex Prella, victorious in the opening round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series at Malta. A great way to start the season. The next stop is Silverstone at the end of May. From Jack Nichols, John Watson, and David Addison, it's goodbye from Monza.